was um, by Lane Reddick. So really, really incredible critical engineer. You guys ready? Yeah. Hey, you guys ready? Yes. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you guys for joining on a Saturday morning. This is the how to go from hackathon to funding panel. Uh, I'm Steven from Press Start Capital. I'm joined by four esteemed, our fourth one coming soon, <laughs> I guess. So um, maybe we should do a round, quick round of intros. Uh, maybe Danny, ladies first. Sure. Hi, I'm Danny Osorio. Um, I am a partner at MetaWeb Ventures, focusing on early stage investments. And I moonlight as the meta curator for East Denver, putting together nearly 500 sessions of content for you all during this week. So we have a really cool team. Uh, this year, almost, almost 50 people were involved in putting together this programming. And we're really, really excited for it. We hope you enjoyed it. And we're also really, really excited to wrap up <laughs> and get to the after party. So. Hey everyone, oh, uh, uh, my name is Alice Ko. Uh, I'm one of the core contributors for the Navi protocol. Uh, Navi, <coughs> Navi protocol, we're the leading uh, lending plus liquid staking DeFi on top of the three network with over 200 million TVL and uh, 800K users. I'm actually very excited to be here today, you know, after two years, because uh, East Denver was actually the first e crypto event I've ever been to almost two years ago, you know. <laughs> Coming back the third time in 2024 as a speaker on stage, uh, it's really honored to be here. And you know today's topic regarding the how do we get from hackathon, really building project, and eventually land uh, uh, investment. This is a really long journey. I have been to hackathon like 10 hackathons, 10 plus hackathons uh, before starting the Navi uh, protocol. So really, really excited to be here today to share the experience and help all the builders to uh, to future success. Thanks. Hey everybody, uh, Alan from Covenant Finance. Uh, Covenant Finance uh, pretty much issues tradable debt against any asset. These could be collateralized debt, uncollateralized debt, and the key aspect is that the price it's trading at dictates the interest rate charge on the debt. Uh, so really excited to be here. We are uh, launching on Arbitrum and Optimism in the coming weeks, and so uh, looking forward to seeing some of you guys test our product is currently live and win some points. Just in time, Ray. Uh, we're giving intros. Want to give a quick hello? Hello? Hey, sorry, guys. Um, yeah, my name is Ray. Thanks for having me. Um, founder of Bbox. Been working with Steven for a very long time. Great friends with Elisco from Navi, as well as from uh, Task Finance. I guess, not, I guess now it's like Covenant. Covenant. So, yeah. yeah, happy to be here. Sorry about that, guys. All good. Um, yeah, again, I'm Steven, uh, Steven Chen, uh, founder, uh, GP at Prestar Capital, pre-seed fund. Uh, we run a pre-accelerator fellowship that writes first checks as well as pre-seed checks up to 500K. Um, so cool. Let's jump right into it. Maybe let's start with something fun. Um, any war stories that you guys could share? Um, why don't we start with you, Alan? <laughs> Yeah, and I think actually I'm going to talk exactly about that. So we were uh, called Task Finance, and we actually rebranded pretty recently. Uh, so war stories, there's a lot of negative stories. This is a bit of a positive story. So uh, one of our angels that joined us uh, came from Synthetics. I kind of met him in New York at a cafe. And this is like a bit of a movie moment. Uh, I, I was basically there. We were talking about tradable debt, uh, protocol debt, issuing debt for protocols. Uh, and at the very end, I'm saying goodbye and whatnot, and he kind of stands up and is like, hey, by the way, <coughs> like, where, what? Kind of said, I don't like Taz, you should call it Covenant. <laughs> and actually then thinking about it, I was like, okay, great, Kane, thank you. But after thinking about it a lot, it's like, oh, wait, we're sort of like creating a debt market. Covenant is basically agreement between people, how you create an economic society. Uh, and actually, from a, from a debt perspective, finance is all about covenants. And so it, the, the name sort of like quickly grew with the team and... And, and we've used it since. I don't think it's, it's usual to have that, uh, but that's, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a fun story on our side. It's like that moment in the Facebook movie. It right? is, Where it kind of is. Yeah. <laughs> Drop the duh. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know, so I was the co-founder of an NFT infrastructure startup called Satori, and we nailed our branding. It was perfect. It was Japanese-inspired. We had famous artists do it. Um, we built really cool technology that nobody wanted. And, <laughs> and so I had raised like $1.6 million, hired engineers in New York City, done like Art Basel launches, and you know, had everything, and suddenly realized you had no product market fit. It was like, okay, maybe I should have worked on that first. <laughs> so I think that the, the war stories is that sometimes you don't know, you know where you are standing until you take a breath and pause and you say, you know, am I building something that has a problem or am I creating something that perhaps comes from a future vision but is not necessarily representative of the market today? And that was probably one of the hardest and most expensive lessons I had to learn and the crux of uh, my experience and journey as a founder and uh, something that I carry on now as a VC. I can be the next uh, the war story, I think. Well, um, circle back to what, what Danny said, you know, like there's always, if you look at the space, there's always two types of company. Number one is a kind, kind of company that already has very crystal clear part of market fit. They raise a like, stable round, they probably have the valuation, you know, with the industry standard to be bargaining, like to, to match up with. And they raise a fund, they, they convince investors, you know, you know, in six months, 12 months, I'm going to reach this valuation, and this is why I'm raising right now. And there's a second type of company, which is you probably have this uh, very high level, uh, you know, like concept, like modular, modular, you know, like new layer one, much more better, but nobody really understands, like, they're going to be a new part of market fit. So I think, as, as a builder for myself, I think uh, you're just, as someone who started with the participating hackathon to eventually raise $2 million, I think as a founder, you really need to identify, hey, which kind of path you want to take. Both are okay. You know, there's going to be tons of failures. This is not my first startup, but, you know, it's okay. And the, uh, the war story, I, I would say, was um, the last uh, four weeks, right before my token launch, I think was the most productive two, four weeks I ever had in my fundraising journey. But... Uh, the, the question and the, the lesson I learned was, you know, the growth is never linear and it's always go as exponential, you know, potentially the last week. And even there are investors bugging me around like now, like at different stage, at different conference, say, hey, there's still any chance we can invest in any kind of way. So I, I would just say don't based on the investment and, you know, the, the investor's opinion to judge about your growth potential. Regardless of your token launch, you know, what's happening, you need to start for the fundamentals. Uh, think of the fundamentals, which is if you're running the company, if you're on the driver's seat, how do you grow? And, you know, every day I wake up, I think this is a, this is a war. Um, you know, whether it's today is with investors, tomorrow is with customers, partners, but it's, it's exciting, you know. So really, uh, really excited I was to share this thing. I love that. Great advice. <laughs> Ray, do you, want, do you have any war stories you want to add? I'm covered in scars, man. So um, <laughs> if you got war stories, we can be here all night. Uh, I think really when it comes down, there's so many struggles probably with token launch. We're not quite there yet. But along the way, I think as a founder, you need to find, you need to find that quiet confidence within you to not you know, easily swerve on your path because there's just always going to be customers, investors, narratives. There are going to be so many factors. It's really important to tune out the noise and, and just be decisive, be steadfast, understand what you're building, um, really grasp whatever that you're really good at and try to capitalize on that and leverage that, right? Because so often, more often than not, people are going to tell you different things. Everybody has their own different opinion. But at the end of the day, I think the biggest thing that you will learn as a founder is to, to understand that at the end of the day, you're the person that's you know, living and breathing this thing that you're building. So. Nobody really understands whatever that you're doing better than you do. That's not saying like being conceited, still st like stay open-minded and everything, but you actually have all the information or more information than everybody. It's not just something, it's both on the, on the product side, internals, and, and, and you probably spend more time thinking about it more than everybody else. Um, I think the biggest struggle that I have had is you know, constantly second doubting myself, thinking about, hey, this person just said this, are we really making the right progress? Is this really the right direction? But the moment you get yourself into kind of that, 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 that space, 
it's a never-ending battle because you're always trying to, people talk about mimetic desires, you're always trying to imitate somebody else and not playing your own game. So yeah, that's probably the biggest struggle that I have been battling with. That's a quotable one, play your own game, trust yourself, yeah. love that. Uh, so let's move on to and kind of explore the different funding types that are out there. So this next question will be for Danny, but you know, if we kind of look at the current landscape of funding options, there's nine dilutive options like hackathons, there's foundation grants and other types of grants. Then of course there's the dilutive options such as angel investors, fellowship programs, accelerator programs, venture funds of course, you have ecosystem funds, and then you have the Web3 native funding options, right? IDEO, uh, IEO, NFTs, whatever you want to call it. So when you kind of, for, for Danny, what advice do you give to founders when you're evaluating all of these different funding options and funding types? I think one of the main things I would sort of give in terms of advice to founders or, or builders at a hackathon is that your hackathon project doesn't have to become a company. It really doesn't. It's something you came up with for a weekend uh, as, as a fun idea to, to hack on. And like, you don't have to, you know, die on that hill. Like that was something cool you did and maybe it's the team that you preserve, right? Maybe it's the people you met um, that started thinking of something that you could build if you had a lot more time. And so one of the coolest projects I've seen actually um, come out of East Denver was um, called Rhinestone last year. And they did something very little and then the team got together and then they started working on a really big protocol for DeFi security. And they were inspired here, but they created when they were back in London. And so, um, you know, I think getting started in your journey and figuring out what you have is really important because if what you have is a hackathon project you maybe want to explore further, you definitely have to look at like the non-dilutive options, which is like, will someone give you an exploratory grant to you know, spend a month or two with your friends, just figuring out if this thing can happen or not. Um, once you get past this sort of idea stage, you need to make a concrete plan for how this is going to become a business, whether it has any sort of exit opportunity or whether it's a public good or like what, what path is it going to take. And that's actually when um, accelerators and incubators are actually quite good, is if you're, if you're sort of in this early idea stage and you need someone to like handhold you through that process of turning it into an actual small startup. And, uh, and once you get to that small startup phase, you're gonna be in your pre-seed funding. Um, don't spend your own money. <laughs> I also learned that the hard way. You know, it's like you wanna bet on yourself, but like um, there are significant costs to setting up a company. So you do need an early stage partner. You do want someone who's willing to take a chance on you and believe in you and write that first check. And like those are the pre-seed funds that are out there. And they serve that purpose of like absorbing part of the risk. And obviously like, you know, there, there is like a, a risk reward component to taking, to taking on the highest level of risk at that stage. And, and most companies don't make it past that phase. And, and I think that's the reality. So if you do make it past that phase, you start in the early stage one, and that's when you start to talk to um, you know, the pre-seed seed funds who are gonna write you slightly larger checks. They're gonna wanna see something already uh, on paper, they're going to want to see that you have some code in your GitHub repo, maybe something that's in beta, something that's up and running, maybe some commitments from partners that want to use what you're building. Um, and that sort of takes you up the stages. So I think everything is a little bit like, like a ladder. Um, and, and once you're climbing that ladder, I think the main difference between the eco funds and the um, traditional funds, as you mentioned, is that eco funds aren't looking to get economic returns on your investment. They're trying to get ecosystem growth as a result of that. So they're a lot more willing to take a chance on like fuzzy metrics versus I think um, more traditional investors have a mandate to produce profit for their LPs. And so they're always going to be searching for, okay, how does this eventually create an ecosystem that creates something that creates a profit? And that mindset influences like how they think about the world. So you have to think about like who you want to partner with and what you want to accomplish and um, choose accordingly. Great advice. I think this is a pretty good segue to, to Elliscope, right? So Elliscope, um, as far as I understand, your journey actually started here uh, at ETH Denver at a hackathon. So 
Can you talk us through your, your journey, your fundraising journey from starting at a hackathon and you, know, you most recently closed a $2 million raise, right? Uh, if you could walk us through that path. Yeah, um, I, I have a lot of emotion attachment to East Denver. You know, like the first year that was 2022 when I was here, I didn't know anything about crypto uh, besides buying, you know, East on the Coinbase. And I was here uh, just going around events like every, probably every developer here, you know, understanding what's, what's a blockchain and what's uh, DeFi, what's a DEX, what's a lending pretty much. And I, I think the, 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 the thing I learned from that networking events is it's overwhelming. And there's so many things happening. How do you identify you spend your rhyme correctly for the stage I was at? And I think the, the good lesson I learned was I was trying to take notes for the things I learned and try to do my research. It takes five seconds, 10 seconds, just to, you know, when you look at those companies' name, like Story Protocol that's popping up, you look it up, what does that do? And you, you do your homework just for like 10, 20 seconds, and you go to talk to them after you do your homework. I think that was something I learned. And I quickly figured out, you know, the verticals that's already been within the space, uh, what, you know, like potentially verticals that I'm personally very interested. This kind of echo is what Danny was saying. I think as a founder, you know, when you are building hacks on project, it might become just from something A. I'm very passionate about it. But if you become a founder, like, just like you're becoming an investor, you need to be responsible for your LPs, for your customers, for your team, and there are a variety of skills you need to consider of. This is not just say, hey, how do I build an API that can be paid with crypto? This is really thinking of the sustainability, the growth trajectory of everything. So I think my first A standard, I would just say, hey, I want to figure it out, learn the space. And uh, after I go back from East Denver, I figured out, like, you know, I did a bunch of research, joined a project that I kind of really passionate about. And I, because I believe DeFi is going to be there for the next decade or even two, three decades. And I want to invest myself to this space. And join the project, learn everything as a part of manager, work for that project for like a year. And I, at the end of this year, I figure, I, I kind of capture and learn a lot of DeFi knowledge through that uh, DeFi protocol, which happens to be very fortunate to be the largest uh, CDP stablecoin on top of BNB chain. And last East Denver, I came back. I would say, hey, I think I'm ready to build something. I, I identify the person, the, the founder, the co-founder that I, I want to partner with, who was a college friend of mine. And uh, I, I flew to his house, spent a week living with him, just telling him, hey, I, buddy, I want to build something. I don't know what it is yet, but I want to build them, and I feel I'm ready. And I came back to East Denver, I went to a bunch of, you know, blockchain conference, just apply the methodology I share, uh, and find a narrative, find a vertical, and start from a PPT company, and, you know, here I am today after a year. Uh, and something to share, like, I think this echo with what Ray was saying, uh, you know, and I'm pretty sure you echo with this as well, is, um, just when you're building as a founder, there's always going to be right and wrong. People are going to give you so many opinions. Um, I think it's okay for you to realize, you know, you probably only achieve 20% or even 30% of people saying. Maybe this, you know, the conversation that you're having right now kind of decides your future for the upcoming six months to 12 months. You know, maybe someone, this conversation, one conversation that people already predict the end of your end game, but it's okay. Uh, the exec there's a huge gap between execution and conversation. And it takes time, it takes money, it takes the team morale to really execute and deliver. And there might be pivoting moments that are happening, there might be new ideas that fail. And this is just the, the consistency of growth and the iteration. So I, I start to understand that perspective much more. And I think that helps me to grow more confidently as a founder and to you know, establish a team or well for the team as well. So yeah, hopefully that wraps up the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you're a great case study for the attendees here, right? Because you, know, you, you came to ETH Denver to first learn about it two years ago. You know, last year you came and, you know, were inspired to kind of take the next step. And now here you are with, with Navi Protocol. So, um, lo and with my journey. team over there. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's, let's hear Alan's story. So, you know, Alan, you went through a fellowship program. You then joined Alliance Dow Accelerator. Walk us through your fundraising path and why you chose your particular path. Yeah, and I won't go through all dimensions about thinking about funding. I think we'll cover it through a lot of us, but just very narrowly when you start thinking about accelerators and, and for us, 
Um, the, the team comes from Palantir, but we are sort of coming from TradFi. And, and, and coming into crypto, there's a big aspect of sort of crypto reputation and, and growing into the crypto community. Uh, and also growth in crypto is very different than any sort of Web2 growth. And, and I found it uh, priceless to be able to join Press Start uh, and, and understand some of those dynamics, get intros to the community, get that reputation, and also fine tune the story that then, same thing, went into Alliance and so on and so forth. Um, the only thing I would add there is I was very uh, careful in choosing uh, the accelerators because part of it was um, there, are, there are some predatory uh, accelerators out there. We got a couple of offers that we just passed, uh, but, but it's, some are very clear they have value. Uh, and, and those that have value are not really looking for big equity stakes or whatnot. They're really, you can see from the start that they, they're out there. Uh, they, they have good reputation from people that have gone through them. Uh, and, and it's all positive uh, when you make the right choices. Um, let's hear Ray's story. So, you know, you also did a fellowship. You then joined the Binance Labs uh, incubation program and you recently uh, closed a raise uh, that was publicly announced recently. So could you walk us through your journey and kind of why you chose your path? Yeah, I think even just in general, when you're early on choosing the investors or picking out what kind of program you want to attend, um, you want to align yourselves with people that, you know, that will actually offer help and that help should strategically um, really uh, align with whatever path that you're choosing to take. So we're pretty meticulous about that. We're really lucky that we got to work with Press Start. I think Alan and I will probably have nothing but great words to, to speak uh, about, about Press Start. Um, early on, a lot of these things really come down to personal relationships, interactions, trying to figure out, um, getting all the input that you can. The hardest thing about being a crypto founder is you don't really have tons of feedback uh, things like day one, right? You kind of have to walk in the dark, figure out a lot of these things on your, on your own. And the truth is you don't really have to. If you find the right people that's surrounding you um, via a hackathon where fellow builders are trying to build different things or via, uh, you know, investors like Prestar that works really closely with the protocols. Uh, so we, we probably had probably like what, like close to like 100 meetings with the Prestar guys like for the first like couple of months just to trying to figure out how do we position ourselves? And you want to have someone in the corner where they are truly like an AMA, that you could ask them anything. Um, because even if you have done something in this space, this space changes so quickly. Um, from, I'm not just talking about the narrative side of things, I'm talking about from ops, legal, everything always moves so quickly. So you want to get your hand on someone who has their uh, kind of the you know, fresh kind of uh, uh, information. Um, you want to get hands on those kind of uh, information and you want to be talking to those people that's in the trenches, always talking to builders. You want to get that information uh, right across the door. So I would say that's probably the most helpful thing because later on you'll talk to bigger institutions, etc. cetera. Um, but they're, they're they also work with protocols, but likely they have, what, like 100 uh, whatever in their portfolio. You want to align yourself with those ones that, that work really closely with, uh, with the protocols and that take fewer bets, but more concentrated, calculated bets. Um, those are the people that you want to really be friends with uh, for, for at least the first stage of whatever you're building. Awesome. Um, so we've talked about like different advice for founders. Um, I want to pose this next question to, to Danny. What are some of the biggest mistakes that founders make that they should be aware of and try to avoid? That's a really hard question. I mean, I don't think that there's necessarily, you know, clear mistakes, but I do remember um, a really interesting lecture by the head of the entrepreneurship department over at Tuck. And he said that, uh, 95% of startups fail, and most of it is because, not because they didn't have a great idea or a great project, but because of operations. And I think that's actually, I have seen to be true. Um, I had no idea how challenging it is to set up a proper legal entity in America. 
Um, you have to file documents with like the state, with the city, your every single employee is in. You have to do federal forms. You have so the first hire I made was a head of operations. <laughs> so that was the first person I paid like significant money to. Was like, please do this. Um, and so I think that. Um, that's really good advice is to get some help early on. You don't have to hire a full-time person, but there's um, really great tools you can use. Like there's a, like a PEO provider that's very crypto startup friendly. It's called Deal Inc. And they'll act as your intermediary for payroll until you're big enough to like get your own gusto account, right? Until you have someone that will manage things for you and they'll be compliant, they'll make sure that like taxes get paid. I know a huge L1 that operated in America without this for a while. And um, you know, we won't name names, but like, you know, they're they were young kids who, who started this and they were doing really great and their valuation was soaring and they never thought that they had to do something like withhold taxes or play or pay employee benefits, right? And like that's very problematic. And so, and so I think that like one of the best advice I can give is like don't forget that the boring part of operations is still very important and another to be able to be successful in your project and focus on that big picture idea. Love that. Let's, <clears throat> excuse me, let's, um, let's talk about token launches. So Elliscope, uh, putting you on the spot, uh, if you're able to share uh, your experience and any sort of advice um, for founders that are exploring that path. Uh, yeah, um, so I would say, I, I would say, I, you know, I, I kind of was starting off with, uh, let's say, people may be very excited about token launches, right? And uh, the fact I, I want to emphasize with uh, is token launch does not mean the end game. And this is not, let's say, hey, we're done token launch, then um, we can just chill. And, and, and the one thing I learned was right after token launch, what we do afterwards. And regarding the, you know, the, and which is one of the primary reasons we're at, I'm at, with my team at East Denver right now, we're trying to figure out what's next goal and trajectory we want to do uh, for, you know, right after token launch. But back to the question, uh, as far as I can share, I have two advice to share. Number one, I think, is to manifest how you want this game to play out. By manifest, what I mean is pick something that you, you, you're comfortable with, right? If you, if you say, hey, this is a timeline and I want to do my uh, project and this is the angle I want, to, I want to meet. And I always constantly, every month, every two months, check, cross-check, do your DD with peers across, like, around you. It's very easy, you know, chat with three to five people to figure it out, do you think this is the right timing for me, for startup like the stage I am, to do the token launch. If you get eight out of 10, say no, then you probably shouldn't do a token launch. Especially, I think the most valuable thing is check with investors. Because you, they're the person that usually have the macro, high level economic understanding and perspective on looking at things like, hey, you know, maybe six months later, this kind of thing might be happening. For example, the Bitcoin happening that's happening, that can give you much more high level advice on how you should timeline your token launch. And which, you know, as indiv individual founders and builders, we're very hands on building within my own vertical. We don't usually look about uh, very easily. So this is number one advice I would give, which is manifest how you want to play it out and get advice from other people. And second is if you have a crystal clear timeline or even just timely time that you want to do, stick to it. Don't easily change because of what other people say. I would just say, you know, come up with a reasonable timeline and it's okay to buffer it out for like another two weeks, a month's time, but stick to your execution plan. There's usually a playbook of how you want to execute it. And you know, don't be destroyed by or influenced by those investors and exchange who say, hey, you know, maybe have you ever considered other opportunities? Have those conversations carefully, but also confidently to communicate and messaging out your timeline. I think this is a, the number one thing I learned, you know, a, lot, a million things might fall apart, last minute accidents might happening, but have a plan and stick to a plan is really important. And you, you really got to believe, you know, life is long. There are people, if you look at the, the McDonald's movie, which is persistency, is, uh, 
is the, the thing for everything. Maybe on the day one, you don't get listed on the reputable number one exchanges, but it's okay. The company is still growing. You need to identify the metrics and stick to the execution. I think that is, that is sometimes, I might be biased, but that is, if you took people look at the Web3 space company, why a lot of them are short-lived in compare with traditional Web2 space, like, you know, Alan has been very experienced in Web2 space, is there are people ha was under the impression this, um, you know, after tokenized, they don't need to do everything. They don't need to do things, but. Did, did you find that people were trying to shorten your timeline or lengthen your timeline? Uh, lengthen my timeline. Le lengthen? Yeah. Okay, delay. Okay. Yeah, like ask for extension because there's other priority, other things coming up. I think stick to a timeline and deliverables is very important. And uh, yeah, and you know, and finally, you know, I also want to echo back is uh, always cherish the people surrounding you. Don't only value, the, you know, the value of ad they can put up, potentially provide you the moment they meet you, but really thinking about, hey, six months later, you know, will there be any synergies? Because Ray and I, we actually get to know each other a long time back. When we got, we met each other at East Denver last year. Exactly. <laughs> in one year. One year, and we I was a long year knowing you, bro. And uh, we met at a KTV party, <laughs> and he was an amazing singer. And we're going, and we're going again tonight. Yes. <laughs> some, some more stories there. Uh, and and you know, I was no a PPD. Comments. I was a PPD company. I was literally a PPD company, pitching, getting like just to know people and. One year later, you know, I think Ray is doing his startup. Like, so I, I think this is amazing. You know, I, I would just love to see. So thinking about like even one year later at Stanford, how things will potentially play out. There's lots of possibilities, and and never I would just say cherish every people you learn, meet along the way, and and trust yourself. You're gonna be there. You know, just as long as you have the persistency. Yeah. One year is a long time, crypto Espe dog years, especially for knowing him. Yeah. It's a long time. Uh, how about you, Ray? So, you know, you, you closed a very successful oversubscribed round, I believe. Um, can you talk us through any specific tips or tactics uh, for founders that are thinking about uh, their next raise? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and kind of like answering the question on also the biggest mistake that a founder could kind of get into is, is trying to be too perfect, uh, um, you know, um, that, that's honestly the biggest thing that I realized, right? Um, as a founder, you want to be responsible to your investors, to your team, to your community, all of those things above. But a lot of times, the best timing to do something is right now. Um, I think a lot of founders are too timid and they wait around for the best timing on, on raise, they wait around for the best timing for product launch to um, to, or, or the best timing to ship out the products and talk to the customers. But honestly, realizing that a lot of times the best timing is just now, right? Um, when, I think Ellescope is one of like more meticulous founders. Um, I, I try to be more strategic around a lot of things that I want to do. Uh, but once in a while, what, what it comes down, and I realize this, sometimes you, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta go in just sometimes. Um, I think we waited around for fundraising, we're thinking about, hey, because we, we raised in like Q3 last year, and it was, what well, Bitcoin was still hovering like what, like 30K? Um, we waited around and be like, oh, is the market going to warm up? Should we talk to investors now? Uh, should we talk to, should we build a community around now? But oftentimes, what, I, what it comes down to is really, um, you just gotta do it. Um, and then you will, you never prepare for the challenge because you will never be prepared for the challenge when the challenge comes. What we end up doing is you rise up to the challenges. Um, so that would be probably my, my biggest tip on really everything, including fundraising. I really love that advice because like so many founders just get caught up in the analysis paralysis, right? Or just trying to be too perfect. So yeah, that was, that was great. Thanks for that. Um, Alan, let's go to you. So obviously you have a very storied, I guess, traditional Web2 background. Any tips for other builders that are kind of also making that leap from Web2 to Web3? I think it's a little bit what I was, was talking before. Uh, it's uh, breaking in a way into the crypto community is not that easy. Uh, and, and so there's many things. One is coming to events, ETH Denver, ETH CC, uh, token 2049, if you can go, I think it's Dubai now and then also Singapore again. Uh, those events are priceless. Uh, at the beginning, the first time I came to East Denver, I, I felt lost, just navigating, and then slowly now you start meeting people. 
the second is, uh, I, I mean, I've, uh, accelerators, because uh, I find two things there, or three things. One is they have seen thousands of companies going through, uh, going through crypto, crypto, right? Specifically crypto accelerators. Uh, and so they have very specific pattern recognition and advice for that. Uh, the second is you're starting with sort of like a, a cohort, a community of other people, uh, which become really your close, your close friends and, and supporters. And so you, you, you cannot bootstrap a community that way. And they have a network, they have connections. Uh, and then the last is that um, crypto is all about reputation. Like it's a little bit being an anon, but at the same time, people want to know who it is that's building something in the back. And so again, it all goes back to networking. So a lot of execution and building, but like a lot of, a lot of uh, networking, I, I would say. Also, speaking of building reputation, I think it's really cool to make open source contributions and actually like have yes. those go live because those are things that others can reference and be like, oh, hey, like that's the person that built XYZ or like that's the person that stopped this hack or that's the person. You know, everyone's watching crypto Twitter and GitHub and all the repos. And so I think to your point of reputation, that's really, really important. That's a good point. And I also want to add to on that, I kind of feel like credibility is the ultimate currency in this world. And it can be even small things, you know, it can be like, if you meet this person first time, right, you make some small, move, when you hang out with them, you make some small moves that shows you are being considerate, thoughtful, and even, you know, when they don't respond to your message as a founder, right, I think this is one of the biggest challenging I was, I faced when I was early, like early stage, I had one, like, one of the investor. Uh, who ended up to call in my round, uh, which re very reputable one, and he didn't engage in the very beginning, and I just kept following up with him consistently for six months. And one day he just said, hey, like how much you have left? And can I call lead? Like without even jumping a call. And that was, the, I, and that took like six months efforts, and then eventually, you know, he just say, can I call you and how much you need? And I, I think that, that, you know, that's how my interpretation of credibility is the ultimate currency in this world. Yeah, so just want to echo with that. Credibility coin, let's go. <laughs> um, so, all right, I think we're wrapping up. Maybe we could do like 10 second last thoughts from, from each of you. Um, Ray, do you want to start and kind of go down? Yeah, I mean, press start is a killer. Have fun, Vidal on. Crypto fun alive is very fun and challenging. <laughs> I would say have fun, execute, and, uh, and the other one is investors kind of want to see your persistence. So there is a little bit of like, they'll a little bit of say no to see if you will keep on pushing because they want to see you uh, not give up. Uh, so keep on persisting. That's what I would say. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate all the insights. Um, very Thank helpful. Thank you, Steven. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Steve. Thank you so much.
We're all just looking at each other, right? Yep, Is there much. a camera? Um, I yeah. There's the camera over oh, there. Okay, cool. I don't think we will be able to. Cool. <laughs> All right, good morning, ETH Denver. Excited for this panel today. I'm Max Segal, I'm the COO at Privy. And for those who don't know Privy, we're the easiest way for crypto app developers to onboard their users. And today we're gonna have a panel on customer-driven product development on chain. So we have some amazing founders and ecosystem builders in crypto, all with great experience building products around real customer needs. This is a topic super near and dear to my heart. It's how we think about everything product related at Privy. And so without further ado, I'd love each of our panelists to introduce themselves, say a little bit about what they're building and where they got the idea to build it from. Hey everyone, I'm Eunice Giarda. I'm co-founder and COO of Monad Labs, and we're building the Monad blockchain. Uh, Monad is a layer one EVM compatible blockchain. Um, we are super, uh, sorry, we are optimizing the EVM from the ground up, um, introducing parallel execution, um, pipelining, a really optimized consensus mechanism um, for a much faster, um, more efficient way to transact on the um, Ethereum VM. We're targeting 10,000 transactions per second, and we are, um, well, I guess that's just real. We're looking forward to the next several months in bringing our product to market. Great. So, GM everyone, my name is Anton Buenavista, and I mainly lead the business development side of uh, Pendle, so also doing ecosystem growth. So what Pendle essentially is, is that it's a yield trading platform where you can take your yield bearing tokens, split it into its yield and principal components, and then trade them in its own markets. So, you know, given the market right now, one of the interesting use cases that we've enabled is that people have been speculating on the points side of things, like from Eigenlayer and the different LRTs out there, from Athena, et cetera. And, you know, since points are essentially part of the yield, we enable that market where, you know, points are, you know, being traded, um, you know, essentially. So, yeah, um, and other than that, we have, you know, a very big fixed rate market where people can get fixed rates for different uh, types of assets. And, yeah, like, you know, we, we, we just basically We've been able to flourish this uh, you know, interesting use case for both uh, you know, volatile and uh, fixed rate markets. Yep. Um, well, I'm glad to be here. My name is Julie Mosler. I oversee marketing at CoinFund. We're one of the world's earliest crypto native investment firms backing the leaders of the new internet. Um, and my job there is to increase visibility of the firm and our investors. And I'm also building a go-to-market advisory. So partnering with all of the really brave builders in our space to make sure that their ideas are seen and that they go to market in a really strategic way so that they're using their resources, connecting with their customers, and moving really quickly to go from zero to one. Hello, everybody. My name is Jared Wynn. I'm a founder at Wynn Ventures. We are a growth accelerator for seed blockchain-based companies. Um, we help many projects. We work alongside VCs to essentially build projects to the levels that they want to achieve. So we do all of the different things with regards to marketing, um, various levels of advisory, things of that nature. Um, my background essentially worked in Silicon Valley for about 10 years, worked at Binance for a while as a senior vice president, and then ultimately decided to bridge into what I'm doing now with our fund. And we just want to help the right projects, get the visibility and ensure that they're being heard. Amazing. So today we have, we have founders, people who are on the ground building products around customers, and then we have partners who oversee dozens, probably hundreds of teams and have a direct, you know, both advisory view and bird's eye view into the product development process. So to start, and, and we'll probably weave in different types of stories. Um, so on the advisor side, you know, if there are stories that are particularly relevant with companies you work with, feel free to highlight those. I'd love to hear you know, about the initial, initial product development and whether there were specific customers or users or ecosystem stakeholders that the idea for your projects formed around. Yeah, sure, I guess I can start there. So the story of Pendle basically started during the last cycle, uh, you know, DeFi summer, essentially, during 2019-2020-ish. Uh, and 
this was the season where we started seeing all those different food coins, you know, the pickles, the yams, the sushi, sashimis, etc., with over 10,000, 20,000 APY, you know, Olympus Dow, if you remember that. Um, and yeah, like, you know, we were very avid DeFi users, we're very DeFi native, and we were basically farming all these different tokens. But there wasn't really an avenue to be able to hedge your risk against this, you know, crazy APYs out there. So that was kind of like the motivation behind uh, you know, starting Pendle, where you know we wanted to essentially create a market where people can essentially trade these yields. So if you think that you know you're bearish on these yields, then you can essentially take, get a fixed rate. But you know, if you're long yields, then you can essentially you know gain more or leverage your exposure to, into that. So yeah, like you know, we, we basically started off that. Of course, you know, for us it was difficult at, at the start because it was a very complex product. We essentially introduced like more tokens around it. Like we, we call this the, the yield token, the principal token. And you know, like uh, given the market back then where you know people were pretty much like you know this degen ape like people. Um, it was a very complex product, and so um, there was initial struggles in trying to get that off and, you know, getting more mind share from the market. But yeah, like, you know, that was kind of like the story behind of how Pendle started, and I think that as the market is improving right now and we're starting to see all these different uh, yield opportunities out there, we're starting to see, um, you know, more traction on, on the Pendle uh, protocol as well. Um, and yeah, like, you know, we've, we've been just trying to attach ourselves to all, all these ongoing narratives out there. So starting with, you know, being a beneficiary of the growth of liquid staking because, you know, leading to the Chappelle upgrade in last April. Um, people were kind of like speculating on uh, the yields of uh, those uh, staking rewards. And then now you basically have, you know, uh, with Eigenlayer, the Eigenlayer ecosystem with all these uh, different liquid restaking tokens, um, you know, with uh, EtherFi and Renzo and Kelp, et cetera. So, and we've been, been able to create markets around these different tokens where people can essentially express their view on the direction of those yields. Yeah. On the Monad side, the origin story I think is really more from my co-founders, Keone Han and James Hunsaker, when they were um, back at Jump Crypto, um, as users themselves of um, you know, uh, blockchain technology, um, I think building within the space really allowed them to understand what some of the frictions were. Um, their backgrounds prior to that was on the high frequency trading side of the business at Jump Trading, and so hopping over into Jump Crypto really opened their eyes and um, really made them feel some of the frictions of what it was actually like to be a builder within the space. Um, and using their backgrounds of high performance uh, systems, um, algorithmic trading and such, um, felt that the, their capabilities, their backgrounds were uniquely suited to rebuild um, a client that would be sufficiently fast, um, sufficiently um, organized, um, and could make the overall developer experience really smooth and seamless. Amazing. On, on the advisor investor side, I'd love to hear your perspective on some of the biggest founder challenges you see in developing an initial go-to-market strategy. Um, I would say this, this um, the thought of build it and they will come is like really a fallacy. I don't know if you agree, um, but um, it's a little bit of a, an arrogant point of view and, and one that I see a lot of people get stuck on because if we think of some of the lessons that we learned in Web 2, um, consumers are hit with so many messages. Just you know, the minute that you step online on the internet, you see it at the show. There's there's fantastic ideas here, and there are thousands of them. And if all of these ideas are good ideas, why is yours the one that should capture someone's interest um, within a quarter of a second? That's like how much you get to try to win someone over. Um, so to think that that's how much attention that you get, and then on top of that, you're teaching why your product is worthy, why this new um, world within Web3 is worth um, changing their behavior when Web2 seems like it could be just as good. Um, we're teaching people where we are in the zeitgeist. Um, we're teaching people why your category or your industry is rising up and it's gonna be the next layer of the internet. So there's a lot of layers of messages there. And the average team that we see is very technical and um, has a product that is worthy of being used, but how does all of that weave together? And we would call that a narrative. And in crypto, narrative wins. And the teams that are getting money, the teams that are getting customers, are the ones that have mastered how to weave this together into one really succinct story that both their customers and their users understand with one pitch. 
And so I think rather than thinking that the product is just going to draw people to you, um, founders embody this belief and they teach narrative very early on. They invest in good marketing or a good storyteller and you see it embedded throughout like every corner of the company and the go to market strategy like very early on. I think that Jules really just hit the nail on the head and I think I could develop even a little further on that in which the industry that we're in a lot of the builders that come into this, this is an industry of opportunity and there's plenty of opportunity for people who have a vision to come into this with very minimal barrier to entry if they have the right idea that it can start there. But I think that it also really depends on where that person is at in their personal journey. And when we're in this industry, we get a lot of people that fall into success and I feel that the ones that continue to succeed through market cycles and so forth are the ones that can see past what I'd refer to as their ego. Um, very seldomly is the first idea of a product the one that ends up coming to market. And I think the, the best projects that I've seen are the ones that have a founder that doesn't have an ego in which it's, he's, he or she is humble enough to say, you know, or even receive advice from those that are either investing in them or those that may have another concept that may be influential. I had one project, for example, um, it, I, I guess I could say it, it was three commas. It was a trading platform for trade automation and so forth. And the initial product that they developed was very much driven by customer feedback. And they allowed their customers to drive the future development of what it was they were creating. And so ultimately, a full-fledged product, which then became investable, ultimately was defined by not them, but by those that who are using it. So I think that those individuals that can see past that perhaps their idea isn't the one that's going to be the end measure, um, but those that are willing to receive feedback and ultimately be nimble and ensure that what they are going to develop at the end of it might not be what they first envisioned. I actually, I have a good example of this. Um, so we have a portfolio company called Demo. Demo is awesome if you have a car, a lot of us drive, you can either plug it into your car, you use an app that connects to the app that your vehicle already has, and with that you get rewards, you can see more uh, data about the, your car's performance, and it helps make you a smarter driver on the, per, uh, the performance of your vehicle. And so Demo hosted a Deepin dinner, and we had different founders there, and it was really awesome to see how Deepin ignites in the space today. And not one, but two people said, well, how did you, how did you get the, the permission to host the Deepin dinner? And, and, and that's a bizarre question, right? Like, what do you mean? Who gives the permission for you to be the, the host of the Deepin dinner? And the answer is that um, anybody is allowed to talk on behalf of a category or step into your power and lead a narrative. And that's exactly what they did, which was really smart. We love Demo at Privy, big fans. So it's, 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 we're hearing about this, it's like a dance between the product, how you let the market know what the product is, and then what feedback you get on that, and how it feeds into how the product needs to evolve. And so I'd love to hear, in the earliest stages, as you're, you're building and getting that initial signal on your product, what was the most you know, concrete signal you got from your initial build out that influenced the shape of your product or that influenced the shape of one of one of your, the companies you work with. Would love to hear the story there. Okay. All right, I can start. Um, it's an interesting question given that like right now Monad is still you know, pre-production, we're still very much heads down in development. Um, but at the same time, we have had uh, the ability to have conversations with a ton of developers um, within the EVM space and beyond who are struggling with different aspects of the development cycle, whether it's um, a lack of tooling or um, complicated features or honestly cost um, and that's like a big part of what drives where a project is deployed because um, obviously it affects bottom line and so all of these different things are taken into account as we're thinking about how to appropriately build Monad um, as a fully functioning blockchain where to um, emphasize the product roadmap like what features to really hone in on um, because nothing is free, right? Like it takes time to implement features that hopefully eventually users will use. So um, having direct feedback about what is actually important to our end users and developers is um, essential to how we are um, de developing our product. 
Yeah, so for Pendle, right? So we basically really believe in the product that we're building. Um, in fact, in TradFi, it's the biggest market out there, right? So for interest rate swap derivatives out there, it's a 600 trillion market. And so bringing this into DeFi just made a lot of sense. And you know, I think it's a very, fin uh, very strong and uh, important uh, financial primitive. But you know, echoing what Julie just said a while ago, um, where you know, if you just build it, then users will come. This is kind of like something that we initially believed as well. But of course, that's not totally true at all. Because you know, during the initial days of uh, when we launched uh, Pendle, uh, we, we really struggled there. You know, because uh, first of all, it was a very complex product. The, the idea of like, being able to trade the yields was unheard of until that point of time. And of course, you know, the, the app itself was a, a bit clunky. The gas costs to do transactions were you know, quite expensive. And so when the DeFi starters started to kind of like, you know, settle down and, you know, all these yields started to dry up, then that's kind of like where we started to lose traction as well. So we started reviewing, you know, what users were, talk, uh, were you know, giving feedback to us on. And we basically kind of like spent the entire year of 2022 to re revamp everything, right? From the product itself, from the protocol, redesign basically everything to make, you know, a much better experience. And I think, you know, I think that's basically what most projects will go through because you know inherently you have a huge selection of DeFi protocols um, in the space right now and the switching cost is very low for users right so it's very mercenary and so what can you do to compete with the rest of the market and you know we basically kind of like got our heads down and just you know because we ourselves are DeFi users again uh, what would what would it take for us to you know use this and you know, like uh, have that capital sticky or stick into that protocol itself. So yeah, like it's been a long journey, and I think that you know, um, listening to users is definitely critical. And um, yeah, like that's how we got to here right now. Yeah, that's an amazing story. And um, I, for the audience, I think it would be very interesting to hear how you might have lost your mic. <laughs> the question is how how did you how did you get that signal from users? How are you? Got it. We're back. <laughs> how, how are you? How are you interfacing with users and collecting feedback from them? Yeah. So I think that you know, well, for most protocols right now, you basically have your Telegram and Discord communities out there, and I think that's the most direct way for you to interface with your users. And aside from that, there's you know CT Crypto Twitter out there. You always see this, you know, people talking about your app, and that's also a good signal if there, there's more and more people just talking about your app, and you can also kind of like hear feedback from there. And you know, like you kind of like there's there's always noise around that, right? So they they say good stuff, if they say bad stuff, and sometimes what they say doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and it's just you know, up to the team to be able to filter, to filter out through all that. But in the end, right, having these communities is really critical because from there, you kind of like are able to filter out and identify which ones are your most loyal users. And from your loyal users, they kind of like have a good grasp and idea of like what your product uh, can be and why would they want to use it. So yeah. Thank you. I was also going to postulate. I would imagine that there's a lot of on-chain data that you could also use yeah. to understand like what user actions are being um, actually acted upon, or you know, if U UI interfaces, if there's like specific you know tags and things like that. Um, these are things that we're also thinking about with Mana too in identifying uh, what categories are uh, will eventually be most. Um, uh, utilized or most excited about uh, like which smart contracts are um, you know pinged the most and such so yeah I think on-chain data along with the overall sentiment through discord telegram Twitter and the like um, together will build a, a full picture of what users will actually want there are also um, a lot of really cool AI tools now that you can use for focus groups. So if you provide the list of emails or users that, let's say you have 10 super users, um, they will, you can create the list of questions and it'll collate all of the qualitative and quantitative data. Um, and the other thing to remember is that you're not bothering anybody. I mean, people feel so special and important and honored when the founder of a company is like, what do you think we should build next? And get on the phone with them for 20 minutes. And users love that. And like, especially in crypto, there is no you know, third wall between the corporation and the, and the customer. Yeah. And so if you can jump in like a, a spaces with them or something and, and use that as more of like a brainstorming session and live feedback, you do have to develop the muscle to sift through the things that you think are unhelpful. But um, I think that only breeds deeper loyalty and more authenticity with your customer base. 
I think uh, all of the nails have been hit on the head here, but what, uh, there's the underlying objective that all projects and all companies are going to have, but then there's also when determining if a project is investable, you know, there's KPIs, OKRs, all of these things, the various goals. When you're looking to determine if a project is investable, those things need to be in order. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, there's the end measures of, are you returning value to your end users? Are you bringing them ROI in a capacity? Or are you bringing ROI to your stakeholders? And that's the end measure of success. Is your user base growing? And is that re resulting in a return on investment for those that are partaking in your project? Um, and at the end of the day, if you are providing a product that's bringing value to your end users, they will continue to use it. And that's going to ultimately translate to the end goal of ROI, which is, at the end of the day, why many people build. Amazing. Thank you. Any, any good stories of companies you've worked with where they brought a product to market, they got some signal, and it meaningfully changed the shape of the company they were building? I'm smiling because I'm trying to decide if I'd get in trouble if I told those stories. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, no, no need. Shielding, right, right. Okay. I, 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 I could name a number of these that do this, and you know, I mentioned three commas. It's, it's one good example in which what they developed to begin with changed so much by the end product and where they are now, and they've raised tens of millions of dollars ultimately for something that again was customer driven, right? They sought the feedback and it is, it, it, it's a form of flattery when a CEO is willing to take 20, 30 minutes and speak to somebody, right? That in itself, when somebody gives that connection in itself, it's such a form of flattery and at the same time, it really shows that your passion lies with your product. Um, and I think that, that once you have a founder or know that there's a founder that overcomes that ego perspective of not always they're right, um, that they're willing to take another perspective and change things based on the reception of what they're developing. Actually, I have a Web2 example, which is just that I worked at Waze for a very long time. I was on the early team there. And um, if you live in Los Angeles and you've ever tried to make a left across five lanes of traffic, um, you've probably said a prayer and hope that you didn't die. And so we've gotten a lot of feedback around that. And so um, that has to do with algorithms and routing and, and data coming in from customers. And so with a lot of user feedback there and testing, um, we did have a lot of um, encouragement from the community to change the way that we routed traffic and new features that we had for you to decide how risky you wanted your trip to be or what types of routing you wanted to have. And so, I mean, that was a major step and that was something that took quite a bit of additional planning and road mapping from us. And so, um, to your point, again, abandoning ego and saying, we've heard you and this is what you've asked for um, is something that took years for us to develop, but was really important to show that we were listening. So. Well, that's how you make your lifers, is what I call them, right? Yeah. You make people feel heard, and yeah. they're going to feel valued. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm, you have choices as to which app you use. For example, I'll give it a, a quick story about my rideshare app experiences. Uber just started, lived in San Francisco. I booked a ride. The guy did not take the path he was supposed to, and it added 10 minutes onto our trip. But he was a nice guy. I gave him five stars. And in the comments, I said, you know, he was a really nice guy. I do wish at the end of the day he followed the directions. It caused us to be a little late for our meeting. But that said, uh, <laughs> nice guy. Didn't mind. I'll keep using your app. Within hours, one of the project managers at Uber emailed me saying, hey, I read your comment. He should have definitely taken, taken that right route. I know I can't get your meeting back to you, but I'm gonna give you $100 and I really hope that you continue to use our product. And I thought at that point, I was like, okay, when it's one star or something of that, of course they're going to have flags or things of that, but for them to go as far to read every five star review that left a comment and then take the initiative to reach out, now I choose Uber over Lyft every time, you know, and so, and except if it's surge pricing, let's be real, who's going to pay that? So <laughs> this, this week in particular, it's, it's pretty tricky to get an Uber in, in Denver. I have used Lyft a couple times, disclosure. <laughs> so, you know, in a perfect world, you hear every signal, you act on it, you build the product based on what the market is telling you. But as things are getting noisier as the market's heating up, you get conflicting priorities, you can't do it all. And so I'd love the perspective from the, the founders in particular on how do you think about which signals to listen to, what the right customers to build for, users to build for are, and, and whether you, you know, turn away a customer who might need something but doesn't quite fit with your, your company shape. I think first and foremost, it's really important to just listen. 
Um, and maybe there's no action that comes from listening, but there's so much learnings to be had regardless. Um, but I'd say two things. One would be conviction, and the other would be um, like real uh, empirical data. Um, so on the conviction side of things, like yes, it could be so easy to be distracted by the new hot narrative. Um, but I have strong trust in like founders and projects who have been able to stay the path um, and kept with their initial convictions in whatever it is that they were coming to market with. Like for Monad, from the very beginning, two years, almost two years ago at this point, we were always working towards optimizing the EVM and building an L1. And that has not changed regardless of um, the, the, the talks of the moment, um, you know, the, the narratives of the moment. Um, and so that's one thing. And then, yeah, empirical data would be the other, where um, there is a lot of noise. And we, we hear a lot of opinions on, on Twitter. We hear a lot of opinions on Telegram, Discord, other socials. Uh, but when, when it comes down to it, like listening to your actual users, listening to the developers who will actually be deploying on your platform, um, that's what's most important. And, and for, for Monad specifically, like what does that look like when you think about this is the user we should be building for. What are some qualities that stand out? Yeah, I think two primary users for Monad, and this, these are not the only ones, would be uh, application developers as well as like the um, end user using said applications to uh, transact on Monad. So it's a little bit of both. Where right now it's a chicken and egg prog problem because like developers want to be deploying and developing for a. Um, blockchain that has users, that has traction, right? And on the other side of things, like users want to um, play around with applications, sorry, play around on um, a network that has a number of applications, a number of use cases. Um, and so, you know, checking an egg there. Um, I think first and foremost, right now we are uh, focused on, well, sorry, let me roll back a little bit. We've been really focused on building out a very strong community and um, I think we've seen a lot of excitement amongst our community members who are um, you know, generating artwork or just in uh, talking about some of our tech um, to regions um, outside of, we're based in New York, you know, it's easy to just be stuck in like the yeah. New York and Silicon Valley cloud, but you know, uh, Web3 and crypto is a, a global community. Um, and so they're, they're doing um, you know, some ev evangelism to the rest of the world via community. Um, and then on the developer side, like right now, a lot of our conversations are um, with some grassroots developers who are just now um, getting their feet wet in Web3 or have launched um, a product or a project on one chain and are thinking about going multi-chain and thinking about you know, the pros and cons of like why this network versus that. Um, so yeah, listening and um, understanding what their pain points are, understanding what they feel is important, and how that draws back to what Monad can provide from either we, whether it's a performance perspective, a gas cost perspective, um, that's what we're taking into account. That's so interesting, the way you have to approach it, working with both the developers and the users and figuring out what both stakeholders <laughs> care about and, and balancing all that. Uh, I'd love to hear the perspective from you know, more strictly end user facing product? Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, given how fast this space moves at any point of given time, you'll always have both sides of noise and signal, right? So, you know, case in fact, the whole points meta, like everyone wants to trade points, everyone's kind of like trying to do something with points, et cetera, right? And in a way, this is kind of like noise, but if you look into it, right, like, like, for example, for Eigenlayer and points and for the different, like, restaking protocols out there, points is not what they're about, right? They're all about this, you know, validated services. They're all about uh, renting security, et cetera. So that's kind of like the long-term vision of, like, what Eigenlayer is trying to introduce in the, into this space. And so in Pendle's perspective, we kind of, like, have to play both sides because, again, given the market and how this is kind of like what everyone's talking about, if you want to remain relevant, then you kind of like have to play both sides, right? So at this point of time, because everyone's kind of like into points, then we definitely have to introduce or support markets that allows people to be able to trade those points. But in the long run, when, you know, that thing kind of like settles down and when you have this AVSS live, et cetera, producing yields, then that's when we can, you know, in the long term or in the long tail, support all these different AVSs and create um, yield trading markets out of that. So, and this is 
is true for anything, right? So with Athena kind of like bootstrapping, they have their own shards program. And with the others, that's kind of like having their own kind of like unique way of getting to market. I think that initially there will always be this, you know, hype, um, you know, season or curve. And after a while, when, once it settles down, then you, you'll kind of like see um, what's the long-term kind of like value that they'll be returning back into the space. And I think that that's when it becomes more sustainable, and that's kind of like where you have to put majority of your resources in. But of course, if you still want to really uh, remain relevant and you know be part of that initial mind share, then you kind of like have to play that initial like hype cycle side of you know that that noise side, I guess, if you put it that way. Yeah. This one's so near and dear to our hearts at Privy. There are you know, every every week, a different trend that the market is asking us very directly. What's your what's your play here? So I'd love to use that case study of points. Like, was the market saying, Kendall, we want you know some sort of points points addition to the product? So how how did that play out? Yeah, I mean, uh, especially now, we're, we've been getting a lot of inbound from different projects saying, hey, uh, we want to get listed on Pendle, create a market of you know, our eventual point system, and you know, allow people to be able to trade it. And so it's just a matter of being able to prioritize which one makes sense in the current market right now. So again, right, we have to be quite selective given the amount of dev resources that we have. And there's just been this huge explosion of different LRT and LSD protocols and other protocols out there that's introducing this kind of like concept. So it's a race. And you know, like uh, uh, echoing what Jared said earlier, those who kind of like get in first uh, win. You know, kind of like win the most. But um, you know, it, it really depends on the market. But overall, I think that you know, as a protocol that kind of like supports these different types of assets, um, yeah, we, we kind of like have to be selective right there, and uh, we, we just kind of like listen uh, to what our users are saying and see seeing which ones uh, we'd like to support. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and so on taking that a little further, and, and I think the investor perspective will be really interesting here as well. How do you, how do you engage with these signals in the market? So the market is, is asking some feature of you. How, how do you communicate with the market on you know, where that stacks with your priorities and, and how it gets built? So, yeah. So we definitely have kind of like our own vision of what our you know, future roadmap would be. And we are definitely getting a lot of um, you know, feature requests from users saying like, you know, it would be cool if this would be in Pendle, et cetera. And I think it's a balance between both where we, we do have our own interest in seeing what the ultimate vision of what Pendle will be in the future. So I think it's just the balance of both, right, where you know, sometimes users have this really cool idea and we've never thought about it. And yeah, you know, we definitely consider that because that, that's definitely really cool. <laughs> and in the end, right, sometimes like we, we, we have this idea that we are firm believers in and we think that it's really good. And maybe some users might disagree with it, but you know, once we get it out to market, then that's kind of like when users will start to appreciate what we've done. And sometimes users don't exactly know what they want, right? And sometimes you just have to believe in what you're trying to do. And only when you get it out where you know, you'll be validated for whatever idea, idea that you've done. And if you've done something wrong, then of course that's that's good feedback and you can iterate from that. So I think that you know every moment is always a learning opportunity for a protocol. And I think that you just have to be very open-minded with all this different feedback and be able to be flexible enough to kind of like uh, work your way um, you know through this market in general. Yeah. Thank you. I, I loved what um, you said earlier about uh, having conviction because I think that we we see some companies sometimes that have so many options and so many ways they could go and they also want to please so many people thinking that the customer is everyone and the customer is not everyone it is not possible to ship every product to everyone all the time and so um, I think it can feel overwhelming sometimes to get too much signal and feel like you're gonna ship all of them concurrently like that that is just not possible and so having a very strong leader a strong leadership team and a view on the product roadmap and I'd be curious what you would say the percentage is, but you know, leaving room in there for some magic where when you do get the signal and you're like, we totally missed this and, and we should have built this in and we didn't and let's make sure that we can iterate and leave room in the product roadmap to add that. But knowing that the vision is a three or five year vision and we've committed to this and, and, and we're going in this direction, I think is really important for your employees so that they don't feel yanked around and not understanding what direction the company's going and that you continue to make you know, meaningful traction too. I, I definitely think that, again, that was 
perfectly eloquent, but I believe truly it comes down to the leader. And we've been talking about how leaders listen to their end users or how we evaluate the data to make our decisions. But I think it also comes down to the compassion uh, that a leader has not only for their end users, but for their devs. Um, it's not only a matter of, you know, many, many leaders don't have the technical know-how. I'll admit yeah. I'm not a coder by any means. I, I understand it to an extent, but you have to have compassion for how much work your devs are doing and what it means to bring another product idea onto them when they already are struggling to reach whatever deadlines they have. So the compassion and um, really understanding and having a good relationship with your developers, I think is key in terms of determining what are you going to do to pivot and how can you do this in a way that isn't going to destroy the morale of your entire dev team because you just broke their backs. So. And so on, on that, what is the investor's role in the journey? I would say to plant breadcrumbs bread for the leader to follow and hope that they listen to it. But at the end, you, can't, you can bring them to water, can't force them to drink, right? Um, but if you're to that point, as an investor, I would imagine that you've kind of queried or given a few tests to determine, like, how well do they listen to feedback? And, you know, I always give the example of a, a terrible interview that I had with who ended up being eventually my CMO, where I asked him a question in the interview. He had the most awful answer to it. And for the sake of time, I won't share all of it. But at the end of it, I was like, this is how you're response made me feel. And he was taken back and he said, ultimately, he was like, oh, I didn't see it that way. This is the way I meant it, but thank you for telling me that. So it, it's all about really how you can transfer that energy between each other. And if there is a resistance, then ideally you aren't going to get to the point to invest in that person, but hopefully they're going to listen to you as you try to bring them to success and know that you're all trying to succeed together. I think our job is to help them see the horizon. So um, as you mentioned, there's, there's all of these signals and wins and trends and points now and things people are asking for. Um, but you know, when there's other companies in the portfolio that are not competitive but can be partners or can be customers, that is super helpful because they can compare notes and, and compare together where they think things might go. And so um, we put out our AI and blockchain thesis in 2022. We were very early. And as these companies have come up together, like Giza and Jensen and you know, even Bagel Network and some of these early businesses, they are able to talk together and say, like, this is where I think A and blockchain might be. And what if we test this theory together? What if you become our customer? This might work, it might not. But it's like a safe space, right, where we can kind of bring them back to what the initial vision was without yeah. completely, completely changing the identity of the company. Yeah. Well, this, this is a topic I am passionate about. We could go all day on customer signals and how you shape the product around it and the company. Maybe one final question as we're, we're running up on time is for the audience, you know, if, if, if I'm a founder and I want to build my product around tangible market needs or I want to evolve my product based on what I'm hearing in the market, what's one piece of advice you have for how to be more, more customer or market driven in your product development? I don't know if I could do it all in one. I, I, I might have like five, but I'll try to do them really quickly. Two. Two, okay. So uh, obviously conviction is one. Another is like ruthless prioritization um, while maintaining like that end goal. Um, and so I think there's like, everyone has, uh, everyone knows the quadrant of like important, not important, and like uh, difficult, not difficult, I think is or I can't, something along those lines. Um, but there's also one where it's like, the quadrants could be like impact, high impact, low impact, as well as difficulty in bringing it to market. And as much as possible, you definitely want to prioritize that, you know, top right quadrant, I guess, um, of like <laughs> high impact and low difficulty. Um, and sometimes that can be a hard message to, to tell an, an, an end user or someone who really wants that feature. Um, and so, you know, to Jared's point, like, I think strong communication, and this is also coming from uh, my background as a technical product manager for many years prior to coming into crypto, you need to make sure that all stakeholders are aware of the decision criteria. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'd say like resource prioritization, strong communication, um, build slow, and iterate fast. Amazing. I love the, the decision criteria point in particular. 
Yeah, so you just pretty much uh, you know, covered it all. So, but yeah, aside from conviction, I would say that if you're building in a certain vertical, let's say in DeFi, like for Pendle, then you definitely be, need to be a avid DeFi user as well. So make sure you're in the weeds out there, using different protocols that are out there. Because I think only by using you know, whatever we're building on, like whatever vertical, then that's only when you'll actually know and understand what the culture is about around that. So yeah, I think that you know, you definitely, if you're definitely building in DeFi, then you have to be using DeFi, like breathing DeFi, yep. and yeah, whatever vertical that you're, you're building on as well. Yep. Thank you. I think it's everybody's job to talk to the customer. So um, the marketing team should be super close to, to understanding why the product is built the way that it is, and they should be talking to customers. Your dev team should not be locked away just like getting directions to code, they should be talking to customers too. So that's everybody's job. Yes. So hard being at the end of the stage here. It's like, okay, what <laughs> did somebody not say? Um, I'm just gonna circle back to it, uh, message to the founders, put ego aside, listen to anybody who gives you a moan of a time, make meaningful connections and be reactive and stay stable and put emotions to the side and know that any feedback, even though it's not your idea, it could ultimately end up being the idea that gets you to where you need to be. So always be receptive and always be nimble. Amazing. Give it up for the panelists. Thank you very much and excited to see you all soon. Thank you.
everybody. Uh, I'm JMR. I'll be your host for the next hour. We have here three amazing guests uh, to discuss gaming and how to make it appeal to masses. On my right, please, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Frankie Colmarino. I'm the CEO of Party. I also own a creative agency called Problem Media. We've serviced everybody from Astro Gaming uh, to Amazon and Twitch on the agency side and, uh, yeah, building a, a cool little product. Uh, that helps focus LFG and uh, matchmaking uh, through an application. Amazing. On his right, we have Kara. Hello. Hi, um, I'm Kara. I'm an investing partner at A16Z Crypto. Um, I have a background in math, computer science, and economics from Harvard. Spent a little bit of time as a software engineer building AR, VR apps for the HoloLens team at Microsoft. And then I spent a little bit of time as a product manager at Apple um, in the App Store, where I worked mostly with game developers. Um, like Candy Crush and Roblox and that sort of thing. Um, I joined A16Z Crypto around three years ago now, focusing mostly on the intersection between crypto and games investing, but I also touch other kinds of media and IP, as well as the infrastructure that supports those investments. Amazing. Thank you for being here. And on her ride, Eric, what's up, buddy? Hey, what's going on, man? Uh, Eric Anderson um, with FaZe Clan, uh, an esports organization. It's pretty big. If you're familiar with Counter-Strike or Call of Duty, you might know us. Um, I head up, amongst other things, mainly the competitive gaming division of the company. So that's all of our esports titles. Um, I've been around FaZe for going on eight years now. Uh, pretty much built up all our verticals in gaming um, outside of Call of Duty. And then um, came from the music industry before that where we'll probably sprinkle some of that throughout this conversation. OK, nice. And about me, very briefly, I used to make films in Hollywood. Uh, then I did gaming. And I was the CEO of OG Esports, one of the biggest esports teams in the world. And it's how I know him. And we put this panel together because we want to have a colorful conversation with four people with four different backgrounds that works in different sides of the industry. So we can you know, shed light into how we see the world and see which kind of agreements or conclusions we can come up through this hour of talk. And I'm going to start the questions with you guys with saying, OK, let's identify what is going on right now on gaming. OK? What is the, the current state of gaming? So the first question that I have is, what, is, what makes a good game, Frankie? A normal game, not Web3 game, just game. Well, for me, obviously, like I, my obsession is games like World of Warcraft, you know, uh, large format games. Obviously, beautiful ecosystems, beautiful economies. And you know, my, I think my version of, of what makes a good game is, is a little dated. Um, but today, you know, like I feel uh, obviously, you know, if I can keep your attention or if I can help move a story along or build a, br a brilliant IP, like that comes in the form of a publisher. And typically, that comes at the form of, of scale. So I, I think like holding attention is a good part of it. Good marketing, good community collaboration. Um, really is how I see it today. OK. But for you, Kara, do we consider a good game when people love the game, when a lot of people play the game, where it makes a lot of money, when it's very successful? Um, I think it has to mean something. Okay. Uh, typically, if the game has cultural significance, people will love it. People will feel invested in it. People will maybe you know, spend a lot of money in that game. I think it all comes from like the context having cultural significance. And I think in order for that to happen, I think these are our principles for all kinds of entertainment, actually. There have to be stakes. There has to be some amount of chaos. And then people have to feel an affinity for it. Okay. Um, and I didn't make this framework up. This is something that a lot of the founders that I work with say over and over again. It's like, there's not enough chaos in this game. I need to create more chaos. People naturally tend toward order. We need to create more entropy. Um, and then stakes, you know, it's like, if I care enough about this environment, um, it matters if I win or lose. It matters to my friends, to the people I care about in this game. It matters to my reputation. Um, so yeah, I think it all, it all stems from like, did you create an IP that was important enough for people to care? OK. Eric, for you, what makes it a good game? You know, I was, I was uh, watching the Nouns guys over on the other stage, and they were, uh, Pat mentioned something about just a game needs to be fun. And I think it's a very simple way of kind of addressing it, but it's, it's true. But what's fun for everybody is very, very different. Playing World of Warcraft for however many hours a day you played back is Three not, years. It's not fun for my me. Life. Three years. Let's go. Let's right? go. Playing a FromSoft game is not fun for me, right? But at the same time, like, 
I like playing like spreadsheet games, right? So civilization, spending hours in that, or Europe Universalis, like that's fun for me. It's probably awful for some other person. So I think something that's fun is, is the simplified way of doing it. And then obviously in my business, like a platform for competitive play for like iconic moments, like that's, you know, a lot of people probably not having fun, but it's really fun winning, right? And so again, a wide range of what fun can be, but as long as you have that experience, you have, or you can say at the end of it, we had fun doing that. Okay. So, so I'm going to add a little bit. For me, fun, or sorry, what makes a good game is a level of escapism from my current life. For me, the way or how I started playing games, I had a rough childhood and I needed a place to escape from my life. So these communities and these games were a place where I will find refuge and where I will find my friends and where I will find that. So for me, if you're allowing me escapism and I fully involve myself and immerse in your, in your new world, that works for me. I'm going to piggyback on that Let's for a go. second. So if, if you're unfamiliar with FaZe Clan, um, FaZe was started like that. Mm -hmm. It was a, <clears throat> excuse me, it was a Call of Duty collective that basically was focused, uh, they were like the skateboarders of gaming, right? They put together all of these clips of them, sniping clips and trick shotting clips, and they found each other online. In fact, many of the members didn't meet until year six or seven in, in person, right? Um, and that's kind of when they started scaling, and a lot of them, it was escapism. It was something to just kind of get down there, play Call of Duty, play the game everybody was playing, um, meet friends online, meet friends in some other places. Um, you know, the two of the founders were from Boston, like some of the others are from Toronto and Southern California, right? And they just connected based on that. And like I said, didn't meet for years in person. So yes, escapism is a huge thing. Okay. For sure. Yeah. And community. You mentioned that. And community. Yeah. No, no, please. Please. And on that point, yeah, community for us too, right? Like I met some of my best friends through gaming, right? Whether it be on World of Warcraft. And you know, like the ethos of party really is connectivity, bringing people together in a safe environment. And you know, for us, like a lot of that stems even from a competitive level having a hard time finding people that are worth bringing into to those groups to keep it healthy, right? A guild in World of Warcraft is a business at the end of the day. And I think growing into that, like FaZe did, is a perfect example of kind of where I see the future of gaming heading, but we'll, we'll wait for Okay, that. well, that's a yeah. great segue. So now, Kara, where are we in Web3 Gaming? Which part of evolution? You know, are we still on the monkey side? Are we already walking? I think people are running a lot of interesting experiments. Okay. The outcomes of those experiments remain to be seen. Um, there are a lot of really interesting properties that are unique to Web3, and I think people are aware of what they are. So there's, there's some ownership, there's permissionless composability, mm. there's some level of like programmability and trustlessness. These are all primitives that people understand. And people are running lots of really interesting experiments. Some of them are going to fail. Some things are just going to not be fun. Some things are going to work. Some business models are going to work, and some aren't. And I, I think like, you know, this has been true of every previous generation of games. Um, when the mobile f phone first came out, people tried to apply the same principle of like, we're going to charge for the game itself all in one go. And it didn't work well because the whole premise of like mobile social gaming is you have a whole community of friends. The game gets better as more people play. Mm. So why would you create an adverse selection issue where people have to pay to play, right? It should be free to play. And then you should be able to get add-ons, premiums, subscriptions, skins, right? Things that make the experience better for you as an individual, but don't impede your ability to join. And so that was sort of the evolution of free-to-play games was like, the understanding was, OK, this network gets better. This game gets more fun as, people, as more people join. So don't gate that action, right? Make it as easy as possible for people to join. And I think like, people are still experimenting with business models for Web3 games. I don't know that you know, a perfect business model has been found. Um, but typically, these business models are very native to the form. Um, okay. And applying old business models to new kinds of gaming styles doesn't really work. So, I think we're in the primordial soup phase. I think people are still running right. experiments. But you, you sound optimistic. So you think that these experiments will hopefully cathartic moment where, oh, like, this actually works. And crypto gaming starts being appealing to masses. Yeah, I certainly think some things are working. Okay. There are early signs. There's a lot of really interesting play tests. Um, I don't want to hog the stage, but I'm happy to go through examples of like stuff that's even been really interesting here do at it. East Denver. <laughs> Um, well, we're going to get there later, but if sorry, you want to mention a right few now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Some people here might have played Crypto the Game, which we're not an investor in, has never raised money. It was like, they actually have a meetup. Yeah, they've got a meetup here at East Denver. Um, 
And it was just really fascinating. It was like this survivor-style game where in order to play, you have to buy into the pot. You're sorted into a tribe randomly, and people vote you off your island every day. And so it's some amount of like diplomacy style, sort of civilization style, betrayal, and you can make your own smart contracts to say, OK, like, I will escrow this money if I don't betray you. Um, but of course, betrayal is the whole point of the game. right? So there's, there was a lot of really interesting stuff happening. And like when I tell you that I don't tell my boss this, I like did not work for three days. Like, like the fact that I got eliminated was like a great thing for my job because I just like I was on that game 24/7. Okay, and this time something is working there. Okay, so for you both, what is your let's say temperature check of what's happening right now in Web3 gaming? I, I mean, I think that's a re really good point about the evolution of like how some of these games make money, right? I mean, you go back in time and you basically just had to go to a store to buy something, right? And eventually, kind of stuff went more digital, so you could. The friction was removed from having to go to a store. And then these kind of free-to-play games, and even some of these free-to-play games having this depth of like, you know, if you play Counter-Strike, a loot crate mechanic, which is, they're literally hours of, if you know who Oni is, you can watch him just opening loot crates. And it's, that's entertainment for somebody too. So it's like, and it's creating other layers of people making money on Valve making gobs of money. So I think there's probably going to be more experimental things. And actually, I haven't played that. But it's, there's so many amazing board games out there that you could just probably take into the Web3 ecosystem. Now that you're kind of saying that, I'm like, man, I actually want to play a bunch of these board games now in this ecosystem. So I think we're going to see some experiments. And I hope to see more experiments okay. and change that up. Wait, so, I, you, you, now I, I triggered something. So, so maybe I have to play devil's advocate to just move the conversation forward. Yeah. And it's going to be for you. Because I feel that right now, the more Web3 games that I experience are not gamify, are fi gaming. The whole premise started as the financial incentives, tokenization, and all that. And then they were like, OK, well, now how do we make this game fun? So they're not very fun, many of them, because the economy part is the one that they are more expertise on, because making a fun game is really, really hard. You work with the biggest titles in the world and the biggest developers. And we mentioned, you may have states, that one of the problems is that these people spend millions and hundreds of millions of dollars and they still fail games. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more how you see that? Well, I mean, there's a few versions of that, right? Like, we're, we're seeing it now with like, things like the Call of Duty League, where there is certain things that can happen and there are certain things that the players are at the mercy of, right? Like, you can gate an event, you can gate a tournament, you can say, we need a license. But ultimately, like, I think the future of what Web3 really offers up is collaboration. You know, I, I love to see a world where open source gaming becomes a version of that and creators can be built out of the, the development phase, right? You look at technologies like Blender, which is a open source 3D software, and you really see how a community that has the interest to get to the finish line can really kind of rally and get that done. We know what it costs to make a video game today, and that's why I'm so excited to be at ETH Denver and seeing what's happening behind us. I think this is the future of gaming. And you know, for me, like on the, on the brand and agency side, like how do we inject design and consideration and marketing back into this ecosystem, like community builders, uh, and add that layer on top of the development? I think the beauty of, of everything happening in Web3 on blockchain is the collaborative piece. And like any good industry, the technology needs to get figured out first, so then we can build on top of it. You can't spin a silk shirt unless you've figured out a machine that can farm silk. Okay. Right? So we're experiencing that uh, at hackathons, with ETH Denver, with projects like Nouns, right? Where, you know, we're here because we want to be here. And that's what I see the future of Web3 gaming turning into. I think what makes games fun is amazing but the work has to get done before the fun can come, right? So it is primordial soup. It is very much a hot pot, as Pat would say. Hi, okay. Pat. So you guys mentioned something very interesting, because Kara mentioned that, in a way, the IP has a huge value, because the IP is, in a way, the transformative part. The people at align themselves, and that will be the thing that penetrates society. But now you're mentioning that, OK, well, all the technology, all the ecosystem, and everything that has to work it also has to be on the back end of that. And then to you, which you have one of the biggest communities in gaming, how does the community part 
starts appealing to Web3 gaming. Because right now, I feel that Web3 gaming is appealing to Web3 people. And it's trying to captivate this audience before it goes out to try to get a mainstream. Yeah, I mean, I think you just kind of want to comment about the communities and how to engage with. Oh, can you hear me better now? Much better. So I, I think right now there hasn't been a game, at least to our community, there hasn't been a game that's penetrated into the, the phase clan or phase clan adjacent ecosystem. And I think when a game pops up that people are really into, I think you'll see um, the community kind of bite onto it quickly. I would say the last big moment that happened around our community was Fortnite dropping. And that was like a, for our guys, that was a Modern Warfare 2, which to them was like the greatest game of all time. Um, that was like a moment like that. And the question is, is a moment like that going to come? And there's other games in between, right, that have captured their attention. Rainbow Six is having a, a Siege is having a moment right now. Jinxie is like driving it forward and really raising attention to a, a really great, balanced, incredible esport title, right? Um, and got, by the way, this is from the perspective of an esport specific title, right? Um, so I think if if there's a game that's made that can tap into that community, the community will jump on it rapidly okay. immediately right like you, you can't force it onto them you can't say hey this game's amazing no the community will tell you whether they think it's amazing i mean look at hell divers 2 is having a moment right now where the whole gaming community in general is just loving it um and so it's like and i don't know if they expected that game to do that or not but uh it's definitely there so i think for our community specifically you can try to force things into it but they're going to immediately, they'll, they'll shoot up and spit it back out if they don't like it. Okay. So now a question for you, Kara. Let's just think about it. What is the main challenge that you think that Web3 Gaming has to overcome to appeal to the general masses? I still think it's an infrastructure okay. thing. Um, infrastructure advancements have always led to changes in computing paradigms. So like you couldn't have MMOs without, well, you couldn't have global MMOs without really sophisticated distributed systems architecture, right? You couldn't have this sort of super casual social gaming, free to play in app purchase game without mobile phones. And so, you know, when, when infrastructure starts to mature, it makes it possible for not only new kinds of consumer experiences, but a lot of different kind of developer experiences. And I think like what's happening right now is like blockchain scalability and compute is just starting to get to the mm. point where like even for a developer, there weren't very many layers of abstraction before. There weren't a lot of libraries of like game engines, simply because you had to program everything in a hyper-optimized, almost like bare metal assembly, you know, bit packing way. In order for like really interesting creatives, new categories of developers to like get interested in building games on blockchains, you have to have libraries that are accessible to them. You have to have engines, you have to have, you know, easy to use frameworks. And we're just starting to get to the point where really interesting open source frameworks are becoming available in the same way that Re React changed the game for JavaScript. So I, I really think it's like, like a time game. OK, that's a great answer. Frankie, for you, now this, what would these games have to do to be able to compete with the other ones? Because I understand what Kara says. These games are going to get gradually better. Yeah. But the other ones are also getting gradually better. So yeah. when I am just sitting at home and I'm choosing a form of entertainment, why or can the other ones compete with them? My answer is going to be a little bit more simple, I think. Honestly, like, I, I think foundationally we're getting there. Like, it's, it's technology before the cosmetic, right? Like, I think what we're seeing now is, is more like prom, where you have boys on one side, you have girls on the other. And like brands also need to start to trust Web3 a little bit more, right? Like I think there is a world where FaZe Clan doesn't need to wait for a Web3 game to come out. They can create one, right? And, and the kind of strategy around that for me would be, well, let's focus on the cosmetics on my side. And obviously, we'll help with development. But I got to believe in you enough to want to meet you in the middle, right? And I think that a lot of the games that are doing well in Web3 are, are doing really well. There, there are some really good games out there that would make absolute sense for Face Clan, but I think they haven't, they haven't figured out the prom kind of conundrum, right? So for me, like, it is about opening up the kind of design and brand market a little bit more, like allowing for even brands like a Nike to want to own a game and a category with a team like FaZe. You know, I, I, I'm a firm believer in even like AI essentially progressing past Web3 and, and, and all that in the sense of like figuring out the mechanisms where 
FaZe Clan can spin up an AI game and just cast it. Let's watch a bunch of marbles race down a, a pipe. And, you know, we're, we're moving toward a casting culture, right? That is what the creator economy is looking to do. I can tell you from talking to Ninja personally, Ninja does not want to play video games for 14 hours a day, right? So the casting and kind of content and React content and podcast content that's coming, like, is, is allowing for a very good grace period for gaming to say, if we don't get our together, like, gaming might just phase itself out and we just might move past gaming to content. Maybe it's more interesting to watch Marvel's race and talk about it than it is to actually build these, these systems. I personally am on the side of incubating gaming. I think gaming has done a lot for me, okay. socially. And as we move into a world where we're leaving the house more, gaming really does offer that social tool. There are people who shouldn't be in a room together behind us who met because of the internet. And that's the direction we're heading in. That's a great so. segue. Because for you, Eric, the question is, at the end of the day, for me, as I mentioned at the beginning, is escapism and community. I need to meet people that I enjoy playing the game, and that's why I end up playing the game. So the reason why I might play in a specific game is because my friends played that game. So we all kind of move together to new games. So how would game, Web3 Gaming approach the community building aspect? that you guys so successfully have done? So, I mean, I'll speak it specifically to esports. Um, and I'd say, like, I think one of the most amazing things is if you can build a platform for people to have fun together. Um, again, where Helldivers is do, 2 is doing right now, I think is super, uh, super important. But I think from a competitive standpoint, if you're going to pick a lane, I guess, or like, let's say you want to try to tackle esports via a fighting game or via a first person shooter, just understand too that like, it's not easy to make a balanced competitive game. Like uh, using, I'll use tennis as a perfect example as a sport. I think it's a beautifully balanced game. You play on one side, then you flip side and you play the exact same way. Um, you know, uh, football, uh, soccer. Uh, basketball, simple, simple, simple. Counter-Strike, honestly, really simple game with a lot of depth of, you know, what's that famous expression? Uh, easy to learn, hard to master. Actually, yeah. kind of a hard game to learn, hard to master. But, you know, if you're going to be jumping into those kind of things, really understanding balance and tweaking that. Um, and it's, and it's kind of complicated. So I don't necessarily know if I jump into eSports first. We're, but we're it is a way to... eSports is right after this. That's so. cool. So, but it is a way to get an immediate uh, organic growth of a community, right? Um, and I think that's something that we... That speaks to our core community. They want to get out their competitive nature, right? And that's that core audience. And then there's somebody else, and it wasn't really me, but like loved playing The Sims. I mean, that game, that IP made so much money. And so making something like that to benefit those people, to share them with the rest of the community, whatever they made, um, I think you can kind of go after that as well. Right. So picking a lane. So we used to, we're going to have a segment about esports, but I'm okay. actually going to bring it right now because we're talking about it. A lot of the times when people start thinking about gaming and they think, oh, we need to make it sticky, we need to get the, the community to like it, they always think about esports. And I think it's actually one of the biggest challenges, or I'm not going to call it mistakes, but it's an unique direction because it's extremely hard to make a game become an esports. There is fantastic titles and very few of them become successful esports. Well, it's one of the issues we talked about before. You basically need to make a free to play game because you want as many people in there as possible. So your costs are going to skyrocket just to keep it. And if you don't bring the community in and scale it and figure out a way to monetize it, you're going to have a bad time. So I think it is, I think, I don't recommend going after esports first. And I also don't know the limitations of the technology okay. specifically. But why would people want esports? Because esports obviously drive stickiness, it drives community, it drives retention. The more people that play the game, you actually want to know who the best guy is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why you kind of have to create the gladiator arena of like, yo, go there and, and fight it out. Totally. I, I, so I think esports, for anybody that's unfamiliar, it's that layer right on top of multiplayer, right? That really is kind of like a, uh, you know, a battle arena showcase for the best of the best of the best, right? And I think that there's something that we love as humanity to see the best of somebody do something. Everything from NBA championships or the, you know, Olympics to 
I guess the best spreadsheet developers in the world, right? Because the Excel championship gets bigger and bigger every year. So is I, that a, is that a real thing? It is a real thing. Okay. Face yeah. spreadsheets coming. Spreadsheet. What's that? Face you heard it spreadsheets here. coming. Yeah, face three spreadsheets. Three exactly. Three three I have a lot to say about one. spreadsheets, but continue. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we can we can we can separate into that. Tune in next segment. week for the spreadsheet um, gaming episode. Yeah, and like even like you know the the rock climbing documentary, which I cannot watch because my I'm like getting clammy thinking about that documentary. But like it's the best to the best okay. doing it. I think that's the key. Yeah. I think esports drives emotions yes. in a different way. So I grew up, so we both run esports teams. And for me, the esports events and the esports community is more like a town hall of people that weren't there with one shared love, one point of passion. And we're now all creating a community with people that we cannot play the game at that level, but we enjoy watching it so I don't watch football at home. I don't watch HBA, uh, yeah. NBA at home. I'm watching 16-year-old play video games around the world. Yeah. So it it's, has it's a, amazing. Very, a very unique component. And if, you, if you've never seen it uh, in person, it's, it's something else. Um, but also, if you just get a chance, go online and watch some of the great moments. I think the international has some of those moments where you just see these roars of the crowd. It's, it's like watching, they won twice, um, it's like watching uh, traditional sports when you get those moments, right? Like, uh, honestly, I think football in Europe or Latin America have like a really powerful audience. I think actually we're some of the worst fans in North America, relatively speaking. It's just like another level. Um, go watch Katowice for Counter-Strike, you know. Um, it's, it's amazing. So I, I think it's that live entertainment aspect. And if you can build a platform that then brings people and piles them on, I will also tell you too that you will have the most uh, game testers ever giving you immediate feedback, most of which you probably won't like um, on Twitter X, you know, so just keep that in mind as well. Okay, so we're going to macro again. So we're, we, we're going to just build these little, little bricks during these conversations. So we talk about the technology having to catch up in order to be able to make those amazing games. The esports parts that we were talking about, they are going to make some of the most memorable connections to the game. It's going to happen on those moments of cathartic, just like the game seven of the NBA, for me, is one of those moments in video games. We've talked about brands and how brands need to start interacting with these. We talk about studios and about developers. OK, this is really good and it's very important. But now the question for you, Cara, is when we start thinking about what games should we support, what games should we finance, what games should we just think that they have the best chance to succeed. How do we go about it? Yeah, so um, as a venture investor, and this is not you know, transferable to every kind of investing, okay. we think about new markets getting created. So for us, the best opportunities are markets not where you're stealing market share from other existing markets, but totally new markets, right? Mm. Like bringing in a whole new fold of gamers. So when mobile gaming came out, hardcore console gamers were like, those aren't real gamers. They're playing Candy Crush. But now mobile gaming is like the second biggest category, right? So it's, it's one of these things where as a venture investor, and maybe this isn't true for all investors, I just look at like, is there something really novel about this game mechanic or this way of organizing people or this way of bringing people into the fold that will create an entirely new market? And with crypto, my hope is that you, know, you get a lot more modding and a lot more composability. There's a lot more builders able to get invested in like building whole worlds, whole businesses in these games that are really rich, that they couldn't build because they were worried in other game platforms of platform risk. There's a reason now why you know, people don't build businesses on top of closed uh, social networks anymore. People tried to do this in the early days of like building businesses on Twitter APIs and on the Facebook APIs. And then one by one, they got cannibalized by the platform themselves. And now developers know better than to build their lives on quicksand. Um, and so once you have these sort of like free market components, these ownership components, and like some sort of credible guarantee of like neutrality of the platform, my hope is that you start to see like new kinds of participation, new kinds of players, right? Players that are building some spreadsheet min-maxers. Like, I think whole new categories of gamers will hopefully emerge in the same way that we got just like new casual gamers in the mobile era. So I think like one, as an investor, are they doing something super native? Are they doing something that feels new, um, that isn't just 
what we call skeuomorphic, porting an old principle or an old game loop on top of a new technology. So I think that's number one. The other one is for, especially because games are a hit-driven business, um, I think this is probably similar to how uh, publishers evaluate you know, film franchises and evaluate music deals is like, is there a proven ability to execute on behalf of the team? So like in the early stages, the only thing that remains consistent across the investment that you're making is, is the people who are leading that team, right? Companies will pivot, the, you know, the, the core thesis of the game will change, you're gonna go through lots of different play tests and vertical slices, and really what you're betting on is like the operator's ability to execute, and the number one way to de-risk that is to choose people who have successfully run games in the past. Um, so that's sort of how I think about the earliest stages of investing, and then sort of as you get to later stages, um, like sort of Series B, Series C, and beyond, you start to look for traction, some sort of okay. sign that something is working. Because if you only go for teams, and if you only go for things that are on thesis, you might miss something that like nobody expected. Like Stardew Valley was made by like one guy for like six years. He made the entire soundtrack by himself. Like that kind of you know sort of moonshot, one in a million thing, like you don't want to miss as an investor, but if you use just like the principles of like, you know, de-risked team execution, you're not going to find that person. And so in the later stages, we try to think about correcting our mistakes by looking at stuff that's actually working. And the number one way to do that is to look at traction. Okay, that's a fantastic answer. I think that when we start thinking about how we were going to frame this panel, the idea was to be able to convey as many usable, actionable information for anybody that is listening. And this is really great. Frankie, for you, you come more from, you build this company called Party. Yes. Right. Party, I, I, I think you probably sp explain it better than me, but it's a community that you're building that creates a matchmaking engine and a social component to gaming outside of the confinement of the titles and the game itself that connects across all of them. Yeah, we just want to broker the interaction. If you're not good at Valorant, say, hey, I'm not that good, I'm looking to learn, right? Like, like any good product, I think you really have to start community first, solve a problem, right? And I think that the way I look at even my time spent building Party, like I, I, I service Party like a client, which I think was the smartest thing for me to do. And I think other companies that do that really well are companies like Epic Games and Fortnite. Fortnite is not hiring people to figure out their strategy. They built one of the greatest engines in the world to do that for them. They can go from save the world and then a weekend later say, we need a battle royale and spin that up and have it become one of the most successful like, moves that you can make. I, I, I personally believe a lot of this comes down to how nice everyone's willing to play, right? This is, this is a global problem outside of gaming. Like, if I want to see, see you succeed, I will help you to succeed in areas, but you got to meet me here, right? Like, I think a lot of good games that have died in Web3 have died because nobody met them in the middle. And I, I feel the same way about a lot of good games out there now. No Man's Sky was one of those examples. If you're familiar with No Man's Sky, horrible launch, great kind of nosedive pull out of the, the trees for them, right? Um, but like the community, and when we talk about having human feedback, like gaming is still under a lot of hostility when it comes to indie devs. They want it today, they want it perfect. That is an entitlement that has been kind of commercialized in gaming. Right? That has, give it to me now. Nobody knows how hard it is to build a game. Nobody knows how hard it is to build a product. Me having the background of servicing clients, and I think Epic is way grander scale, but they were a service before they were Fortnite. People don't realize that as an engine. So like, how do we support the engines of Web3? How do we bring in brand? How do we bring in marketing? Where does Nike say, you know, I'm team New Balance, New Balance Gaming coming soon, by the way. You heard it here first. Um, so yeah, but like a lot of that comes down to how nice everybody's willing to play. And the prom analogy comes back here, right? Where Nike doesn't know how to vet a game that's coming up, right? And, and I think we do that well even with the Amazon partnership that Party has. If, if you know Party is the only technology on Prime Gaming and everything else is publisher. It's game, it's in-game in currency, it's cosmetics. So for us, like we focused on, on the, the hardest part, which was the matchmaking experience. I play Valorant once, I never want to play that game again because of the interactions I have. That's why 40,000 people are watching 40,000 know, people play it instead of playing it themselves. 
And that's kind of where I want to, you know, run parallel to a platform like Twitch. How do we say, you want to play with Ninja or you want to play with Banks? We're going to broker the deal, right? Okay. Matchmaking is, is the important piece for us. So I think that one of, again, when we started conceptualizing how will this panel go, what I thought it was very interesting about you, Frankie, and about your company, is that most people think Web3 Gaming, let's build a game. Well, I think there is an immense opportunity of build adjacent businesses to the main game that allows blockchain technology to be integrated in a very seamless and great way. Can I respond to that? Yes, of course, it's for you. So the one thing I've learned about blockchain, having worked with like clients like OpenSea specifically, like at your best, even with the backing of the greatest partners on planet Earth, some people just shouldn't run a business. It's just that easy. And I'm seeing that here, you know, and, and again, like that's where I want to offer my time, my energy, my service. I know what I'm good at, and a lot of people are scared of that. And I, I embrace it. I love chaos. I'm somebody who literally needs to be in the gauntlet on fire every day. And you know what I'm talking about. So, you know, for us, like that stress, like really isn't for everybody. And I think a lot of people just like to build, right? So how do we, how do we lift that up as people who can become operators, maybe in a sense, or just don't want to be. I've seen a lot of games abandoned, both in Web 2, and this is my problem with like the Web 3 term when we talk about Web 3 gaming. I think that word has scared a lot of people over the years, especially with a I lot so. of the... We have to rebrand Web 3 gaming and yeah, crypto altogether. but, it, but altogether. not really, right? Technology is always scary when it comes out. You know, designers thought Photoshop was going to kill them, DJs thought CDJs was going to kill them, and all it did was make it better, right? So, and you know that as a filmmaker, right? So that's kind of where I think things are moving. Gaming's got to get collaborative again. Okay. So then I have a great segue. So Kara and I had a conversation off stage before, and it was like you open a whole window to a whole different dimension of gaming that I didn't understand, which is user-generated content. And you believe that this is one of the most exciting parts of what Web3 could allow? Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah. So sort of the way I, I sort of started talking about this um, when I was talking about you know, the guarantees that a platform offers you and the credible neutrality um, of that platform. I think like I'm going to draw kind of a stretch of analogy and just like bear Let's with me here. Um, like the best, most innovative, the most stable economies in the world are based off of free market economies. And it seems like you know, you can build a sort of closed market economy or like a state owned or like state managed economy in the short term. But ultimately, the most interesting things, the most interesting businesses, the most interesting art um, all come out of economies that are open. And I think like, you know, in, in games like RuneScape and in World of Warcraft and in just like MMOs broadly, you start to see inklings of like, interesting user-generated content. You start to see people making their own servers. You start to see people using sort of RuneScape gold coins as like, you know, replacements for national currencies during hyperinflationary okay. regimes like the Bolivar in Argentina in like 2008. Um, but ultimately, you know, that, that is constrained by the platform risk. Like RuneScape can take away your gold at any moment in time. Minecraft can shut down your server. There's no incentive for you to start that server because there's no value being ex exchanged. You're just doing it for the, for the clout. You're just doing it because you love it. But imagine if there were incentives attached to it. Imagine if you knew that you owned your server. Imagine if you could, you know, if you could know that building a business on top of RuneScape gold was something that nobody could rug you on. And so I think that in order for us to like achieve the most fascinating, the richest, the most interesting virtual world, like in order for like a metaverse that is like exciting and that, you know, people can feel is new and not dystopian to emerge, I think it has to be built on crypto rails. I think it has to be built okay. on like yeah. guarantees. And so that's what I mean when I say, I think this will lead to like the most fascinating explosion in user generated content on the internet. Um, just because you have like, you know, 3D space, you've got interesting fidelity, you've got stories, you have, you know, you have all the components for like a context that matters and that is already rich. Um, and then you add in sort of ownership principles and I think you can get the most interesting stuff, stuff that like we can't even imagine today. Okay. Eric, I see you ready. Well, I mean, look, my whole ecosystem 
where 80% of it is built on the back of effectively user-generated content, right? Oh, sorry, user-generated content. So like Counter-Strike is a mod, it's a Half-Life mod, right? Defense of the Ancients, Dota. Or, original, mm -hmm. yeah, Warcraft 3 mod. So like in two of the biggest games in the world, and that, that split off into League of Legends and to pretty much every other MOBA that's out there. Um, and so I think 100%, and there've been, the esports world has been kind of sitting on the backs of this relationship with publishers, but also a situation where the publishers can pull those rights back at any point, and they have, and it's created the opportunity to generate businesses, but also businesses shutting effectively overnight that the community loved, and it was a huge bummer. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to come out the gates and say, hey, look, these are open for people to build businesses, and up front, we're gonna tell you, hey, we're the game developer. We're gonna just make the game. Honestly, Valve's probably the most open with it, and I think they've done the best with regards to putting certain restrictions. I speak to that from the Counter-Strike side. I can't speak to that from the Dota side. Um, and, I, and I think that opportunity is here to just kind of like hit the ground running, and then people feel somewhat safe as they build those businesses. Yeah, and I will say, when you're not constrained by like APIs, and when you're not constrained by like what the, the publisher or the developer or the world builder gives you when it's turn complete and you can write your own smart contracts, you can create your own clients, you get like way more expressivity. You can get way more high complexity stuff. Um, and I think that just like increases the, the dimensionality of like what gaming can be or what a virtual world can be. This is amazing. We have eight minutes and 45 seconds. Not, don't look at the clock, look at me. But I think it's starting to, to, to sum up and to wrap some of the big topics. I have to say, I had a very different feeling and understanding of Web3 gaming that changed a week ago. And the way that I'm starting to think about some of the things that you guys are thinking, now I'm really buying into this. Because I was running guilds and raids for World of Warcraft. But I had no stake on the game. I had no ownership of the game. I contribute directly to the benefit of the ecosystem, me and many other people that were doing guides, videos, tutorials, and nobody of us had any stake on the game. In Dota, we were one of the biggest contributors of the success of the game as well, and we don't own anything of the game. So. Now, what you're saying is that we get to partake in many different versions, creating pools for contributors, and sort of like a layer two on a game where we get to build the layers twos, we get to monetize it, other people get to build the ecosystem. OK, there is something here. I can tell you there is something here. Because I believe that the hardcore gamers that I know are willing to play a game that is maybe 20% inferior at the beginning with the chance that now that I will help you build it, then I can take ownership of that. There's something really special here. Yeah, no, I, yeah and like that's, that's kind of how I think, when I talk about even skipping over the publisher, right? Like, this will be easy enough in the next two years, mark my words, for Phase Clan to spin up a game and to skin an economy and to take open source technology Eric doesn't know this yet, but we're already talking to Yoni about doing this with FaZe uh, and bring AI in to build those systems. So like for us, you know, allow the casters, allow the commentators, allow the, the creators to do what they're good at, but also build a game that is fitting for their community, right? Like there will be a first person shooter engine available for FaZe Clan that is premier in the next two years. It's going to happen. So like my advice for, for anybody building in the Web3 space is, don't worry about the publisher mafia, right? There is, there, that, that is gonna exist in any space. That's gonna exist in fashion, we've seen it in music, and people break off and they go to SoundCloud, and people break off and they screen print their own t-shirts. And that's kind of what Party is, is trying for with technology. We're trying to skip over the launchers that gatekeep. We're trying to skip over the platforms that gatekeep. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of money for everybody. There's a lot of time for everybody. There's a lot of creative inspiration for everybody. but. The fear of not being able and not wanting to do it yourself and that prom analogy kind of coming back full circle is find the people to collaborate with. If party can help break a game, please reach out to me directly. Same thing with FaZe. I think we, I don't want to speak for you, but like see a lot of opportunity for FaZe to start to incubate their own products that way. You know, and, and if you guys are familiar with the FaZe founders, their foresight is brilliant. Say what you want, right? Like 
they have predicted trends, they've created trends in ways that nobody else has. But with that comes obviously the windfall, right? So that's that's what I'd is, like to Will this be your final thoughts? This is my final thought. Amazing. So Eric, what are your final thoughts about this topic? My final thoughts. Um, I mean, look, I, I we we debated this. Oh, we debated this a bit, and I, I've got mixed things on the revenue ownership tied to the game. We we talked about that a little bit. Um, I think that you know, I like open ecosystems, and I get concerned when you go too far down a monetary path that it starts to close the ecosystem a bit, um, and. And I'll go back to Valve as an example. It's like, you know, they debated with people about whether coaches should be allowed to stand behind because that's an advantage for a certain team that can afford a coach, right? And it's little things like that. Um, and so I think you just have to be a little careful or it, like, it can run amok a bit. So that's, that's the only thing, and from, at least from my perspective. Um, I would say I'm excited to see what comes out of this from a personal standpoint because... And I like narrative-driven games, personally. Um, I don't mind going on and playing, like, Mobile Legends Bang Bang on my phone, something that's easier to hop into, if I want to tilt, you know, and get really, like, worked up and compete. But um, overall, like, I want to see more of the things that you can do with the technology that maybe somebody hadn't thought of before. Okay. And there's stuff that, you know, I'll use Portals as an example. The tech to make Portals the game technically was around a lot earlier. It's just someone was like, hey, I want to think a little differently, which is what made that game amazing at the time. And then there's tech that didn't exist, like some of the, the, the net code and things that we can do with games like, you know, all the BR games, right? Like that didn't exist 20, or it was janky 20 years ago, right? And so like there's probably stuff that we can't do yet and it's cool and someone will unlock that. You go 30 years ago and they were figuring out how to make multiplayer work over the internet, right? Or maybe a little more than 30 years ago. So it's, yeah, that's the part I'm excited about, right? Okay. And I don't know what I don't know, you know, so. So would you say that Web3 gaming and this ecosystem will help actually maybe monetize esports better or create I secondary think, I think markets? It, I think it could. Yeah, I mean, uh, they were talking about Axie Infinity earlier, and I think there is an interesting thing there with, like, hiring trainers and having people work on certain things, like, in-game. Uh, that game itself wasn't quite there fully, but again, it's, it's early, right? I'm not going to go and judge an 80s pixel game against the, the fidelity of a modern game, right? It just, just doesn't make any sense. Okay. So, yes, I think there's a lot of monetization opportunities. So it could sure. be... But like now, I said, I'm a little concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm you're watching a little concerned. it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cautiously interested. Cautiously interested. But we could say that the monetization or the structure of possibilities that some of these technical blockchains apply to games that we already love yeah. in an invisible way. It might secure transaction. It might allow those things for games that the audience and the player might never know. We just have a new tool that allows those things. Yeah. Just to work better. Yeah. I mean, and I think that goes back to the whole thing. Make a, make a fun game. You know, obscure a lot of the tech, I think, behind it. And because the game will sell itself then. You don't have to sell it based on okay. the tech. Like, again, I don't know what it was like 30 years ago when people were marketing, but I doubt they were like, hey, this is an internet-ready game. Maybe they did. I don't know. But it's likely it was, hey, this is fun. These multiplayer, you can play with your friends. Right? So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Kara, bring it home. You have the last one minute and a half. Yeah, so this is actually somewhat related. Um, as an investor, I look for new markets and new opportunities, not just in gaming. And I think one thing that is really special about games is that they're simulations of life. They're mm -hmm. simulations of how people participate, how they cooperate, how they self-organize. And that has taught us a lot about humans over time. It's like this incredibly high complexity thing. And that's one of the reasons why my partner says, like, the things that will be the most important technologies often start out looking like toys. So, for example, like, because games were so expensive computationally to make, people made GPUs for them. But now, GPUs are the back of all of scientific computing, including AI, especially AI, right? So, like, all of AI rests on the back of, like, people who are playing Counter-Strike. And I think that there's a lot of really interesting opportunities there, too, right? So, like, what are some primitives about blockchains that we can test in games that will tell us something about the real world or that will create real world opportunities. And like some things that are somewhat obvious to me are simulation of governance, 
right? There's like when you own something, you can vote on chain. So there's some sort of like, okay, it's actually really hard to innovate on like governments because it requires civilizations to like fall. But civilizations rise and fall in video games all the time. Can you innovate on political systems in a game in a way that like does not destroy entire nations? Maybe. The same is true of like monetary policy. You can't run double-blind experiments in a real economy because you can't test counterfactuals in real economies, but you can in games. And so there's a lot of really interesting stuff with like, you know, simulation of monetary policy, simulation of governance, simulation of defense and warfare strategy, human agent interaction. So that's that's sort of like what I'm excited about with games. It's like it's not just games, it's everything. Okay. Well, thank you so much everybody. Thank you Ethember for having us. And yeah, have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for your help.
My name is Russell Castagnero. I am the uh, venture steward for Buffacorn Ventures. I'm also the chief of staff for ETH Denver and Sporkdow. So, um, so thank you for coming to ETH Denver. Um, I really appreciate it. Saturday is normally our big, busiest, busiest day. And as most of you know, um, in the past, we've had hackers working their little fingers off up until midnight on Saturday to get their submissions in, in time to be evaluated. This year, we tried to open things up to have everything due on 10 o'clock on Saturday morning so that we have the whole day available um, as, uh, for, for them, so they can get some more out of the content. Um, and, uh, and so that when we see them tomorrow in the judging, they're not all totally eyes, eyes red, you know, and they're freaking out because they're so stressed out. They actually have had maybe some sleep, or at least they're not as stressed out. So for those of you that are, um, in fact, hackers or founders or whatever, congratulations. I'm glad this Saturday is for you. And, uh, and thanks for coming, and thanks for coming and hacking so early. Um, I don't have a whole lot of, uh, of slides to show you. And the first part, you know, the thing I want to talk about is um, because we, are, we, we started seven years ago as primarily a hackathon. And of course, most of you probably already know this, but we don't call our hackers hackers. We call them biddlers because um, why build when you can biddle? Uh, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. That's all I can say. But the, the idea is that we have all these teams, and, and even part of the Buffacorn Ventures thesis, which I can get into at length, but I'm, I'm not here to just talk about that, is that these hacking teams that come together here are great sources for future teams that will be the next unicorns that we have in our industry and across the industries. Um, now, that doesn't mean that a team that's working on you know, on Matter Labs' uh, you know, bounty is going to get funded to implement that bounty, right? That doesn't make any sense. It's already been done. But what it does mean is as a hacker, you can show that you can meet a team, that you can deliver, and that you can provide value. Uh, and you can also show your flair in the projects. So the most important aspect, I think, of if you're looking at this more than just uh, an informational sort of thing. In other words, you're not just learning a new tool, which a lot of people are, and that's awesome. And I, I talk to people all the time who have, maybe they've gone to Camp Biddle, and then they come and they participate in the hackathon, and they're biddling, and they now have a new career. And so that is an amazing thing, and I don't want to uh, minimize that at all, because it's probably the most important thing that happens here at East Denver. However, many of the, the biddlers that are here are really interested in getting into a startup, in being a founder, in finding their niche, and there's plenty of stories about that, right? So, how you know how can you best do that? Um, I think the number one thing that you're going to find that sort of delineates the uh, the new folks from a really successful biddler team that might be a good candidate for a founder team is that they express empathy for who they've recognized as their users, right? So the easiest way to do this is if you solve a problem that you've had to deal with yourself, right? And if you're a developer, you know that if you've gone through the pain, the hours of pain doing something, and you find a way to do it better, well, you have that empathy because you're, you're writing this for yourself and for people like you. And that's really great. However, you only get one or two shots at something like this, right? And if you want to really deliver something that's going to be broadly used and really interesting, you really have to understand who are my users? Who are they going to be? And it doesn't mean you're going to be right. So when you come up with a team, you know, um, when, when you're in a team, you're hacking, this is what your bounty is. You can go talk to, the, uh, talk to the judges, or you can go talk to the teams that have a booth. You can find out what they want. The closer you come to doing those things, the more likely you're going to be to win. The less like you are to, to do those things and to just throw things in and try and farm bounties, the, le the less successful you're going to be. It's the same way when you move into, OK, we've actually found something that we want to develop. You find who those users are. Let's take a great example of something that is so screwed up 
that all of us experience it. Who totally dug the registration process for getting to Eat Denver this year, the application process? Who thought that was the smoothest, most amazing experience ever? Okay, no one is raising their hands because it sucked. Okay, it was a great example of really, really crappy user experience. And we say, oh, the UX of, of Web3 sucks. And yes, it does, but the UX sucks, and that's a symptom. That, that's not the cause. The UX sucks because we're not applying empathy towards our users. Now, to be fair, we have some more complicated problems with ETH Denver. We have, uh, you know, we have at least half the people are pretty much newbies. Maybe they've never had their own wallet. And the other ones may have been in, in it since they were OG Bitcoiners or OG Ethereum. So we get a lot of people. But what we did is we listened to um, little things and not the big things. So we made it impossible for anyone to use, right? Instead of useful for at least half of the population to use. I will tell you, don't do this in your projects. Don't do this as a biddler and don't do this as a founder. Talk to as many different people, identify, oh, these are our groups, right? This is who we want to um, want to work with and then solve the problems for them. Don't have them have to jump through a hoop. Any of you who are doing Web3 projects that involve a Web3 wallet, what is your, does anybody, who's, whose favorite wallet is uh, MetaMask? Whose favorite wallet is Coinbase? The wallet, not the, not the exchange. So there's a whole bunch of them and you may have a different reason. But I bet nobody's happy with their wallet, are you? Like, isn't it harder than it should be? Right? Now, why is that a hard problem to solve? It's a hard problem to solve because there's no money that we figured out in being in a wallet. The only way you can make money when you have a wallet is either selling subscriptions or in selling crypto to people, letting them use an exchange and then marketing it up, right? Which is what you have to do in most of the things. So there's not a, a case for money. And so it's really hard to find a good wallet that can be out there. Browsers had the same problem early on, right? With Netscape and Internet Explorer and all these kinds of things that came out. I use Brave, most people use Chrome or Opera or something like that. As a founder, it's really important that you find what your audience is going to be, who it is that your target is, and get empathy with them. Talk to them, do interviews, put together mock-ups and say, would you do this? If you're already a builder, we know you can implement the software. You can use something like AI, right? AI will build 90% of your software nowadays as long as you have the smarts to know where to deploy it, how to test it out, and how to get all that stuff going. But the very first thing you need to do before you talk about innovating, before you talk about it, is find that population of people that is going to be interested in this at all. So. This first part, I just want to make it really clear. Have I said how important empathy is for your users and identifying who your potential users are? Yes, I see some, some heads shaking and I appreciate it. Hey, Zafi, could you do me a favor? In my bag, there's a water bottle. Can you give it to this gentleman right here in the uh, light sweatshirt or sweater or whatever? Because um, he's been the most engaging person in this entire area. So, okay, thank you. See, I, I give gifts too. Um, so, okay, so... I want to make sure everybody understands the idea of empathy. Then we can start talking about actual um, transformative technologies. So this is where it gets fun, right? You've identified who you're going to be. Now, what kind of a transformative, transformative solution do you want to have? And uh, if you can guess, this is about music. It's really cool to follow music throughout the history and the cycle of music. You started out where composers um, would write their music out and they would um, work with musicians to maybe have an orchestra and, um, and you'd go and listen to that. Maybe there was a king or a really wealthy person that would uh, pay for their guests to come listen, right? It was a very small market. As the printing press came around and you could make printed music that more people could play, what you had was you had the composers that were out there and they were the heroes. There were people who could play music, and they were these drones that they played the music exactly as it was, was made. And, um, and so now it was expanded to a larger population of people who could enjoy music the way that they wanted to. 
So then you take it a little further. So we go from printing music. Now you've got recordings. You've got records. You've got first it was on wax. Then you've got um, records. And the industry that was around printing music had a real problem with the recording industry, right? Because you didn't need somebody to play. You, had, you were displacing two different groups of people, right? Or two different types of companies. The printed music and you were displacing performers. Because now, as long as you had a record player or a phonograph or whatever they were called back then, you could play that music. It was accessible to you, accessible to many more people, right? Then we had things like, um, like cassette tapes, and then we had the, the, uh, the Walkman, right? And then you had Zune and all these things to where it got more and more personal. The record companies weren't happy about it. Not only that, but now you had cassettes so people could record off the radio and make, make mixtapes. We did mixtapes a lot back when I was young. And you could share those kinds of things. This was threatening to the recording industry. And so the recording industry got in and started suing people in the same way, and I didn't mention this, but in the, the printed material, printed music, they were suing the people who were trying to record music. And then you bring it all the way forward to streaming, right? Streaming media is, a, is an inherent threat to recorded music. I don't know when the last time I actually bought an album for any reason, but I wanted just to buy the album just to have and never really open, right? I listen to the streaming music everywhere. What was the, um, what was the song, Happy, that came out? And uh, the, 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 um, the songwriter was like, yeah, I make a quarter of a cent every time that's played on Spotify. He's not very happy, but a lot more people listen to his music. He's not happy, the recording industry isn't happy, but these are all innovations that are happening. And as a founder, and as a hacker, and as a biddler, you need to think about what those are gonna be. So, I, I, this is a, a sort of the same view of that, where you have the performers and how they're getting displaced, and now we're all, all on our cell phones using really junky earbuds to listen to music that we could have heard in really rich sounds but at least we can do it in our own rooms. Now, the problem with tech, tech disruption, and we see this in crypto a lot, right, is that um, there are these moats that created, there are these blockers, and, um, and really what kind of disruption is, do you wanna do as a hacker, as a founder? And the, the really interesting thing here is there's genuine disruption, and then there's pseudo disruption, and so, and if anybody here has taken Lyft or Uber, as all of you probably have, in the old days you had to call up a taxi and they would come pick you up, you had to go hail a taxi or have somebody hail a taxi. Uber and Lyft did not change the market significantly other than disrupting it in a, in a, in a pseudo way. It's still about somebody in a car doing it. The difference is now they don't have to pay $100,000 for a licensing coin in New York to drive people around. Right now, anybody with a car who could pass you know, certain rules could then be a driver. Do you want to be that kind of disruptor with your solution? Um, or do you want to do something that's more genuine? Wikipedia is a great example of this. Dictionary, I mean not dictionaries, but encyclopedias, Encyclopedia Britannica. It used to be a huge business. You'd get an update, you'd order all of them, and then you'd get a new update every year to, to be for the changes. However, um, nobody does it anymore because it's all online, and Wikipedia is what really led the way. You look at radio, um, the same thing. Newspapers, they didn't go away, but they lost maybe 90% of their market share to radio. Television did the same sort of thing. So where does crypto fall into this? Well, we certainly have regulatory issues around crypto, and so when you're thinking about your tokens and you're thinking about all these kinds of things, think about, do you want to fight the fight of, reg of regulation? And if you come out with a security or something like that, that is the fight that you're choosing to fight. Or do you want to use the technology in a different way to do something like ticketing or to do like what I IYK is doing, where this is like a chipped, this is a chipped shirt, right? A chipped um, piece of, a uh, chipped garment that has a way of tracking. There's not a financial aspect to this chip and to this identity that it ties to online, but it gives you a new functionality, a new way of using something that is already there. When you're thinking about your startup, you're thinking about what you're going to do, determine whether you want to do genuine or pseudo um, disruption. 
not that one is any better than the other, but know what you're doing, know what you're getting into. And then we've got like big tech, and government falls into this too for regulation. You've got these moats that are built, and uh, there's certain things that the big, big companies can do, and whether it's Google, or it was Microsoft, or it's the government, what have you, they help steer trends. They define what everyone is talking about. Like if you are a Mac daddy, you love Apple, then you're talking about the new 3D display that they're coming out with, and you're not thinking about anything else that might disrupt them. Right, you're thinking about their new product because that's where the hype is, that's the cool new thing. You're not thinking about the things they don't want you to be talking about, which are ways to get underneath Apple's business model. Um, there's regulatory manipulation, we all know how this works, banking. Does anybody bank with Wells Fargo? Not anymore, no. Um, it, it, like, literally, they're going through and notifying all of their retail people, and this is what's new. If they had, can tie you at all to blockchain or Web3, they're telling you they don't want your business anymore, even if you've been there for 20 years. This is a, a, a moat that they're building against innovation because the payment technology around blockchain is already there. Predatory choirs and stifling. Uh, anybody like Mint? Anybody use Mint? So Mint was one of the coolest, you and I should vibe. Can you give him a water bottle to Zaf? Um, so, so Mint was this great software that came out that would go and sync up with all your accounts and give you everything that you, that you want uh, and, and information wise about all, of your about all of your accounts. And Intuit bought it. I think it bought it for like $100 million. It was like a two person company. Amazing stuff. And what did Intuit do? It slowly, they were like, let's ignore this, let's let this go. They tried something where, oh, would you, would you like to pay $2 or $5 a month to support Mint? Which of course I did, because I'm a good guy. And uh, they sunsetted Mint just recently. Um, it was so good, nobody else wanted to do a software solution like that. So now people like me are stuck using crappy old banking software if they want to do conventional banking and credit card management and those kinds of things. And then everyone's heard of acquires. That's where you acquire someone to hire their team and eventually bury their technology. It happens all the time in new, new firms. And when you're, a, uh, when you're a founder, that's actually something you want to think about. Do I just want to be acquired? That's, that's got an H in it. It's not just acquired. Um, acqu acquired and hired. Um, and that will probably eventually bury your technology and your solution. Still a way to make some money. So um, these are the kinds of things, I'm not gonna talk about this, we don't have that much time to talk about the government side of how we can sort of stop these moats, but it's really thinking, and by the way, I try to use um, innovation to, like an innovation new thing. All the slides that you're seeing are, uh, are AI generated, right, by Dolly. So you'll think, see things like misspelling and stuff like that, that, because Dolly can't add or spell. I think that's what, like, discrimination. That's uh, some discrimination, anyway. Cool stuff, so one more slide here I wanna, wanna go in is really think about how you want to disrupt as a founder. If you've already gone down this road, do you wanna do something that's genuine or pseudo, you really, really change things up? Do you wanna go fast or go slow? Is this a, a long-term change or is this like quick you're in and you wanna get the uh, Instagram sort of buyout, billion dollars, seven people? I mean, who doesn't want that? But uh, do you think you can get it? I don't know. Um, are you doing this to progress all of us, the world, in a sort of a more regen thing? Or are you just doing it for money? Not that, there's no judgment. Both are good reasons to do it. And then, um, do you want to be part of a community and have the entity that you're making contribute to part of that community? And of course, you're here, so the odds are pretty decent that community means something to you. Eighth Denver means something to you. Sporkdown means something to you. And so the last thing I'll say is that the whole thesis behind BV, Buffalo Corn Ventures, is that we make it so everybody that attends here gets spork, right? You, if you join the, the DAO, thank you, Mitch, if you join the DAO, you stake your spork, and you are now a member of a co-op that gets profits based on the companies that BV invests in. So we're trying to bring the community to let you all know that when you're members, you're actually owners of these founding, of these companies, of which you may be one. So um, I wanna thank you very much for coming out. I hope this was like 
remotely interesting and that the images weren't too ugly. I thought they were kind of cool. And if you have any questions, I'm Russell at ETHDenver.com. Thanks so much and have a great rest of ETH Denver.
Testing. GM, everybody. Good morning. Aloha. Oh, um, I'm Russell Castanero. I am uh, moderating this fabulous group where we're going to talk about dog fooding technology, um, and specifically dog fooding technology to eat Denver, and what we, I guess, are going to be looking for in not just what we did this year and in past years, but how we're going to iterate that going forward in the future. Um, maybe you guys can introduce yourselves, uh, Fons. Yeah, hey guys, I'm Fons. I'm the founder and CEO at Tokenproof. Uh, good morning, I think. I th yeah, maybe good afternoon. Uh, it's always a GM. Yeah, G we'll just do GM. Uh, my name is Casey Gardner. Uh, I'm on the board of uh, SportDAO. Uh, been around here since 2018. Um, previously been at uh, FIO Foundation, uh, the Ethereum Foundation, and uh, right now I'm, I'm currently at Harmony. So, you know, the first thing I want to say is an interesting thing about ETH Denver, we never talk about ourselves as it being a conference because it's not, it is the largest running Web3 experiment in history. And, um, and so being that we're experimental, we dog food everything. We try, are trying new things. You've hardly ever seen the same thing over and over again. So um, maybe we could first start by like, how about each of you saying what the worst experience that you had dog fooding anything in the past was before we dig into and it can't be the application process for this year. Um, <laughs> that, that's, that's off limits. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, why don't you start with that? Yeah, I don't mind starting it off. Um, I, th I think if I were to uh, rename this talk, it might have been uh, spork feeding technology. Uh, because I think if you're drinking soup, a little bit kind of comes out on a spork. So we never really quite get it 100%. And, um, you know, I, I, I know in years past, we've, uh, we don't really use the same tech stack every year. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, in years coming, uh, hopefully we can reuse some of the, the tech that we introduce here. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is my first ETH Denver, believe it or not. And we are totally honored um, to be able to run all the ticketing uh, for this year's festival. But... I think the key word that, that Russell mentioned is it's an experiment, and every year is an experiment. And I think the entire space that we live in is an experiment. And we see it evolve and we see it mature over time. And there's very better infrastructure, better um, tools out there. And, you know, when I, when I came into working with ETH Denver, it was very apparent that ETH Denver embraces the technology that comes out of the community. And we were literally building the plane while flying it because there's community members that come up with really cool tech that want to be involved um, in, in, in this year's festival. And so um, what we thought was going to be the technology or the tech stack when we started is very different from what the tech stack is you know, when all of you guys show up. And, it's, it's all about collaborating and using new tools. Some of them work great. Some of them, you know, have a lot of room for improvement. I don't think I have like a worst experience that I can mention, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but um, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to do this, so. What about yours? Oh, um, let's see. My, I'm gonna keep it to ETH Denver and not to some of the other things. Um, I think it was the second year, uh, the 20, was it 2018? 2019, when, so the previous year for doing the food trucks, the activation. So I came out of crypto commerce and Bitcoin and stuff like that. So I was really interested in showing people how doing a transaction with crypto was important. IRL. And, uh, and the first year, Austin did his thing. I'm not sure I got the years right, but Austin did his thing with the, what would become the burner wallet. That was amazing. And the next year, we tried it with some new technology, did it too late, and hardly anyone could figure it out. It had to be on a test net, and it, had to, it was um, wholly unsatisfactory for everyone that took part. And, uh, and I think that you know, those, those mistakes that you make are exactly what inform you the most. So it's really important to dog food this stuff so that you see where the real pain points are. And I was talking a little bit about empathy earlier in last talk. But you get empathy when you dog food something because you have to. And when you see where it fails, you can design the product much better the next time.
right? And I, th I think uh, ETH Denver could have easily just uh, implement sponsor technology, but I think uh, the thing that we do, I think, really well is work with partners and really build out their tech stack. Um, there's a lot of uh, things that go into a conference that you might not really think about until you're there. And uh, just being able to pivot and uh, just kind of uh, go along with the flow and uh, really just helps your overall product. And we've done that with Devfolio. We've done that with Token Proof. Um, in years past, we've used like Portis Wallet. Uh, and, and I remember the, the Biddle Bucks, one, one year, we couldn't quite get the tech stack right, so we ended up using Kong Paper Money. And we gave that out as Biddle Bucks. We, we kind of uh, made a last ditch effort to, to still implement something um, and still incorporating communities. So um, yeah, we, we, tr we try to uh, uh, make things work. The other thing is that ETH Denver could have chosen to use something like Eventbrite, you know? But then if we're not using Web3 native tools, what the hell are we doing, right? So. And, and uh, hats off to Token Proof, because it's very nice to come to a conference and not have to expose my wallet, right? And I think I've been waiting for something like that for a while. It's always, um, at least for me, a hassle to bring a wallet that has, you know, an NFT or has uh, some sort of uh, ownership principles that I want to uh, experience the profit of that, uh, but I don't want to uh, necessarily want to expose the risk of having that on my phone. Yeah, I think maybe it'd be worth me talking just a little bit about what token proof is. And, you know, I know that there were a lot of pieces involved in getting a ticket for this year's festival. And I think we need to do better um, to just simplify it even further. Um, but I want to make sure that everybody understands why we built token proof in the first place. And I go back to 2021 when I started degening NFTs in the space and I just bought board apes and punks and all this stuff, mostly worth zero now. Um, but uh, I, I went to NFT NYC 2021 and the first ape fest. And I noticed that I needed to have an NFT to come into all of these parties, but there wasn't really a practical tool to let me prove that, right? And I wasn't going to carry around my ledger with my punk on it to get into the punk party. Like, that's stupid. That's just calling for trouble. And so um, eventually I, I, I decided that there needed to be something better where we could afford people the ability to have a portable identity in the real world. So how do we connect on-chain assets with the real world so that you can walk into a store and get a discount because you own a buffet corn, uh, things like that. And so we ended up using cryptography and QR codes, and you might have noticed that the QR codes rotate every second, and that's so that we prevent people from taking screenshots and screen recordings, and we know that when you're coming into an event, it's really you that holds those assets. Um, you connect your wallet once to token proof, and then you can use it wherever while your assets stay completely safe on your cold storage, and you can link as many wallets as you want. I think we're integrated with like 45 different blockchains. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's all about true portability of identity so that you can extract value and utility out of the tokens that, uh, that you own on chain without really putting them at risk. And so that it's seamless to prove that you own them in the real world to get that utility. So. I, I think one good thing too about uh, coming to an event like this from a product standpoint is that you're kind of given an opportunity to see what you're good at. Um, uh, Devfolio, the first year they did it in 2020, uh, they were actually the application process, the hackathon process, and I think they realized what they're good at and they kind of uh, more focus on that. And I think Token Proof has an opportunity to be also the registration. You know, I think once you build out uh, what you're good at, you can kind of uh, uh, creep up to, to other features, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting in, sort of being a little bit on the outside, but still seeing some of the inside baseball and what we ha happened this year. Um, just so for all of you know, we had maybe six or seven different technology partners involved, or at least technologies involved in the application process, the aforementioned horrible application process. And the biggest thing is that like syncing up these wallets and making sure that people are using the right wallet that has their spork in it, or their staked spork, or their buffer corns, that that was somehow getting all the way through the system. And, uh, you know, and token proof has, is connected 
to Web3, but not really natively Web3, unless I'm wrong. And so that integration, which I think all of us can see, once it's done right, it makes so much simpler. But even just the idea of distributing, um, distributing Spork to people the way it needed to get done was horrible. Jason was up here earlier walking around like, what a horrible task that was. And being able to just connect those wallets, the, the, the wallet addresses is, is really fundamentally key. And we've learned dog fooding, what's the next one? Well, I, I, what, what's the next like, hurdle that we have to get over? I wonder if, if, you're, if you think it's the same as I do with respect to what token proof has done already for us today. I'll flip it back to you. What do you think it is? Well, so I'm glad you asked me that, Fonz. Um, I, I think it's the fact that you could have registered with a wallet or an email address, but there's no way to sync those two together. They're, they're, used, they're separate. So if uh, a speaker used their wallet to register and then their email came in and then you want to upgrade them for some reason, now they've got two tickets or they've got, you know, and so that is, is hard. Now I think that was never anything we identified yep. until we dog fooded it. And, and, and I think the reason, you're absolutely right. And I think the reason for that is that when we built Token Proof in 2021, we wanted to make sure that people could be fully anonymous and that you could come in with a wallet and we would never ask you for your email address. Or if we asked you for your email address, it would be two completely separate identities that wouldn't um, have any relationship with each other. And now as the space is evolving, we've sort of uh, are becoming more pragmatic and, and practical about it. And I think this year we're going to optimize for user experience and we might be leaving, I mean, and maybe this is the wrong forum for me to say it, but, but maybe we're going to be leaving some folks behind that want to be like absolutely fully anonymous and don't want to provide their email address or things like that. Uh, but, but in the end, we want to solve for the majority of people that want to have a really seamless experience, and I think that that is definitely an opportunity for improvement for next year. I, I, I say this a lot and I, for the last couple of years now, and I hope that uh, I don't say it uh, in a couple more years, but I think we're in the AOL stage of Web3. Uh, no one now uses AOL, but we all used it at first to get online, and it was a little clunky, it was a little slow, uh, didn't really have everything that we see now, and uh, I think what uh, now, I think every iteration that uh, we do at ETH Denver just, uh, just gets better and better. We're always trying to solve the last problem or the problems we had in years past and uh, just patience, right? You've got mail. Yep. Yeah, I think, you know, I started with the source. Um, but well, uh, I was Alta Vista, oh free. My, uh, and then like uh, those. Juno. Juno. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. That's zero. Right. Juno. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, anyway. were you one of those people that got free internet by looking at ads? Uh, the Alta Vista one, while it yeah. connected, it showed you an yeah. ad. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Uh, now, so let's get right, right to it. When the hell are you going to put um, Ticketmaster out of fucking business? <laughs> we're, what we're what needs to happen? But really, but seriously, what, what, what would need to happen to become a contender for someone like. AXS Ticketmaster. So, so the big problem with the Ticketmaster is that they're essentially a monopoly with Live Nation, right? And so it's really, really hard to compete with them. Um, the way that I would approach it is, number one, we have to get the Web3 market uh, down first. Like, we really need to get that user experience in our home turf um, perfectly where it needs to be before we start branching out outward, right? Because if we try to compete as a small startup with somebody like Ticketmaster, I mean, we would immediately fail. Uh, we're not ready for that type of scale. But obviously, it's something that we think about a lot. Um, the way that I would approach it is after we are perfect in Web3, then is there another market, possibly outside of the US, where we can show that we can compete at least at a technical level with uh, somebody like Ticketmaster? And, and then see how things develop here in the States. But the fact that they're a monopoly with Live Nation, so they have the artists, the ticketing, the um, venues, because they also own the, the, the venues, it's really, really hard. Um, and, and at some point, I mean, you even see regulators taking a look and seeing if uh, action needs to be taken, because we should be able to compete with them, but I can confidently say that it's very, very difficult when you're trying to compete against a huge conglomerate and monopoly. Yeah, you know, I'll also say from having 20 years in the payments industry, 
that there is a carve out for Ticketmaster. So you're not allowed to charge people excessive fees when you're doing online payments and credit card fees. However, Ticketmaster has a carve out because of their high value add to do these 20, 30, $50 transaction fees in addition to the credit card fees that are put on. So there's a huge regulatory moat protecting, uh, protecting Ticketmaster from doing that kind of thing. And, and you know, it is both their strength and their biggest weakness. They have to have that moat to have their model work. Otherwise, they begin bleeding in a big way really fast. I, I think they're stuck a little bit too because it incentivizes people to go to the ticket office and get a physical item. And I think we're at an age now where uh, digital assets or digital uh, memorabilia is somewhat uh, important to young people, so. Yeah, I mean, the paper ticket stub is so ready to be disrupted because I have a box full of paper ticket stubs because I like to keep those mementos. And now with things like Token Proof and POAP and all these things that are coming out of this community, I think it's really interesting because the idea is that I don't need to have this box with paper ticket stubs. I can just look at my wallet and see everything that I've been to. But also the, on the utility side of things, I should be able to use that old ticket stub to maybe get a discount at a merch store for the artist after I attended their, their concert. There's so much that can be done. And then partners can also leverage that. Um, and, and we're st still st stuck in the ice ages when it comes to that um, and Ticketmaster. And so hopefully, you know, we're, we're, I don't know if it's going to be token proof or somebody else, but, it, but at least I know that we're contributing to um, exposing that there's better ways of doing things at this point. What do you, uh, you know, like you talk to, the, look at the Swifties that are out there and that they like already hate Ticketmaster and they would love to have a real, uh, a real program that could track how many shows they've actually seen and get that kind of stuff. I mean, it is, it, it really is transform, transformative. And even at the, the early band level, having these clubs that they have, I mean, didn't, didn't, um, um, oh, what's the one, the, the online service, not Orkut, the one, um, the band's used. What was it called? Um, oh, for God's sakes. I'm like a that. fan page? They're like. No, but it was their fan pages, but it was, anyway, it was a competitor to, to, um, to Facebook before it came out. What? MySpace. MySpace, thank you. Jeez. I'm having, I, my brain is spacing. But, uh, but, you know, having something like that where new bands could just, oh, yeah, you're a fan, you get 20% off because you were at this show. You know, that kind of functionality is great. But, but when are you going to start taking crypto? Well, yeah. we, we are actually implementing crypto payments thank as you. we speak. So, yes. <laughs> um, I've thought about this a lot, actually. Imagine if you were this guy in 1964 in Liverpool and you were um, going to a bar um, at the Cavern and the Beatles show up. And they're not today's Beatles. It's just this indie band that are you know starting to play their first few shows and because you attended their event you get this digital token that represents that you were one of the first ones to see them and that gives you utility and as they get big you're going to maintain that og status because you can provably say that you were there right and then 30 40 years later you go to a Paul McCartney show and you have backstage access because you want to, you were one of the first people to actually see them in Liverpool in the 60s. Like, that, that's the future that I want to live in. And I think we're slowly getting there. I, if I look at my Apple wallet, I see hundreds of flights, you know, that I've added that have just stayed there. So I think we're slowly getting to that point where we want to have those memories. We want to look back. Um, for me, just having Po apps and, like, going on the app and scrolling, I kind of get some nostalgia so i think uh you know people want that they want to uh be uh you, you know rewarded for their uh participation early or or just being present so we're all sort of optimists um you know right. about this but what about the the dark side of this about like surveillance the surveillance machinery and like what do you think if you could like look forward in five years, like what could we do to avoid turning, ticketing, and these types of things actually into reverse surveillance 
on everyone to find what they're doing. What, what, what kind of steps do you think? We didn't talk about this ahead of time, so I'm putting them on the spot here. Oh yeah, we're just improvising. Um, I, think, I think what's really important for us, at least in Token Proof, is that everything has consent baked in. And so for example, when you're going through an online token gate that is powered by, by Token Proof, so for example, when you were applying to the hackathon through Devfolio, you would have to agree to share one of your wallets. So which wallet are you using? You might have 15 different wallets in Token Proof. Which one are you using to apply to Debfolio? And to me, that's an important step because we're not just delivering all of your wallets to Debfolio. We're, you're, we're letting you choose what parts of your identity you are sharing. And so we're giving you control and consent as to what you're sharing. To, to me, that's very important. And, and, and we're also very big in not selling any data. Nothing, like, we don't want to fall back into the things that we know are wrong in Web2 and the Facebooks and Googles and you know, the story we all know. So. I, I think the inherited uh, um, positive thing about crypto is that I can make a new wallet at any time. Uh, and you know, if I have a, a fantasy football league, I don't want to tie that to my Taylor Swift uh, ticket. You know, I don't want them to maybe know about it. So I think uh, the, it's very easy, obviously, to, to make new wallets and to, to tie them together on a platform, but not have them linked uh, when registering or, or participating in certain things. And, ha and having that divide or that silo is, is a good thing, I think. What, what other tech uh, do we have uh, besides token proof? IYK. Uh, yeah, 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 that's another one for our badge. Um, I know last year we used WeLook. Um, and, I, and going to events now, and, and like I went to the base party last night, and uh, you know, they're, they're using another uh, similar product. But um, it's, just, it's nice to see the changes in the years of uh, like what's trendy. And I, I hope we kind of maybe move out of that a little bit and to see what's practical and what's really uh, just uh, a good product in general. You know, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up WeLook and, and mentioned it because what was interesting about that was that um, it was all, it was very, there were, there were all new ideas and the Wii card that we had, um, I still use that as my business card, but it was, um, it was a really cool product but the way it was positioned for everyone, if any of you came last year, you know, you got one of these purple WeLook cards but you were told nothing about it. So there was all this technology that went into it. It was actually a dog really food. cool solution. Do and, and they were dog fooding it, right? They didn't have anybody telling people what the hell they were supposed to do. Um, to a certain extent, I've met a lot of people who didn't know they were supposed to set up their card, right? We could have done a better job this year communicating that, but they're also wearing it. At least the WeLook card, they put it in their pocket and never, or never took it out of the bag. Right, this, at least they're wearing it, and then you can, oh, I can boop this, I can register, I can mint it. That's really cool. So we learned something from last year. Um, unfortunately, it was at WeLook's expense, but that having it as a part of the badge was, was more important than having, giving them something they could take away um, and use potentially forever. I think you get more interaction uh, when you don't explain things and people have to figure it out. I think... Uh, I come from uh, like the DEF CON conference and they give you a digital badge and you're kind of left with it to figure it out, to hack it, to go through the steps of uh, the design of that uh, particular circuit board. And I, th I think we've taken that kind of approach where we kind of let people figure it out. Uh, this year there's quests. You know, looking at that, I, I saw I had to scan 69 people just to participate in a, a certain part. Was uh, it really 69? I, th I think it was 69. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the Can culture. I boop you? Can I boop your car? Look at this. But, we're, we're dog feeding for real. But yeah, I, I think when you, uh, you inherently just give somebody something and have them uh, experiment. And then, to be honest, I, I've also experimented on some of the cards or some of the, the badges. And there's other things you can do. Yeah. Um, you know, I won't go too much into detail, but if you're a tinkerer, uh, you can do a lot with the badge, and hopefully they figure that out after the conference. 
Um, not so much during, but uh, there's yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, a tech that you can take advantage of. I, I think something cool that we did this year is because we integrated with the IYK badges, we set up scanners at some of the lounges. You know this, um, where if you hold a Buffett coin in your wallet that is connected to your ETH Denver ticket, all you had to do is show your your badge. We would scan it. And then we would go to the blockchain in real time to see if you still held that buffet corn so that you could get access to that lounge. And so it's things like this with, where it's really cool to see collaboration between partners at ETH Denver because things come together. And now there's all of this interoperability between you know, the, the badges and the tickets and the blockchain. And so that, I've definitely appreciated that this year. Yeah, and then also on the token gating front, we've got the vending machines. And so many of the vending machines you see around, you can see you click on a little buffer coin, and if your wallet has a buffer coin in it, you get to get an item for the next two hours, you know, one item every two hours. Uh, and I think that, that, you know, that kind of stuff is cool. And also we've got, like, we're using your verifier, I think, at the store. Yes. Right? So that if you've got a ticket and you've confirmed somebody has a ticket, they, get a, they all, like, in the lead up on site. They even got a 20% yep. discount, I think. So... We're like all these things are examples of how we're dog feeding this technology. That's exactly what I was talking about. That's a great example of disrupting the paper ticket stub because now you have a, t a digital ticket that gets you access to Eat Denver, but you can also go to the merch shop and get some sort of discount because you have that ticket or because you have something on chain that gives you that discount, right? But also, some of you may have noticed in your token proof app. Because you have an ETH Denver ticket, we airdropped you these offers for several bars around the city or, and breweries where they're set up with the scanner so that they can scan your ETH Denver ticket and they'll give you a free beer or a free drink or something. And so that's sort of the interoperability that I'd like to see going forward. And, and from an uh, organizational standpoint, it was nice because uh, I'll give you a little uh, inside info. like. Uh, the, the swag store, for example, was having a little bit of trouble. Uh, they were in a weird area, and we pushed a notification out. And it was oh, yeah. something suit that we could just do and be kind of spontaneous and offer discount, you know, for the next hour or two. And because we had access to everybody um, in a secure manner, I think it was it made it easy. And I, I think what Web two allows you, or Web three allows you to do, is to reward your consumers or reward the people that are using your product. And, you know, that's just uh, something that I think will catch on. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you think, like, uh, so one of the problems we've had is we've got, um, you know, RFK Jr. is having, having a thing later on here. And so staff and security and all that kind of stuff and getting them tickets. And so he's doing a fundraiser here. And so these people needed tickets to get in. Like, thinking about ways that you could still make it easy to onboard people just that only want a ticket. Yeah. Um, you know, that is like, that's going to be the next thing that yeah. really, you know, that really helps. This is the biggest event that we've done at Token Proof with, you know, tens of thousands of attendees. Um, and one thing that I definitely realize and I appreciate now is that there's a lot of friction in requiring users to download a native mobile app. And so I think what I'd like to see for next year is a web app so that it's easier for people to, to interact with us. Um, I had somebody from the, I believe, FBI that attended ETH Denver, and she was trying to check in, and she goes, I cannot install a native app. Like, um, so, you know, there's, there's ways that, that we can support it. Um, but I thought that was funny. Excuses. I didn't think Blackberries uh, had uh, any apps. But yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, the, the FETs are here. So, what's, so, so first of all, just to want to give you give the opportunity, if... Uh, someone else is organizing a big event, how do they get in touch with you to, to use this for next time? Yeah, you can visit us at tokenproof.xyc. You can uh, look me up on Twitter and follow me at FonzGM. And we want to collaborate with anybody and everybody. So please please feel free to, to reach out. So what, what do you think like, are the first three things you guys are going to start working on after you sleep for a week after ETH Denver? Um, Definitely the web app. I think we need crypto payments. I mean, it's, it's, it's overdue at this point. Um, and just anything that makes it easier. I know that we saw people having trouble connecting their wallets, certain wallets um, to token proof. And so we want to address that issues as well. 
the, the, the great thing about ETH Denver is that you get this patient type of attendee that also appreciates that, you know, this is a community-led effort that, you know, they're helping provide feedback and, you know, they're not screaming at us because something went wrong and there's always something that goes wrong and the only thing we can do is improve and improve and improve and continue, continue um, adding value to, to the community in events like this. Yeah, we're all trying to figure it out. All right. So what, um, so away from, from the token proof side of things, what do you think is the most clunky thing that Web3 has? And, and what would you be, you know, like number one list is everybody needs to get out there and start dogging, dog feeding solutions or spork feeding solutions to, uh, to solve this. I think a lot of it is the wallet issue and uh, self-custody and seed phrases and, you know, um, the friction involved in, I mean, it's always a good exercise to try to onboard my mom into Web3. And there's two sides to this. One is how easily can we get her set up? And then what are we doing to make her life easier by using Web3? Like, to me, those are the fundamental questions is why is Web3 making her life easier? And, and, and until we have a clear answer, then I think a lot of us are just building technology for the sake of building technology. We need the why. Um, and, and as far as the friction and the wallets, I am really pleased um, at, at solutions like Privy and Dynamic and Web3 Auth and uh, solutions that allow you to just sign up with an email and then they give you a, a private key and it, it's still self-custody, but it doesn't involve a seed phrase, things like that. It's a double-edged sword, and I always talk about this because there's this bullshit saying in Web3 by marketing agencies and, and people in the space that go, oh, this is the future of advertising because it's, it, the, the NFTs are the new cookie because now I can tar a, a, a big brand like Nike can target individuals based on their on-chain identity. But to me, that's total bullshit because my on-chain identity is segregated across like a million different wallets. And so it's really hard to target ads to people um, based on their on-chain identity if my on-chain identity is totally fragmented. So I think that's a problem that needs to be solved one way or another, and there needs to be consent, uh, consent involved because you don't want to just be able to correlate you know, your 20 different wallets and infer that it's the same person, right? There needs to be privacy baked in and consent baked in. So I don't know, that, that was a bit of a ramble, but that's... Yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned the 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 MPC wallets. Yeah, um, and uh, it's it, I think I find it really interesting because like, being a, a, a Bitcoiner, like your your key phrase and even your your actually your private key were something that you had to know about. And uh, but I but very quickly I discovered that the problem no longer became key management; it was actually wallet management because yes. you'd end up with everybody that used an MPC you have a new wallet for that, and it, like it didn't solve it 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 just made that problem get even bigger. Like I think it's yep. even a, a bigger problem to have a domain-based wallet that's easy to use, but you're still, there's a moat around that wallet now. You can only use it for that one site. Exactly. How frustrating, yep. you know? I, I think account abstraction kind of helps a little bit with that, where you're able to uh, have multiple different keys interact with the same uh, set of balances or, or, or pools. Uh, I. Uh, I, I don't want to say that uh, um, it's not, I don't think it's there yet. I think we're still kind of far before we kind of use that UB key or, no. or we kind of uh, don't even really see that it's Web3. I think we're not quite there yet, uh, but it will, it will come. All right. By the way, do we have a mic for the audience or not really? Do we have anybody who wants to ask questions? Provide valuable insights? We do. He's we got, got a mic one for you right there. We got one taker. Come down to the front and I'll hand it to you here. Oh, we got two. She's, she's next, too. That's okay. Testing. There we go. How far away is something like Token Proof from providing ticketing to smaller businesses, smaller online communities across different chains? So you wanted to throw um, some sort of like a, a rave or some sort of event on an online spatial environment. 
um, how far away is token proof from providing those services? I'd, uh, that's a really good question. I'd say that we're already there. So we, we do online ticketing and online gating as well. It's not just IRL. Um, it's online as well. And we're totally chain and wallet agnostic. I think we're integrated with 45 different blockchains. Um, and so we're, and we're always adding more. And so we're, we're there. And we partner with a lot of different communities. We do ticketing for the Solana Foundation at times. Um, so it's not only EVM. It's, it's across the board. Um, and again, we want to collaborate with everybody. So. so why a badge instead of a wristband? So like outside it has, like if you lose your badge, it's an extra $100. So if I put the tech in a wristband, it, what is the qualm with that? It's just I can't advertise who I am to others as well? Do you want me to answer that? Like, because I could just use different code wristbands, right? So, so I think that's a, that's a great question. And it's um, because the bat, like integrating those two things into one is actually really important. Having it on the back, like it's a lesson that we learned last year with the Wii card. Right, having your badge be the actual credential, and, and remember, if you if you had if we had like if you lost a wristband, which happens, people do, you know, we would be charging hundred dollars for that because until that's deactivated, that's somebody else who can potentially use it, right? Uh, yeah. So so we've used wristbands before, and and coming from the music industry, we uh, you, a lot of people do it too tight. And there's a lot of that like support infrastructure of replacing, and I think like uh, being able to just to take it off when you go to a party, and you know like uh, if you go to any like especially like music events like EDC or like Coachella, you'll have like 500 wristbands, and it gets a little crazy. And just being at the, at the end of the night, leaving this in my car where I won't forget it, um, and I don't have the uh, opportunity to like you know, maybe make it too tight or make it uncomfortable. Cause I've, I've done a music festival and on Friday, I've no, like my arm is red because of like some mishap or, or something. So I this the flexibility I think, but um, you know, I don't, I don't see a real big issue with having it either way. Yeah, I think but, we, we could have done it that way, but if you didn't bring your badge, we'd still have to charge you to bring in a badge. And remember that some of the security is, is like visual like, yeah. should this biddler be they're not scanning every single biddler that comes down here? Only supposed to be certain badges that are allowed down in this area. So, so it, it it makes it a lot more complicated. And with this many people, you need to make it as as little as least complicated as possible. Because a one-time event, a wristband, like one day or some a number of hours, but for multiple, I think, and, and because the badge is so important for more of the of the event. You know, we, we made that choice this time. Yeah, from a, phys, uh, like a physical security perspective, like uh, I escorted my friend to grab a badge that I had in my backpack, and within three minutes of me leaving him, he was approached twice by security, like asking where his badge was. So I think from afar, you can kind of uh, make an assessment. Uh, whereas I think, especially here in Denver, where it could be 30 degrees and then the next day 70, I think if you look, a lot of people wear long sleeves. So I think from that, Especially when you have, uh, you know, uh, RFK or the the SEC, you know, you want that like for, like part of the security plan. So, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? We got one over here. Hey guys, thanks uh, so much. I really appreciate you mentioning the Wii card because um, last year we didn't know anything about it either um, until after the conference and got it set up, trying to use it this year. Um, and then honestly just found out that you can tap these. So uh, nice. honestly just found out that you can tap these, uh, your badge. So it's not so much a question, it's more feedback. Uh, just great to obviously let you know entries know what, what to do, how to do it, but I mean, you guys are doing a fantastic job. It's a huge conference, got a lot of moving pieces. So um, just feedback for the new technology coming in, making people aware of it just to obviously utilize it more. 
Thank yeah, you, and I, I think when you gamify it too, it makes the interactions better. I, like, I'm going to bring up DEF CON again. Uh, you know, part of those quests, you have to interact with the multiple amount of people, and uh, you just have a better, con uh, I'm going to say conference, but a better uh, event experience when you have something of an excuse to approach somebody. So we, we want to encourage that more. I think we're good. Well, we appreciate it, guys. Oh, one more question. Oh, one, more, one, more. One, one more quick question. Um, since you brought up gamification, I'm curious, like, what games you yourself dog fooded or like went through in this event? If you could talk a little bit about that. I'm not a big gamer, so. Yeah, I mean, I used to work at Rockstar Games, uh, and I think that like ruined my game uh, playing ability. I just like uh, uh, ruined it. But. Uh, for me, like, I just love, like, the alleyway. I like coming down and seeing people just sitting down and playing both the retro games and then crossing the bridge to Web3 and seeing kind of, like, how that whole thing has just transitioned to, like, uh, playability. I think, like, when you are rewarded and you can take your assets off chain, like, I think that's, a, like, part of the original, uh, you know, uh, thesis of Ethereum. So I, uh, just having that ability to take your things and, and using it uh, across different games is, is awesome. But by the way, that's something that I'm pitching to a few big companies in the space where, you know, let's say that uh, I have my board Ape and other Yuga Labs assets in different wallets. Those wallets are connected with Token Proof, and then they partnered with Activision Blizzard or Epic Games or whatever, and then I'm on my PlayStation, on my TV, QR code pops up, I scan it with the token proof app, and now my on-chain assets are linked with the game while keeping them safe. Like I think that that's sort of the portability of identity that I'm that I'm talking about that that we can facilitate. Um have you have you guys thought about letting people like you know, because meetups, like if you ever do meetups, there uh, half the people don't show up. Giving some like staking ability, like oh, you stake ten bucks, yeah. and then everybody who doesn't show up, that money gets split equally evenly between everybody that does so, show so up. So we already do this, but we don't do it with crypto. So what we do is refundable deposits, and that's sort of a unique capability that we have, because we've seen the problem of there's a lot of events in our industry that are free, and so people just claim tickets to have optionality, and then they don't show up. And so what we've done at a good number of events is now you have to pay 50 bucks to reserve your ticket. And the moment that you get scanned in, then we refund you the 50 bucks. So it's a refundable deposit similar to staking it. Just think how cheap it would be with crypto. Anytime I see that staking though, I know like ETH Global does that now, like when you, you just stake to attend and then you get it back. And for me, that can be a little bit of like a, a you know, a negative, but you know, I, I see how that it's, could, it's it'd be nice too if it much was friction. rewarded though, like you said, with, right. between everybody. Yeah, we, gave, we, we had like, like 24,000 24, tickets so far, yeah. is that, right? So just imagine if you had to stake a hundred bucks and now that was a little, little dividend, an attendance dividend. Yeah. Profit sharing. We're a co-op, go We're for it, stake your sport. Okay, I think that's all we got. We appreciate it, and, uh, and thanks for helping us dog food. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, really see, appreciate see it. See you next thanks year. Thanks, everybody.
Check, 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 check.
figure that out. No, we'll get a system. That's the vibe. Yeah, we'll get us figured out. Creator of chaos, you know. <laughs>
what you can do is you can recursively prove all the previous block and fill all the L1 data uh, on the L3, uh, thanks to the history prover. Uh, and at the end, what you get is um, uh, like all the data is available on the uh, L3 state rollup on the L1, and you can plug consumers uh, from out layer tools like Optimism or Scroll, and they can, with proofs, they can attest uh, a specific thing like a transaction. And you have a demo, which is basically uh, a capture the flag. So if you're like the, the biggest, uh, or the guy that did the most transaction uh, during the eat and vert time period, you can claim an NFT. And uh, that's uh, how we do it. It's using the protocol to do that. And we use it in Rust with time. Arbitrum and uh, Solidity. OK, so thank you, Storyless team. Is this microphone? Yeah, cool. All right, awesome. So uh, we're with SparkNet. We have an SDK that is wi uh, programmed with C++. Uh, you're able to ha create uh, C++ pre-compiles, uh, which are about 50 times quicker than the current uh, Go implementation of EVM. And then we also bootstrapped and uh, have concurrent uh, EVM environment of the C++ version of Ethereum, uh, which is about 10 times faster than the current Go implementation, uh, and actually the fastest EVM that uh, we could build and actually see in the market right now. Uh, so I'm going to let Itamar show some benchmarks, and then we'll show a bit of a roll-up that we built on top of this uh, for NFTs. So basically, on this video, we will be running three different benchmarks. One using the C++ EVM we implemented, one using our own C++ precompiles, and one using the Go at our, uh, EVM. Yep. So it will go and mint one million tokens each. And roughly, let me change one thing on the video, the quality. Uh, you have 40 seconds. 40 seconds. So on the video, we can show that or on the C++, it takes around seven microseconds to execute one million mints for NFTs. On our own EVM, it takes roughly 30 microseconds. And on the Go, it's still running. It takes rough, roughly 350 microseconds. So our own C++ takes roughly 50 times faster than the Go Ethereum EVM. And our own EVM is roughly 10 times faster than the Go Ethereum EVM. So yeah, we built a quick front front end to kind of like mock up, and it's pretty dope. Like we kind of like mint it, and then we uh, kind of pre burn it, and then we can uh, we deploy it on Zeta chain so that we can like uh, claim it in any chain, any connected chain. Time. With that. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next team up, if you don't mind, just uh, right off the bat, introduce yourself. That would be lovely. Yeah, team, remember to introduce your team's name, please. Chris, you got it? Hello? He doesn't have it. What? Oh, this he doesn't have it. Okay. Okay, so we are very vital. Um, we are, uh, we, we build a, a, an extra security uh, indexer service. So uh, indexing is a critical part of, of Web3 infrastructure. Most Web3 apps really uh, can't just scoop the blockchain to get an event uh, to, to restore the state based on, on parsing all the raw events and then uh, reloading all that and redoing everything every time there's a, a reload. So instead, they rely on indexer service to structure the data, keep it updated, and provide convenient uh, endpoints for querying. 
So, but indexing is just not the same level of uh, decentralization security as other components of the, of the stack. So the blockchain is centralized, permissionless, secure. Uh, the clients, you can run yourself, or you can uh, get the, the server via IPFS in a addressable manner. But the indexer itself is either cent centralized or decentralized, but not really verifiable. So what we did in Verif Verifido is that we are using the Cartesi VM for verifiable computation. We're using uh, the, the OpenStacks code for pre-image Oracle to fetch uh, data from the blockchain in a verifiable way, and IPFS for broadcasting indexed state uh, to clients. And so how it works is that the Kaiser machine pulls Ethereum data via the OP stacks uh, 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 pre-image Oracle, and then computes the index in a fully verifiable and deterministic way. And then it sends indexed data to APFS for clients to use, so clients, front ends, can just download uh, the state in a reliable and, and, and verifiable fashion. So let's see Verifido now in action, running on Sepolia. All right. So uh, here we see a contract that has gravatars where people can just store their gravatars there or update there. So that they have like the, the image URL and the name for, for your link to your account. And here the indexer already working, so he's fetching the blocks one by one. And then he starts indexing them, so getting the logs from each block, everything done in a verifiable way. So he's getting the gravatars that are created and then updated. Um, and then after that, you Time. can get the state. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, team. Thank you. Okay, team, you're ready to start. Our group name is Servo. I am Wesley. And I'm Josh. So uh, Alice and Bob want to have a wager on a game of Fortnite, but they have no assurance that the loser will pay up. So what do they do? They can't use a blockchain because even the fastest blockchains are nowhere near what's necessary for FPS gaming. They also don't want to use a centralized server because they live near each other, so it'll add unnecessary latency. Alice and Bob need a way to agree in the current state of the game without trusting each other or routing all communication through a trusted third party. So this is how the protocol works. So Alice starts with a state N, she has operations A, and she has a block number N. She signs this block, sends it to Bob, who verifies it with his own verification function. Now this verification function is globally shared amongst both Alice, Block, uh, Bob, and the global verifier. So Bob then, if, if Bob successfully verifies the state, he will sign this with his signature, and the block is saved and it becomes true. He will then do his own operation and send it back. But let's say that Bob fails to sign the state. So if, 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 if Bob rejects the state, the, this state, Bob's last state and Alice's last state, will all be sent to the blockchain for more verification. The blockchain will then find out what the last true block is and will send it back to Alice and Bob. So this is a system that basically gets much, much less latency than normal blockchain gaming does because it only calls into blockchain to verify when it's necessary. And some basic examples of where we could use this would be in popular um, sport video games that millions of players play, such as the NFL, Madden, NHL, and NBA. These are all games that people play, uh, place wagers on, uh, especially in my college situation. And having this system built, there could be a secure way that people can't just walk away after promising to pay someone, say, $10 and get upset that they lost. So yeah, basically the whole point, th this is our white paper, you can check it out on our website. Um, basically the, it's a protocol that anyone can use and integrate into their app and it provides a way for you to basically communicate peer-to-peer -peer with other people who are, who are with players to communicate peer-to-peer -peer between each other and then they can verify whether they're processing the state correctly or not with a blockchain. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, like, hey guys, we're the Odds Kids. My name is Carlos, he's Nath. And so AI has a problem. It's no longer open. And we want to change that. Okay. And so our project, Fuck Use the Zone, uh, we are in a urge to get all the AI related assets into decentralized storage providers. And so that's what we built. We built an API. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, for, uh, right now we're uh, just focused on the models. Uh, but in, in the future, we plan on adding some more models and more tools. Uh, this API uh, doesn't just let you uh, doesn't just let you get the models. So you, after you get the models, you also get the weights, and you can do. It works with TensorFlow, so it returns a model already loaded in TensorFlow, and you can do inference, you can do fine tuning, you can do any of the good stuff that TensorFlow does, and then. Uh, the API is actually currently deployed into PyPy, so anyone here can just do pip install AI3 and it's going to work, and then you can just load your models using this little function dot load. So in the future, we ideally want to build another API endpoint so that all AI researchers that are working on training models can also get them into decentralized storage service providers. And so uh, this is something that we want to keep building on. This is open source MIT license. It's deployed to PyPy. And so we want to really keep building this uh, and making it into a, a standard because there's uh, no other library like this out there in the market, Nate. How about the future? Yeah. Uh, in the future, we just uh, plan on adding um, more models, more tools, more data availability, uh, and just make it easier to bring AI to the blockchain and take away powers uh, from centralized service providers. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's type you, so... Good, go ahead. Awesome. Go ahead. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Soham. This is Anj, and this is Armanio. And we are CS students in Purdue University. And we'd like to introduce you to a revolutionary app that we built during uh, ETH Denver uh, to simplify crypto payments. So right now, when we try to send crypto, we have to send the public address to the other person, and that, then the person sends you crypto through MetaMask. So we try to change this using the NFC technology that Apple is presenting in its new update. So we can essentially just airdrop crypto to your friends. So before we, uh, I go any further, let me just show you a quick demo. So this is our landing page here. We click on Send Funds, and then you uh, select the amount of money that you want to send. Press on Send. And this is essentially just a mobile application, like a mobile a compatible website that we made. So it opens up MetaMask on your phone. And you can just confirm transaction. And then you get the option of sharing a link. Now, this link can be sent in any way, but the most secure way is to airdrop it using tap to tap. You guys can show how the tap to tap works, just like that. So once you tap and you essentially send it to the other person, on the other person's end, you can, uh, I'm just make, uh, in the video, I'm just making sure that the transaction went through. And on the other person's end, you get this screen called Get Money. And we're using the Harpy API to make sure that this person who's sending you crypto is not a malicious actor. And it confirms using the Harpy API that is, the sender is indeed not a malicious actor. And once that is done, you get a message that should show up soon that says that the sender is not a malicious address, your money is on its way. And then you just get the money over here. And as you can see, the balance will increase on your MetaMask right now. So that's pretty much how our app works. And this is just the minimum, minimum viable product. We can expand it to so much more like PO apps, NFTs, and any in-game items. And especially during networking events, you can just like send people crypto or any digital assets. So, yeah, that's it on our side. Thank you so much. Thank you, team. Right. Oh, sorry.
Hello everyone, I'm Herman from Uruguay. I'm Victor from Spain. I'm Antoine from Toronto. And we are Patio Station, a stream video and radio using Ethereum L1 node infrastructure without paying gas for first time ever. So how this work? I want to cast, I will connect my wallet, I will select an input for audio and video, I will start making transactions, I will search to the RPCs, and they go straight to the mempool of Ethereum Lake 1 to go among the whole blockchain. So now I want to tune in. So I just need to put there the address that is broadcasting, tune in, and I will start consuming the mempool API like block native, or directly the node, enjoy, and donate. So how is the hack? Uh, the, no, the tech stack, not the hack. Incremental gas proves the incremental transaction way. So we start with very weight packages with almost 40 kilobytes, and we go down until we are almost sending no data with more gas limits. So we don't end in the high processing probability zone of the transactions. We can send up to 1.2 megabytes per minute without paying gas. So, yes, congratulations, we ruined L1. No, of course no. We are delivering a real solution for a global problem, communication censorship by powerful groups. So, in an out-of-band scenario, these solutions offer a clear and ready available method to guarantee and secure authenticated communication. So, let's see a demo. I'm going to cast, so I will import my wallet into, of course, my own backend. So this can go out and fast very easily. I will start casting the video I chosen. So uh, we have sound here, it's not working, but here I will be my streaming information. This is a live streaming that already happened. It's the first ever video streaming on L1, and I will see the donation. So I want to tune in, I just put the address. I will wait for something come from this address. What and do you think let's about see, here we have a video that is streaming the from the address. Down there I can donate. So. Thank you, Ethereum, thank you, Cryptography, and thank you, everyone, and thank you all for being here and presenting this. Uh, excuse us, ladies and gentlemen. We, uh, the next team will be up momentarily, so appreciate your patience. He's uh, RR Bitcoin. RR Bitcoin. Yeah, RR. R double R. Bitcoin. <laughs> Crazy sometimes. Yeah. Double R Bitcoin. Uh, they are working on uh, kind of hedge funds and all that stuff. So they are making applications for all that stuff. Oh, oh sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Okay. Yeah. Can we use our laptop, right? Hi there. Thanks for having us. My name is John Stokes, and this is Kenny Thorson, and this is uh, Modulithic Files. Our goal is to bring modula modularity to monolithic systems. So here uh, we're showing a process of retrieving a file that we had previously uploaded to uh, the Linea chain. I'm going to do a new contract. I'm going to deploy a new contract real quick. You're deploying a new contract real quick. So what the, this is doing is it's uh, retrieving chunks of data and then reconstructing it into a file. The new contract. Here's a new contract. So, uh, but our goals with this is to solve uh, permanence data, uh, things like uh, 
uh, scientific records, uh, Supreme Courts, uh, even our own memories are all uh, suffering from impermanent loss, right? So this solution can help distribute uh, security for data across all EVMs. So essentially, we enabled every EVM to become uh, their own file coin. I'm going to upload a uh, file here, text file with uh, MetaMask to the Linnea network. So here we are uploading a file. Chunk one. Chunk one of one uploaded. MetaMask always, MetaMask always asks for confirmations. You can also put in your private key and it'll just batch everything. And when it's all done, it asks you if you want to list it publicly. You'll see that's the hash of the file, not the, uh, the hash of the transaction. So if you look in here. Time. Thank you, team. Thank you. Next one up, Mycilla. There's the story. Go, brother. So how long is the pitch? We have two minutes? Or yep, just one guy clicks down. Hey guys, this is Bala and this is Jaden, and we are Mycelia. The data oracles currently, you need to have a two-way transaction, both on the destination and the source chain, and it's really costly. And the oracle solutions right now are not very open to anyone. We came up with a solution called Mycelia. It's a Cosmos SDK based Oracle. And it only has, you, you only need one transaction from the destination chain, and the other one is just a query. Uh, we support, we, we work on Schnorr signatures, which is a threshold based signature. And uh, validators come in, and it's permissionless, anyone, else, anyone can join, and they can run their own validator. And when a user posts a data request, the validators all check for the data request and attest if it's true. Once you have a signature which is valid for, uh, which is more than the threshold, the, you, you, you get an aggregated signature which is easy to prove anywhere. It, it works EVM to EVM, and uh, Jaden is gonna walk you through the demo. So the first thing you do is you come up with some data you want to query. In this case, we're querying for my USDC balance on mainnet. The Cosmos chain validators will all query that same piece of data, and if they all agree on the result, they'll submit a commit to it. Once we've received two-thirds of commitments, you can submit a signature request, which prompts all the validators to sign over those commitments, and if they don't sign, they get slashed. This ensures that two-thirds of validators agree to the piece of data being attested to, and at the end, you get a Schnorr signature that is very, very cheap to verify on-chain. How cheap, you ask? Well. It costs about 30K gas to do a verification of this, including the call data submitted. And in terms of the call data, you're looking at just a signature of 65 bytes. So you have a consensus proven proof of data from one EVM chain to another EVM chain secured by economic consensus. Thanks so much. Time, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, well, great, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's actually the end of the officially registered teams. However, however, we got two bonus teams that are such DJs and hustlers that they really wanted to present to you. But out of respect of your time, I need to ask for your permission. Are you OK with these two teams presenting their projects? All right, give us some hands. Give us some hands to, to these two teams. All right, I present to you L2 Rim from, uh, with Omar. There you go. I got you. Okay. Wow, no, you're good. Wait for that timer. And you got to. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for uh, getting us a chance to present our project. My name is Umar. I'm presenting Alturium. So Alturium is basically the first RWA protocol that maximizes your yield from single digit to double uh, by integrating different real-world assets. 
So I'll explain you like how it works. So we have two different platforms. Number one is active yield farming. The second one is passive yield farming. I'll explain you how it works in the next coming slides. So we have active yield farming. I'll tell you like how it works. We have made a demonstrated video. So for example, if you have a user, uh, user have uh, BNB in their wallet, they can deposit their funds into our RWA pools. Then that RWA pool uh, integrated with different applications like there is centrifuge protocol. So centrifuge protocol is actually backed by uh, actual real estate and they, they give 10, 10, uh, 10 to 12 percent of APY. So we, we are getting your uh, LSD token and provide them as a liquidity. This is how it works. Okay, so then we have active yield. So uh, the, the another one is L2R. So if you have L2R token, you can come to our platform, you can provide uh, liquidity and uh, get, get APY through different ways. Because we are running out of time, I will be very quick. Then we have Bitcoin staking. This is like the airflow, like this one. I'm actually coming to trenches. So trenches is pretty much about uh, passive income. So let's say if someone is not much into tech side, so they just want to come to our platform and they provide their tokens and we will uh, maximize their yield. So senior is more likely low, low risk and mizin is like mid risk. So this is pretty much, we, we have our earning mechanism is live. If someone wants to earn some airdrop token, they come to our platform and they will Time. get Time, thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Join okay, me on Telegram. The next team up is Sphere One. Oh, uh, correction, uh, folks. So we much. still have three more teams that have yet to represent from the official register list. So hopefully they'll show up. I think HDMI will work. Shit, I don't even have the deck up. Uh, I'll be here. Oh, I got it. Okay. That's what? Uh, oh, fuck. Hey, everyone. Uh, so, we are the two co founders of Sphere One. Uh, essentially, what we built uh, is um, well, first off, the problem with blockchain is blockchain is really hard to mess with. Uh, user experience. Oh, I guess it's not working on the. Can we get some help with the screen, real quick, please? Sorry about that. Can you scan over this? It might just be mine. I can't be responsible for it. Yeah, sorry, man. I'll try my best. If you lose it, yeah, that's, that's on us. We're only up there so long. Thank you for pointing that out, by the way. Allowed. All right, cool. Um, so, oh, well. Okay, cool. Appreciate it. Um, should I wait? Okay, um, so essentially, blockchain's hard to deal with. Um, what if there was a solution, though, that was a lot more intuitive? Uh, and essentially allow people to work on certain tasks uh, without needing to understand anything. What we essentially built was a way to go from natural language to actions uh, performed on the blockchain. Essentially, this is what uh, our end goal would look like. It's something kind of like this. So what? Oh, project name is Sphere One. Sorry. Appreciate it. Um, so the idea is essentially an intent layer. Um, do I only have the 30 seconds left? Even though it's a minute? Okay, cool. Um, so essentially that is the piece there. But, uh, oh, sorry. This is actually what we built here. So um, there's a couple things that we have for like lookup tables for wallet addresses and things like that. There's obviously things we can improve. But it'd be like, hi, I would like to send 0 0.01 Matic to Ryan at sphere1.xyz. And essentially what this is actually doing is we tie this into a Cosmos uh, Tendermint SDK chain. Mm -hmm. So effectively that is being relayed into there. And then that's going to then talk to effectively our model. 
Um, the model is a multi-agent framework that we essentially built out that takes the uh, language here and translates it into an overall uh, set of requests. If I say, uh, yeah, let's do it. Um, well, uh -oh. I had a little network error there. But essentially, the idea is that we end up with a uh, transaction and uh, time. Thank you very much, team. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. One sphere, I believe. Yes, sphere Thank one. you, team. Right in. Over there. Once that clicks down to zero. To call the name. Uh, hey, uh, token mag teams from Token Magician, Spin, and Bitmask Snap, please come to submarine stage to present immediately. Thank you very much. All right, team, you guys ready? Whenever, yeah, we're ready whenever you are. Hey, what's going on, ETH Denver? We're happy to show you our cool tool that we built during the hackathon called Deployer. And we make it really simple to deploy your smart contracts across different EVM compatible chains. So as you see here, we have a little form that makes it really simple to type in the information. You don't have to remember any steps. Um, you don't have to worry about having a bulky CLI tool. Um, it's all right there in one single interface. Uh, this tool works with key stores, so all your deployments are secure. We don't allow for any loose private keys, so those key pairs cannot get otherwise uh, ruined and exposed to the public. Um, in addition, we also have deployment logging for your smart contracts, so you know exactly what you deployed, when you deployed it, and what address it popped up as, and how much you paid in fees. Um, in addition, we also have Etherscan verification baked into the GUI, and this thing works on Linux, Mac, and Windows. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we just really hope the community will love this tool. Um, it supports Solidity, Viper, and Arbitrum Stylus. And yeah, you just uh, paste in your RPC endpoint, it just simply works, TM. Um, in the future, we're hoping to also support different types of deployment scripts as well, so that people with more complicated needs for dev, uh, DevOps can easily just uh, deploy their entire setup in just a click of a button. Uh, as you see here, there's a few examples of some of the different chains we've uh, deployed sample contracts to. Uh, we have home-baked SolC support. Um, Chris did it here using System.io. We have Viper support that's done through Viper RS. And our Arbitrum Stylus support is coming directly through um, Cargo Stylus. OK, yeah, thank you guys so much. OK, thank you, team. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have three more teams that are registered, um, and we're waiting for them. So if y'all want to hand tie for a little bit, please, uh, that would be great. So uh, Token Magician, Spin, and Bitmask Snap, please, please, please come to the submarine stage. Token Magician, Spin, and...
GM fellow public goods enjoyers. Um, has anyone of you ever donated to Gitcoin or Giveth of, or any other public goods funding mechanism? Please raise your hand. Couple All right, a couple of people. So let's set some context here. Uh, this is something what we developed last year as part of our day job. It's a tool that lets you donate to Gitcoin grants directly from Twitter. Some of, some of you might have seen it. It was pretty popular, over 1,200 donations. But there is one major UX problem. Uh, Gitcoin rounds are usually run on single chains. There is a conflict of interest. We can imagine that when uh, an, a blockchain and an L2 comes to uh, Gitcoin and wants to sponsor, they would rather have their round exclusively run on their chain. But on the other hand, donors want to donate from wherever their money is. So as a scope for this hackathon, we've extended this functionality and built a smart contract infrastructure that enables cross-chain Gitcoin donations using a cross V3, a base network, Ethereum attestation service, and 0x price feeds. Exactly. Let me just show you real quick how it works. Uh, you have a familiar interface from our browser extension. You can select a network that, that you want to donate on. And in this case, we deployed a donation contract on, on either of the chains, Ethereum and Base. Uh, but let's just uh, pretend like we're sending from Ethereum to Base. Uh, you could set up a, a donation contract on, on either chain. Uh, the wallet will trigger. I'm not going to submit it now because uh, a cross V3 takes about one minute to, to confirm. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. Uh, there's a relay contract on Base uh, that would pick up this transaction on uh, Sepolia. It would then forward it to our wrapper contract and it donates directly to our uh, donation contract that is just a fork of Gitcoin contract. And we're planning to release it live in April, so hopefully you will have easier time donating to your favorite project. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, time. Next one, please. Cross-chain Gitcoin donations. It comes with a nice attestation. Very descriptive name. Just speak right in the microphone. I go here and you go right there. Okay, with a beanie and a hat. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Hey, bro. I just forgot. Did I ask for a spot? I don't know, but it doesn't matter. I think the easiest is whenever you feel ready, just come. Line up. Line up. Hi there, my name is Oshin, this is Earl, and this is Chris. We built Near Event Hub. It's a Web3 native platform. Sorry, one second. Cool. So we're building a Web3 native platform for trustless event coordination. So we believe that events are a public good providing education and other benefits to local communities, but they're difficult to run, organize, manage, and fund. There's lots of different problems, such as overbooking and no-shows, inefficient communication, and lack of trust and transparency between parties, such as the attendee, host, sponsor, and venue, as you can see here. So that's why we created Near Event Hub, a near-powered solution. We can easily create, host, run, and fund events in your community. We provide decentralized transactions fac facilitating transactions between parties, we allow for staking and reputation to ensure commitment uh, amongst parties. And we also have token gated group chats, which allow communication in your community. I'll pass you on to Earl very quickly for a demo. Thanks. OK, let's do the demo very quickly. So you go to your application. You're able to view the different events in your location. Let me see right there. You're able to go to the Discover page, look what's near you. If you want to create an app, or create an event, you can go, you can choose a location. Let's do Denver for this one. There you go, you got your Denver, you can create. Create will actually create. I'll skip the creation. And then also, we were able to mint the NFT. Oops, let's. You know audio. That. Yeah, there is, there should be. And then uh, we also have chats where you can connect to your MetaMask. And then you're able to talk to your LLM, which will talk to the events, as well as being able to do DMs with your uh, different Time. Design. Thank you very much, team. Thank you. Next one, please. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thanks. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Hello. Got it. Cool. Hello, everyone. Yep. Three, two, one. Okay, so we're going to talk about live streaming. We basically built Omegle with uh, LivePeer, and we're going to we're trying to censor bananas. We know Omegle, Chat Roulette, all those platforms are full of bananas. So. Um, Yep, this is our demo. All right, so we are leveraging TensorFlow inside of the browser using the GPU that is uh, active inside of Chrome. Eventual plans to leverage the GPUs that are happening on your devices. But right now, we're classifying all these images and broadcasting a stream to LivePeer. And if an undesirable image were to appear on the screen, we're going to instantly stop the stream. So we put the banana on the screen, and it goes completely back. So we want to do this. I think we deserve safer places that, where we can get to know people from all around the world. And yeah, let's make the internet a safer place without bananas. So I'm so sorry for all those apes who are not going to find any more bananas online. So yeah, that's it. No bananas. No bananas. Oh yeah, we got like 40 seconds. Yeah, 40 seconds. Any questions? Quick, like, five-second question. Yeah, that guy in the white shirt. What's the domain? Nobananas.io. Okay, you're going to need a Web3 wallet, which is going to authenticate you, and then you're going to be able to hop on and create these kinds of streams. Uh, eventually, what we'd like to do is a little bit more active tracking. So we can censor all type of content. It is simple. We, we live stream with LivePeer. We detect the bananas, and we just censor it. So it's as simple as peeling a banana. Just Plans with LivePeer to provide metadata. So if you actually want to show your bananas, that's going to be up to you. Self-sovereignty is the way. No bananas. Thank you, team. Thank you. Next team up, please. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, we got it. Okay. Hello, hello. Oh, okay. Okay, it's great, great, great. So, yeah. plug it in? Yeah, plug it in. <laughs> okay, we're ready whenever you are. Okay, we're plugged in. All right. Oh, you lost it? Okay. We still need that, by the way. Uh, wait, sorry. I'm plug into my phone. Good. All right. Hi, I'm Xavier. I'm William. And this is BeFit. Who here can do 10 push-ups? Pretty easy, right? Who does this every single day? Not me. Too lazy. 10 push-ups is easy, but getting the motivation to do it and stick to it is really hard. That's. And this is a big problem. Over 75% of adults and over 80% of adolescents in the US do not get enough exercise. And that's a problem we want to solve in line with UN's SDG 3. BFIT uses ML, blockchain, and our favorite, social pressure to get people to work out. Let's, Let's make, make exercise, exercise fun, fun again, again with, with BFIT. BFIT. Oh my god. Oh, there you go, there you go, okay. So this is what the app looks like. Um, I got you, I got you. This is what the app looks like. You're able to see all your friends doing their push-ups, but they're blurred because you haven't done your push-ups. So stop being lazy. Come on. Let's go.
Yeah. yeah. Hurry on, let's go. And look at that. Mint a BFIT NFT because you did your push ups today and nobody else did that. And while we wait, let's actually see other users of BFIT. Oh my god. Wow, look at this dedicated user staying active in the club. We love BFIT, it gives you active in the club too. Oh, there we go. So our NFT has just minted. Let's actually copy this link. Let's check it out. There you go. Minted 12 seconds ago. Thank you, guys. Thank you, it. team. The audience is welcome to do some push-ups as the next team is getting ready. Thank you very much. All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, while we wait, if you're a biddler, uh, Impact Public Goods, you haven't checked in, please come down and check yes. in right now. Thank you. No, I don't have to speak. <laughs> yes, okay. I'm just standing by. Hello, hello. All right, go ahead, guys. Should we, or we wait 15 seconds? We're good, you ready? Yes. You're good, you're good. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Limone, your Frank and Paolo. We built Papa Base, uh, which is a public goods platform to found uh, uh, open source and public goods contributions and builders. Uh, on Papa Base, you can donate to fiat or crypto, and everything, of course, is built on base. As a builder, you can create a new campaign, connect your GitHub, and select one of your repositories. I won't go through the whole creation process here, but you can see there's some metadata, images, campaign duration, and the receiver address where you, can, uh, where you want to withdraw the money to. Uh, of course, you can explore like, existing campaigns. On Donate Now, we will see like, some existing campaigns here. For example, let's get this one uh, that has already got some donation. I already donated here, as you might see. Uh, and here is all the other people that donated. Uh, whenever you donate to a campaign, you also get an NFT. And that NFT gives you access to an XMTP token get a group chat to stay posted with the project updates as well as asking questions to the builder. When donating, you can select USDC, but you can also donate with DAI or ETH, and we are swapping uh, those tokens in USDC for the users. You can also run a um, recurring donation each month, and you can also buy USDC directly on Coinbase. Uh, just uh, one quick demo about the uh, donation. So uh, I can send one USDC here, and I will show you like the new messages coming through the uh, chat, which is notifying all the users that some, somebody donated to the, um, to the actual project. So let's go through the MetaMask flow here. We are sending a new donation. Uh, if I open this link, it redirects me to Converse, which is a, uh, the mobile client working with the XMTP group chats. You can see my uh, phone now. Pasting here the link. The example campaign, I can tell the group. Thank you very much, team. Thank oh. you. Next team is up. Uh, if you are, so ladies and gentlemen, you are watching the presentation of Public Impact Goods. We have many more teams coming up, so stay tight. And if you're a team, you haven't checked in, please come down here, please. Hey, guys. Hello, it Denver. Uh, we are building Bounty Bird. So Bounty Bird is a uh, micro-task site on Lens Protocol, Farcaster, and Twitter. So you can create bounties, and somebody can pick it up. So you can create the bounty on Yeah. So you can create the bounty on Twitter uh, in natural language, and our AI uh, engine picks, picks it up, and so on bountybird.xyz. And uh, like, uh, you can verify that by reputation system that 
pe people has paid their bounties or not, or somebody has done how many bounties. And it's peer reviewed, uh, build on Lens Protocol and Farcaster. And you can check it out at bountybird.xyz. Yeah. Any questions? No questions? Yeah, then. <laughs> uh, I think that's it from our side. Got it, got it. Uh, hey, uh, team, so uh, we just got a comment from one of the judges. Please clearly announce the name of your project. Uh, register name, uh, very importantly, so our judges know who you are. So please, from now on, first thing you mention, please, name of your, uh, register name of your project, please. Thank you. All right, uh, perfect. Like yeah. Yeah. Right in there. All right. GM Eat Denver, what's up? Can I get a GM back? Yes. So who here farms airdrops? Do we love airdrops in here? Can I see some hands up? Okay, we got a handful. So, you know, farming airdrops has always been, like, it's, it's been difficult. I'm lazy enough, I'm, I'm just building my things, and it's always been hard, or you could say I'm lazy enough to farm airdrops, but what if I told you that you could automatically farm airdrops in a single click. Introducing the airdrops hub. It's an automated airdrop farmer. So basically you just come on the platform, connect your account, and basically it creates a smart account for you right there. This is the dashboard. And in here you can explore different categories of airdrops of label. Let's take base for example, right? Um, you, can you can explore what kind of details are there, what, what exactly is happening. So we've got like these different strategies for you based on the amount of capital you have, you know. On, on a network you want to farm, maybe you are a BTC maxi or an ETH maxi, we've got it all for you. So you basically just connect your wallets right there. So this is where the bridging part happens. You can bridge from any chain, it's a cross chain thing. Once we are completed with the bridging, this is where the magic happens. This is exactly like after this, you don't need to click a single button and you can farm airdrops monthly. Uh, so when the bridging is done, let's, let's wait for it to happen. So after the bridging is done, you, you get redirected to the platform. It takes a bit of the time, so. Once you get redirected, that's it. So you, you can swap, you can stake, unstake, you can even do bridging, all of, all of the tasks automatically, and it happens for you. You can adjust the strategies. And these are like just some example airdrops we've got, but here's the interesting part. We dig up around 78 different airdrops in the last four days, and those are in the pipeline right time, now. Time, time. Thank you, team. By the way, before you step off, yeah. what is the name of your project? Airdrops Hub. Thank you. All just right, thank farm you. your airdrops in a single click. Thank, thank you, you, team. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yep. Okay, team, once again, uh, first thing you mentioned in your presentation, please, please, specifically mention the register name of your project to make it easy for our judges to track you. And might as well mention it before you leave the stage yeah. also. Thank you. No. No, no. Yes. Five. <laughs> Four. Two. One. Hi, that's Neutrino, it's Rachel, Julio, and Jonas, also Carlos, that uh, is not here, but I can attest that actually his soul is on our code. So what's healthy food? It's mainly like food with nutri nutrients, and what's unhealthy food? Mainly like empty calories. So how do you think them? Well, that's shit. So actually the government solution was a Nutri-Score. So let's play a little game. Guess what is healthier? Well, Actually, Coke Zero is healthier than olive oil. So, well, government solution is to process food industry. So because of that, well, let's decentralize it. So our solution, we have built actually an LL model that helps people understand what healthy food is and what it's not. Uh, that's a demo. Okay, uh, here is our model. Actually, you can enter as a user or as a nutritionist. Uh, the user actually can Okay, log in using the MetaMask. 
Good work. Oh, okay. Failing. Ah, okay. It's the connection. Ah. Okay, so the user can connect using MetaMask? It's not. Okay. Attachment, okay, I have it there. And actually what it can attest is using the barcode. Oh, uh, yeah. It can attest actually what it's eating or not eating, sorry. And actually it's, actually it can generate an, it can generate uh, an IP attestation that actually is linked to IP token that it's intellectual property that Time. Board thank yeah. you team name of your project before you leave what is the name of your project neutrino neutrino thank you neutrino okay next team up ladies and gentlemen as you can see the vibes here are awesome it's about to get even better so stay tight are we ready okay name of your project first please fun guys Okay, all right, 14 seconds before we go, before we go live. How's everybody feeling? I like that, I like that, Denver. All right, funding open source development is not a crime. I'm starting that with that. We are fun guys and we're here to solve it. At fun guys, we're building a decentralized crowdfunding platform, and over here you can see that we are creating a campaign. We're jumping right into it, Ethereum ecosystem builder. And here we are, we are live on base, everybody. We select the token of choice, and we only want to accept WETH for our token that we created for our contract. And over here, you can see the proof. It went through, that was a success. Now, bear in mind, this is all live on base, so it's fast, fast, fast. Ethereum ecosystem builder, you see that it's now live. When you hover over to profile, you can see that the withdraw function is enabled. And that means that you're only able to withdraw if you're the profile owner of your own project. And jumping into here, you can see we are going to have to jump in into another address. We're going to jump into another address so that we can donate to a project, mimicking that we are in another person. Now, look at this. This is an amazing technology that we have implemented together with OX Tech. With OX, what we have done is we have implemented a swap in the donate function. Look at that, you're donating in USDC, but the project owner, they're gonna receive this in WETH. Now, this allows a different jurisdiction and different geographic distribution to receive different types of tokens depending on their needs. For example, if you love Polygon, you're, you're a huge ecosystem user, you're able to just donate that. So right now, we have configured USDC. You can see that this is being set up. And over here, I'm just going to take you right straight to Base Scan, where everybody loves Base Scan. Look at that, the campaign details. You can see that Base, we're now live with that 10 cent that we have donated, and it is immediately swapped to WETH. And finally, I want to show you a last feature that we've integrated. We are live on Warpcast. By sharing your campaign details, you can bring it to a mass audience and show them what are the stories and what are the projects that you love to want to contribute to. And we are now live on base. Let's effing go, baby. Good job, man. What's, what's the name of your project? Fun Guys. OK, Fun Guys. Thank you, Fun Guys. OK, next team up. Next team up. Once again, first thing you mentioned, please, name of your project. We are Unbound Science. Thank you. You got it. Okay, Unbound team, you are off to go. Right. Unbound Science is developing a creator economy for scientists and inventors. The main problem we're trying to solve is that the funding is not getting into the hands of the builders that are making the technology the world desperately needs today. So what we've done is we're creating donation pools that are subject specific and taking in funds that way and then allowing donors, scientists, and for the first time, the general public to all weigh in together and vote to what gets brought into our world. So the general public uh, or our community is comprised of our enthusiasts um, where on their dashboard they can mint donation tokens 
um, by donating to donor pools. They can also get tokens by engaging uh, in the community. Uh, they can engage by either watching um, <clears throat> scientist proposal videos and as well by uh, engaging in chats. Uh, these chats are randomized with other people in the community to try to prevent confirmation bias and uh, have people discuss uh, with pe uh, others that um, don't necessarily share their point of view. The scientists, uh, they, their dashboard is token-gated by an NFT, and um, <clears throat> on their dashboard they can um, on their dashboard they can send proposals um, as well as upload all their files and videos and see their other proposals that are uh, live or in uh, edit. And what's next that we're building is a way to save all the scientists' data from their notes, research data, replication data, training manuals, so then we can package it up in one NFT, put it on a marketplace, and anything that comes through our funding must use our open source science license to give out to the world for free, because really the ultimate goal is to spread technology around the world and make access to technology a human right, not a copyright. Thank you very much. We are Unbound Science. Thank you, Unbound Science, for also reminding the audience the name of your project. Thank you. Yeah. Is that clear? Great. What is the name of your project, sir? We are Zero Explain. Thank you. OK, are you ready? Do the mic. That didn't work. Oh, there you go. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah All right, go ahead, guys. So we are zero explained. So the other day I looked at this guy's profile. His name was Nick, and I found a like absolutely amazing chart. But I forgot to save it, and because Twitter has no way to get back to the charts that you don't bookmark, there was no way I could find him. Because Twitter works on hashtags, and there's no way you can find charts. Also, this guy chart was absolutely amazing, but I couldn't really tell him that I couldn't tip him, nor could I tell him like, oh, I want to make this suggestion here. What a shame that neither could I tip him nor could I make suggestions. So here we bring Zero Explain. Yeah, so that's why we came up with Zero Explain, which is a repository for data stories and amazing charts. You'll also be able to discuss with uh, the owner of the chart, and you'll be able to contribute to the uh, original charts as well. You'll be able to get the data that we have already prepared, and you'll be able to make amazing charts based on that and be rewarded for that contribution. So let's take a look at how Zero Explain works. So here's Zero Explain. Um, you can see that here's some amazing data that you can uh, pull in, and here is the post feed of the chart that you, uh, Bina just talked about. Here's next chart, amazing Bitcoin price analysis. All the events are added on top of it. You could also contribute to that, and you can leave a comment, amazing, right? Like, da-da-da, just amazing chart. I'll add that to the chart. Now, let's say that I love this. I want to tip him. Boom, I just tip Nick directly from here. Let's say that I'm Nick, and I want to create a chart. So I go to the chart. I create, like, let's say, for this project, the Nostra TVL. And uh, here's an amazing interactive chart where I can add an annotation. And I knew that, for example, a certain event happened, so I just add the airdrop. Bam. We can collaborate on an interactive chart. Now that I submit it, it's added to the feed. And uh, yeah, here we go. We'll be able to discuss, collaborate, and uh, be Time. rewarded Thank for that. Thank you, team. What is the name of your project, sir? Uh, okay. Zero Explain. Zero Explain. Give it to your audience. Thank you. Next team up, please. Hello, everyone. Name of your project, please. Our project is WISE, and we are WISE Tribe, Wise Tribe community, uh, the global community uh, that is fostering the personal and professional growth to build the most meaningful project on the planet. Who is here uh, uh, willing to make this world a better place? Raise your hands. Nice. Thank you. So uh, today... All right, so next slide. Next. So today our planet and humanity in a really challenging place. And uh, uh, we all have a feel, we, we all feel a calling to uh, address the state. 
and uh, elevate the consciousness of humanity and help people to unlock their abilities. So the next era is uh, the next era of the human evolution is the wise era. Here's the, our uh, community hub, the wise castle, uh, the conscious crypto castle in Solana Beach, California, where we hosted more than 40 transformational events. And uh, our community uh, is more than 1,000 people. Here's our social media. And we uh, build on ideas of uh, wisdom acceleration and the biological consciousness that will win this AI revolution. So we came up to this hackathon and we deployed the DAO for our community. And the biggest challenge we have right now that people uh, who are the part of our community, they don't know how to participate. Uh, so we want to incentivize them to grow, to awake, to develop their consciousness, go through educational healing transformative events so they could gain reputational token and then exchange into governance token and the ultimate goal for us is to provide universal basic income to our members and we are building a beautiful tokenized island in Panama. So for this hackathon we deployed the uh, POAP, uh, proof of attendance, and in our wallet we have this POAP. Time. All right. Wise Thank you guys. are again, please. Wise tribe. Okay, thank you. USBC. <laughs> yeah. Next team. Hello. Name of your project, sir. In the loop. In the loop. In the loop, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Perfect. Y'all ready? Yeah, whenever right. you are. Let's go, let's go. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, we are in the loop. We are building a digital rights management platform for songs with a completely new way of detecting copyright violation. Instead of working with frequencies, we to transpose the MP3 files into sequence of notes and compare against the database of songs to get um, equivalent portions of, let's say, um, some shares like um, the similarity rates between songs. We identify which songs have been involved in the process and then be able to put, start in the smart contract to then later on with the royalty system and uh, IP licensing retribute, distribute funds to all artists that were involved in the process. Um, so we're using a story protocol to handle all kinds of IPs specifically related to music. Uh, yeah, and the revolutionary part about our solution is that we also have a review system uh, so that whenever algorithm is unsure about whether two certain tracks are derivatives of each other, we have a network of uh, reviewers to which uh, we, we send a request to, uh, to access whether two pieces of music are actually derivatives of each other or not. And this is the revolutionary hybrid between the AI model and uh, human feedback in the loop. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, so you can follow us on the page, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That was terrible. Any questions? Um, Say your name again. In the loop. In the loop, yeah. Thank you, in the loop. Next team up, please. Okay, good afternoon, gentlemen. What is the name of your project, sir? It's uh, Anacostia Blockchain. Anacostia. Y'all ready? Yep. You ready? Okay, All right, off so we go. Today we're here to talk about Anacostia Blockchain, which is a decentralized MLOps framework that is supposed to be a revolutionary machine learning technology on blockchain. So I'll pass it to Min to talk about what the heck is MLOps. The long story short, MLOps is just a, a simply a process for, well, DevOps for machine learning. So as soon as data comes in, we want to be able to update it, keep the model fresh, keep it, uh, keep it relevant. Um, problem with MLOps right now is a lot of problems with calling up vendors, evaluating tools, and integrating into one pipeline. So there needs to be a tool that allows you to evaluate these tools in your own environment, as well as, uh, um, as swapping tools in and out for evaluation. 
something to do. So the solution we built is this framework that is a common API that lets you do IP licensing as well as a marketplace for all the NFTs of your AI models. Next slide. So this is the high level uh, architecture. We have a dynamically priced model. We're utilizing a, a, st a story protocol as well as Chainlink IPFS to store all the AI models. Let's do a quick demo of this. So what you're going to see is a pipeline that is right now continuously retraining, and this is a DAG architecture. What we did at the bottom, if you zoom in, is um, a node that pushes all, everything in your pipeline into IPFS and blockchain for a minting an NFT after this pipeline is completed. So if you go back to the slide, so what we want to do is essentially create a public good for enabling machine learning operations on chain. We want to open source this out and, and welcome the community to work on use cases and contribute to this foundational library and technology. The, the biggest thing is we want to help create responsible AI and bring AI technologists to this space. So hopefully we can all come together and create responsible AI by injecting blockchain and these decentralized technologies to your machine learning operations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Name of your project, sir? Uh, Anacostia Blockchain. Anacostia Blockchain. Thank you, team. Next team up, please. Next team up, please. Ladies and gents, as you can see, we still have many more teams to present. So very excited about that. Uh, while we wait, team, what is the name of your project? So the name of our project is the Vice Roll Doc Casino, and the entire team is here from Clara to Maddie to Fouad to Tyler, and my name is Jackie. Okay, great. You and have two it's minutes. Vice Roll Doc Casino. So the um, <laughs> the slides are going to start again, but the purpose of this project is actually to provide crypto gamblers the way to help support charities. So we designed a project where when you roll and you win, the crypto goes back to you. But when you roll and you lose, you actually earn COPE tokens, which goes to a public DAO. And in the public DAO will be charities that are listed that the DAO can choose to give the rewards to. So when you have this spin on the casino, the Vice Roll dot Casino. You connect your wallet and you can see all the various options that you have and then all of a sudden you win. And when you win, then you have the option to play again. And this is all about giving back. Because I know as a person who has volunteered for charities for over 20 years, fundraising for charities is very hard. And being in the crypto space, this is exactly what we need, a blend of the two. So we have, on this project, we researched um, games. We also um, looked at um, the, the ability of cryptocurrency players to actually play and get rewards. And what this looks like behind the scenes is the variety of uh, wallets and things that we have here. I'm going to let Matt explain a little bit more. Sure, so um, Vice is super happy to be here. We, the next step for us are to create more games. We're looking at things like a lossless casino and what does that mean? And we want to roll more vices into virtues by taking your casino losses and then bringing them into a public goods DAO. So super thanks, super big thanks to Eat Denver, the venue staff, the people that are producing this, the mentors, judges, and all of the rest of the teams. Thanks everybody, Vice Roll Casino. Thank you, Vice Roll Casino. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Next team up. I got you. Good to see you, gentlemen. What is the name of your project? Uh, Farcast Frame. Uh, one more time, please. Farcast Frame. We built a Farcast Frame, which Market we call the uh, uh, Market Sense. Uh, it's actually a market. Uh, Price prediction framework and based on forecast, and uh, this is a great, great uh, way to coordinate with forecast uh, friends and deliver the advantage, which we believe is going to be the single point of entries for all blockchains. As you can see, there is a, this is a frame, and we can make a prediction that, the, for example, uh, if you believe the price will go up after a week, then you can just vote. 
this, then you get the result. And after a week, there, uh, we built a smart contract to, to put this uh, uh, test on chain. And after this, we are going to get, after a week, we are going to get the price from Oracle. So you get the price from Oracle, and you also get the price from the user's prediction. You, you can make a comparison on chain, which is fully con chain. So it's a permissionless result compa uh, comparison, and you can uh, easily get the uh, feed, which user's behavior is correct. So as a result, the rewarding will be sent out to for the people who uh, uh, play the correct, uh, right decision. Here's the architecture of the uh, smart contracts, which we believe is going to be a very fundamental way to co co coordinate with the forecast, uh, which is a test, Oracle, which is getting the uh, right result of chain, and then it's uh, rewarding. Yeah. That's all. That's it. Yeah. Uh, if you are interested in interacting with this, follow Star Rater on Farcast. <laughs> thank you. Farcaster Frames, thank you. We are the YB squared. How's the vibe, everyone? Lovely. Uh, we're, we're the team Vibe Squad. And uh, how many of you have seen the Black Mirror? Anybody? Uh, anybody familiar with the nosedive, uh, see, uh, the nosedive episode? OK, for those, who, for those of you who aren't, imagine a world where uh, the rules of the capitalistic society are changed uh, to reward those who have positive social interactions. Right, so, so at Vibe Squad, we help positive vibes uh, get monetized or positive social influence get monetized. So, uh, you know, just at the start of the, uh, uh, the hackathon, we were seeing uh, some metrics around social influence. And we realized that about 72% of the commerce purchase decisions happen through recommendations by friends and family. Uh, our screens are stuck for some reason, and that's what the Nielsen report says. And about 70% of the teens, 70% um, of the teens make their purchasing decisions to YouTube influencers vis-a-vis -vis traditional influencers. So we built out a product to essentially help you monetize your social interactions. Uh, and here's what the product looks like. So yeah. Uh, uh. So we are a product-based, uh, like influence-based marketplace uh, and uh, in which rewards users, not the influencers. And this is how the product looks like. Uh, it's like this is a, a way where the influencer comes and pro promotes their product, uh, participate in the uh, campaign. They need to sign in, and then uh, there's a link that gets generated. And those links they can share on like social media, like this one. And the users come here and uh, click on the link and just purchase it. And do you know what the cool thing is? There's a safe tracker, safe vibe, and that's the vibe. Thank if you. you thank you, vibe. Thank you. Uh, we are at time. Thank you very yeah, much. We are the vibe squared. Vibe squad, vibe squad. Great. Thank you for bringing good vibes. If you like good vibes, stay tight, because more vibes are coming. More good vibes are coming. Team, what is the name hello, of your hello. project? Hello, this is Gladiator. My name is Dan Hendrickson. This is Julieta. OK, you're up. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Gladiator is a passion project of mine. And Gladiator is an unparalleled digital collectible card game experience designed to add instant utility and maximum fun to NFT collections. Essentially, you can combine NFT collections in battle in a really engaging and beautiful way that gives utility to tokens that have been lost astray. There are far too many tokens out there in the world that have no purpose, and Gladiator brings them into one area for them to all battle and gain purpose. Now, the Gladiator platform itself 
supports a really enticing gameplay that's accessible for all ages. More importantly, it really capture, captivates people visually. Beyond just the gameplay, what's really important is what is inside the shop, and that's what we built here at ETH the e Denver. At ETH Denver, we actually wanted to do good with the Gladiator application and the game. So when you go into the shop, you're able to purchase in-game accessories, and these in-game accessories directly contribute to the greater good. So when I open a, an, an accessory, what you'll see is the accessory itself and then the direct contribution to three charities. So 25% of the revenue that comes through the shop goes to development and improving the platform, and the remaining 75% the lion's share actually goes directly to children's mental health, animal sanctuaries, and supporting those in need that have, uh, are dealing with cancer and, and so on. So this is near and dear to my heart and a very important project. We contribute to a goals number three, 15, and A of United Nations. This is more than a game. This is it. It's a so funny way to bring hope. And the more per players participate, the greater impact we'll achieve. So play and help us to build a better world together. Thank you. Oh, well, Thank oh, you. Time, time. Thank you. Uh, name of your project? Gladiator. Thank you, Gladiator. Thank you. Hello, We're, we are Camp Green. All right, team, what is the name of your project? Camp, Camp Green. Camp Green, Camp Green. I know, I know, I'm not, I haven't started the timer. <laughs> this? So, how are you guys doing out there? from a UX perspective. When you type in your credit card to make a donation online to your favorite nonprofit organization, there's no need to really conceptualize the banking institution that you're storing the value in or which payment network that the transaction is routed through. Unify brings Web 3.0 one step closer to this user experience. With Unify, we're here to allow for plugins and finances to be automated by consumers so you can build in automations into your uh, you know, receiving of tokens. So let's say, you know, a big climate pledger. Anytime I receive Bitcoin, I want to dedicate 5% of that to going renewable energy credits. What we allow is for users to automate their finances so that they can put their money where their mouth is. What's the best way to get people to donate to charities on a recurring basis? Set and forget strategies. Monthly recurring, you know, donations is how we get to monthly pledges to different goals that people believe in. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is automatable finance powered by abstract accounts. So users with Unify are able to uh, set callbacks for certain tokens that they receive. So anytime I receive, you know, USDC, set aside five percent for you know Ukraine. Um, by allowing people to, you know, 
say once what they believe in and pledge to causes and have those finances happen on a recurring basis. We allow people to you know, believe once and have it handled for the rest. So here we did a bridge across and there we go. Automatically swapped back out for ETH and made our contribution to our cause. Thank you. Thank you, team. We are Unify. Thank you, Unify, for making it easier for our audience to remember you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, yes. Me, me first and then him. Team, uh, check, check, check. what is the name of your project? Speculation Station. Yeah. So, what the Speculation Station is, is um, first of all, this is um, EEG data from the uh, monitor that I'm wearing on my head. Um, we've effectively used that to train a machine learning model in order to predict when I'm thinking about blinking. Why would we want to do that, you ask? Well, I'll tell you why. It's so we can play shitcoin Tinder using the power of our mind. So this is our Tinder interface. Um, we can use it to effectively um, decide whether or not we want to uh, buy or sell a shitcoin. Uh, we have this um, hooked up to um, an agent on the back end which will effectively sign the transaction. Um, what that's allowed us to do is effectively connect um, this application uh, to our ultra degen mode, which will then go ahead and try and uh, purchase uh, transactions based purely off the power of my mind. Um, bear with me a second. Now, we're going to give this a second. Uh, the algorithm isn't great, and the hardware is taking a bit of a knock. Um, but theoretically, in a second, the model is going to detect the fact that I'm frantically blinking, um, and it will go ahead and uh, swipe right and uh, purchase a token for us. If not, uh, you can see, yeah, there we go, lovely. And just let me get the transaction hash for you, which is here. So now we can go on to, Christ, I cannot see that at all. Uh, I'll be scanned. Is that right? And then you can see that we've just instantaneously played it, placed a transaction using the OX API, using just the power of my brain. Um, thank you very much. Thank Speculation you, thank Station. You. Speculation Station. Thank you for the DGen energy in the room. Thank you. Next team up, Ordinals. More DGen energy. Ladies, what is the name of your project, please? <laughs> no, no. Hey, how are you? We are Ordinal 21, and we are a project about NFTs, art, and education, and of course, grid power. Hi, everybody. We are Ordinal 21. It's a project that aims to educate the community about the technology behind the Bitcoin and Ordinals. It takes the form of an educational community in which access is achieved through a membership obtained by minting an ordinal NFT from our collection, our beautiful collection, which will be a free mint. Among the attributes of the Ordinal 21 NFT is access to an exclusive group in a social network. This private group provides a safe educational space for, pe space for people who want to enter the ecosystem. NFT holders will have access to educational resources created specifically for our community. Some of these educational resources are also designed to be taught in the real world, approaching our universities or business and innovation centers to introduce them to the technology. The pro this project is needed because we have little reliable information and the absence of, of, of an educational environment about this technology, especially in Latin America, where we think this project is most needed because of the economic situation many countries are going through. Focusing on education in the community about one of the most revolutionary inventions of recent years can put within people's reach the necessary knowledge to improve their financial status and their lives. Hey, we are Soho Beat, and this is Karen. I am NFT artist, and 
He, he I'm a lawyer, <laughs> <laughs> crypto lawyer. So thank you. If anyone have questions, we are here. Thank you. Thank you, team. Thank you. Next one. Hello, hello. Hello, who are you? Hi, Denver. We are the Dolphins, and we have built the Mr. Dolphins at the Station Marketplace. Has anyone here ever uh, heard of real-world assets? Many hands go up. Has anyone here ever owned or traded real-world assets on chain? Not many hands up. So, what's the problem? The problem is, at the moment, uh, we are in a situation where an asset is either fully compliant, go straight to paradise, or non-compliant, go straight to hell. So what if I told you there was a better way? What if I told you there was a platform where you could trade your real-world assets, tokenize them, trade them, without going through any KYC at all, or as much KYC as you want? That platform exists, we built it, and my colleague is now going to show you how it works. So on this platform, this is a permissionless software, so all of your NFTs are already listed. So you can go in there, and we, and we extended the, uh, the vocabulary of attestation to introduce the concept of recipes, which are a collection of attestations, which will give you a, big, a, a better picture of real-world assets uh, that NFTs can't. So here, for instance, a recipe to uh, be eligible for a, a savings loan in Toronto. So here, um, as a buyer or a seller, you could request or offer your attestation, and um, and then um, you can then com uh, complete the job. So we realized that you know you not believe someone um, unless uh, um, unless there is some sort of proof. So we have built a knowledge graph, uh, a knowledge graph of people on, uh, in the background, and used the page rank algorithm to provide a reputation score for people providing attestations. So that way, as you give attestations to each other, um, you gain your reputation and you become and you provide more value to the community around. So why are we doing this? Um, we want to make it possible to. Um, build trust in a trustless environment so that the next 10 million people who come onto blockchain, it becomes a reality for them to have under collateralized loans and financing in the crypto world. We are the Dolphins. Come visit the Dolphins at the Station Bazaar. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, time. Mr. Dolphins Bazaar. There you go. Next team up, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, team. Hey, guys. This is uh, Sean, Darren, BK, and Darmik, and we are the Ecological Benefits Framework Network of Trust. This is a general purpose technology for tracking impact across public goods. Okay? So, what's the problem with public goods? is you can't track impact, you can't verify impact, and you can't discover projects that are very impactful. Hence, the Ecological Benefits Framework Network of Trust dashboard that we have up here, built off of an interoperable attestation network. So we've built an attestation network of trust in this, but it could be plug and play with any other attestation network of trust that anyone out there makes. Um, here you can see the attestation process. You can pick a project, you can attest to its benefits, you can apply a score, and you can even claim uh, for new benefits. Next up, we have the create a project portal. So here you can migrate your project into the portal and you can claim benefits. This is an 1155 ERC minted under the hood, which we're using in a clever way as a project registry. And that 
contract is where the attestations are going to point to in addition to the token ID and the tags for the impact sector. What we see here is a render of the decentralized network of trust. In blue, we have projects. In red, we have attesters. And in green, we're seeing attesters who are attesting to attesters. So in this way, we can build a decentralized reputation system, and you can uh, have trust propagate through this network to ultimately discover impactful projects. Here we see the profile page where you can see your projects you've created. And here's the kicker. Once you create a project, people attest to it. You can, with a click of a button, airdrop tokens to everyone who's attested to your project as a reward system. Uh, thank you. We are the Ecological Benefits Framework Network of Trust. EBF. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. GM team, again. what is the name of your project? We are Camp Green. Oh, Camp Green, there we go. So yeah, we're, we're Camp Green. We want to uh, connect funders and do-gooders in a um, fun, easy, and uh, gamified way. Uh, layout's pretty simple. We've got campaigns, which are created by the funders. Uh, someone wants some social good done, they create a project called a campaign. Inside of that, that's a, a ERC-6551 uh, token bound account. It generates its own hyper certs with all the metadata included. If I go and perform work on that, then I make an attestation that I did this work. One of the people that created the campaign can then attest that yes, I did indeed do that work and then I will automatically be given some of those hyperserts as a reward. Uh, what we're seeing here is the campaign contribution flow. It's really simple. You just um, create, put in some details about the thing that you would like to improve, the public good that you would like to improve, and then you review uh, the details that you submitted. Uh, this is actually much simpler than it looks. <clears throat> um, so what we're looking at here is the contribution flow, which is um, Basically, one way I like to think of this is a public goods job board. <clears throat> You've, you find the campaign that you want to contribute to, you perform and document your contribution, and then you save everything to the blockchain. Uh, at that point, a notification is sent to the campaign manager, um, and if you're approved, then at that point, you basically get paid. Uh, this is the approval flow here. Um, it's very simple. Um, that's, that's basically it for this part. Uh, shout out to Big Bit Beckers for deploying uh, hyperserts to Base Apolia and Base for our project. Uh, like I said, 6551 and EAS attestations. And just quickly, just to talk about the future, um, we plan to make it more easier for people to identify problems and time, then present sir. solutions. Sorry about that time. And uh, thank you guys for your time. And, uh, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Cam Green, thank you. Man, too So while we get, get connected, we are Global Mile. Thank you, Global Mile. So basically, we always ask ourselves, how do we win the next billion users to Web3? But this is Juan. Juan doesn't care about crypto. He doesn't care about blockchain. He just cares his hardworking money into their bank accounts. So let's go demo. Yeah. In Global Mile, something that is really important for us is that the drivers that is going to go to the platform doesn't learn anything about Web3, and they doesn't need to. We are going to do, we develop a, a platform. On the left, you can see the platform that is website from the guys that need to deliver something. On the right, you, we have a React Native app where the drivers need to deliver. So how you can see, they are not seeing anything about Web3. This looks like a Web2 app that is easy for the drivers to, to manage that. Once the drivers confirm the deliver, they are going to need to update their bank account. This bank account provides that they can receive payments, I mean real payments in fiat, in the money that they can spend directly. So how we can see, the management on the platform just click on paid. Once that they click on paid, under the hood, we are sending the money by Ether to a, to a, 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 exchange, exchange. a, a centralized exchange 
where the magic happens. Because that exchange takes the money, transform to the currency, and deposit the money directly to the, to the drivers for the platform. This occurs immediately. How we can see the transaction is almost confirmed. Once that the transaction is confirmed, uh, I'm, we're going to show you uh, how easy the, does the money goes to the app. This is a real bank account where you can see, if I check out my transactions, it is, it's the same address that I, that I showed you before. And how you can see, the money goes directly to the drivers. So there's the only thing that the drivers need to care about is to work. Doesn't need to care anything about Web3. And this is Global Mice. Thank you. Web3 for normies. Great, thank you. Global Mile. Thank you. Clap, clap, clap. One, two, three, check, check. Yes, uh, hello. I didn't prepare any slides. It was uh, such an intense trip, but I was enjoying myself. It was phenomenal. And I met this gentleman, Stephen, who is uh, paralyzed, uh, partially paralyzed on a wheelchair. And uh, he is uh, a, a legend. Like, everyone loves him, and I thought, even though it is not strictly a blockchain Web3 crypto hack, uh, there is an impact track. And if I can make impact in the life of one person, I think that's pretty cool. So I will uh, unlock my phone, go to the, this is the web app just added to the screen. And the first step of the process that I need to calibrate movement of my fingers, because Steven using, is using a regular keyboard, but he is paralyzed. So it's not very efficient. But when you uh, tap your fingers on the screen, it calibrates the range of motions for each finger. Then uh, calibrate, some magic. And now uh, in the upper right section on the, on, on the screen, as I move my finger on, the, on here, it just sends it here. I'll just make it slightly bigger. Uh, so, when you have reduced mobility, this is uh, potentially a better way of uh, using computer. And there is also a face detection uh, component, because why not? Uh, why press space if you can blink? So, I'll just try to demonstrate it. I'll come closer. Uh, no audio for a moment. I'll just start blinking, and hopefully it will detect my eyebrows. Uh, I am very happy with this work, and I know that you didn't ex you expect the blockchain degen region. Uh, I think that there is not enough disabled people like Steven, and they need more visibility, and I did it for him because he is a legend. Thank you very much. The team name, Paralyzed. Paralyzed, thank you. Testing, testing GMs, friends, and regions. We are IMPS. So you guys know, we're going to wait for this clock to start. Impact measurement protocols. Go ahead and go. Oh, All right, we're going to jump into it. Sweet. You guys can see the screen. So we are impact measurement protocols. From our perspective, right, nothing is worse than not really being able to trust or hold accountable the very entities that we are trusting with our funds to basically produce public goods in server community. So here's some like, uh, data and statistics on some entities that we are essentially trusting with our money and how much of that money is maybe getting lost or allocated. We really believe that these statistics are driving factors that are really separating and causing a lot of distrust within communities that are trying to fund public goods. So why IMPS? We're here to close incentivization gaps within public goods funding, really make funding more efficient and more accountable, and allow funders and donors to have more of a voice sort of creating maybe a grant as more of like a DAO aspect that gives people more of a voice, more power to sort of have an impact on how funds are spent. Um, great, yeah. By integrating hypercerts and attestation services, we are empowering donors in being able to vote on perceived impact through spending funds within a grantee ecosystem. 
Um, if a score of a grantee goes um, below a certain threshold, we will lock the funds through SQF or batch-based funding and um, revert to the pool to re redistribute to future grantees. Sweet, yeah, put that money to um, good stuff. So again, too, it's just donors and funders of these um, protocols that can really um, vote on this. We have uh, different uh, measurements of calculating the impact, right? So if you're a donor or a funder, you can get the accumulative or the weighted. So we created some equations and put them into Solidity to basically try to, and of course, impact is um, relative. So we're allowing these people to sort of gauge their impact based on either their contribution or just the overall pool size. Um, you can check out some of those protocols and implement them in Allo um, protocols on the uh, Miko machine. Uh, here's just a quick demo. Oh, 12 seconds. You know, let's just like skip through this for you guys, right? Going to click on some things. Green pill, what are they doing? Awesome. We are IMPS. Thank you, guys. Thank you, IMPS. Give it up. Sweet. Good Next enough. team up. We got, we're near the end of the session. So please, please, everybody, buckle up. And certainly, last but not least, team, what is the name of your project? Our Balance project C. is called Balance C. Balance C. Can we start? Start. Imagine a world where every decision, every action, stems from a clear, focused, and balanced state of mind. Now consider the impact if we could shift the collective mindset of the society. At the heart of most global challenges lies a worldwide mental crisis, where anxiety, distraction, and stress dictate behaviors. But what if we could address the problem at the source? Meditation at scale is the single most effective tool for societal transformation. Uh, the problem is that while mostly people understand the benefits, many struggle with consistency. Balance is here to transform this through a unique approach, meditate to earn. Unlike existing systems that exploit behavioral psychology and cult cultivate negative behavior patterns, our platform uses a system of incentives that naturally leads to positive behavior change and habit formation. Our vision is bold. Fix the mind and you can fix the world. With Balancy, we're not just encouraging meditation. We're setting the stage for a societal shift. All right, now let's take a look at how this is done. So we have here a premium subscription membership platform. And what we do, we'll collect, we'll use the money collection from this uh, subscription in order to motivate people into the critical aspect of habit setting. That is, uh, we'll have a free group of people, we have a, uh, we have a paid premium group of people, we collect it, we create two pools, and we're gonna reward all the money that comes into the pools each day for habit setting. If the people do what they ask to do, they receive the reward. If not, next day they can do it again. Uh, we know that uh, this type of uh, gamification really helps in to get people to do a habit. So, what we, so how we envisioned it is this. You have a very simple fluid interface that will have an AI part of it. So think of it as your personal Zen teacher. And then it will learn what you do and it will guide you and it will let you participate. And only if you do what you're supposed to do, then you get to uh, earn the reward. We're not going to upsell you unless we believe you want to do Time. that. So yeah. And uh, thanks very much. Please check out li our light paper for more details on how we're going to do the viral scaling. All right. Impact Public Goods. We're looking for the following teams to come check in at the submarine stage. Frame PG, micro loans, red envelope, Hedera Habis, Stormbit, Staxer, Page Dow Secure, Solidity GPT, Data Detector, Aggregator. If you are wanting to present in front of the judges and participate in the impact and public goods track, you need to come and check in at the booth at the submarine stage. All right, you need to say your name so that the judges know who you are and what project you're working on, and then you'll be good to go. Hey, everybody. So we are our pay. Why wait two weeks to receive your pay when you're working every day for an hourly wage? This is a way to manage and pay your team in real time. So the problem here is that 62% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, 
and many of them take payday loans to make up the difference uh, in their finances between paydays. This is a $4.8 billion market, and they are really taking advantage of this segment of the population, uh, charging 391% average APR. Really mind-boggling numbers that we haven't seen in DeFi in a long time. Uh, so this product enables workers to be paid in real time while they're at work. It uses Superfluid to stream USDC on base to the user's wallet. We use ZK email to authenticate. And here is the admin experience. All you have to do, you log in, create your team, invite team members, set their shifts, their hourly uh, wage. They receive an invite in their email, onboard, clock in when their shift starts, watch as their pay accrues, and cash out through Coinbase with the USDC on base super cheap transactions. Our pay. Whose pay is it? Our pay. Let's pay employees as they work. All right. If you are if you are on the impact and public goods track and you have not yet presented, this is a last call.
is Matt Spencer. I'm software engineer, ZK expert, AI expert, and our teammate, Eman, she is the smart contract editor and software engineer. Um, and we are here to present our product, ZTrust, our on-chain audit registry solution. Why this solution? Uh, because uh, we get inspired by the problem of the current uh, situation of our ecosystem. There is a huge crisis of trust in Web3. Uh, add to that the technical barrier and complexity, especially regarding the audit reports. Just in 2023, uh, 2023 there, will, there has been more than $2 billion uh, being lost in scams, and more than 75% of Americans have lost trust in blockchain. How to address that? We wanted to uh, um, enhance the experience of our um, uh, end users uh, through uh, exploiting our on-chain or this in registry. We believe that we can be a game-changing solution for trust and security in Web3. We aim to empower users with accessible security insights based on audit reports. This is how it can look like our solution. Yeah, so as you can kind of see, we're guiding through what the solution will look like. We kind of have, it's kind of like EtherScan. You put in an address, it has a high, medium, low risks. Risk on, you can have a little chat bot on the side. This connects to ChatGPT, and you could query it and ask for questions about things that are good. Our AI guy would know more. But that, that's kind of the core concept. And on top of this, we have a layer of ZK as well, where we um, confiscate the user's ID when they're interacting. So they can have basically an interaction that the, we have like trusted auditors that would make this work. And you kind of see our, our, our future-proof plan roadmap in the future right Time. here. Thank you. If you could re-announce you. your name for your project. Trust. Austin. Oh, project. Z Trust. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. All right, cool. All right, this is the last, 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 last call. Extra last call. If you are frame PG, microloans, red envelope, Hedera, Staxer, Storm, oh great, Stormbit. And page DAO secure, solidity GPT, data yeah, detector, aggregator. Those are the last teams that we're looking for. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Let's go. So I just need you to say the name of your team. We are Staxa. <laughs> um, yeah, who here likes taxes? Who here likes to pay taxes on their trades, on their income by a blockchain? Probably nobody. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, I, uh, the tax revenue guys in, uh, in the US just hired 1,000 people to go after uh, crypto taxes. So they're coming. They're coming. Uh, Boring stuff we know, but someone's got to do it, and uh, there's only two things in life that we know of, and taxes is one of them. So in order to, to withhold taxes, it's really hard. Like we, there are a number of firms that will do the accounting for you and tell you at the end how much you make, how much you owe, how much you got to pay. We do it proactively instead. We built a smart contract that will automatically withhold taxes, and you can set it based on your country's tax parameters. You can set your income tax parameters, your um, capital gains tax, and a number of other tax parameters. And once you get your airdrop, once you get your income, once you, once you get your crypto, it'll withhold it. 30%, whatever your tax parameter is, that'll get withheld, and you can spend the rest, the, the other 70%. So that's a, you know, that's a proactive tax withholding. Yeah, so you don't need to worry about anymore 
If you have enough on the side when uh, you need to pay the taxes out, actually, and while you are waiting, you can just stake the crypto or it earns automatically some interest. And yeah, this is happens everything automatically. You have your safe here where you maybe want to have your income in. Maybe you also want to save something for donations. And yeah, then you can claim, you can make some notes on the chain, you can change the address of Stop. the transactions. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So that was Staxer. All right. I don't see any more people having checked in. So uh, if you are a track judge for this track, go ahead and stand up. I will meet you over at the stairs over on the left. We'll go back to Biddle Council. I'll get your scores, and then you guys can start deliberating for the top three and the top three alternates. For everyone else that was here, thank you.